Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I am the Chair of the Committee. I want to acknowledge the members who are here. We have Minority Leader Mario and Majority Leader Van Bremer. This morning the Committee will con conclude our hearings of the Mayor's Fiscal 18's Executive Budget. We will hear first from Director Dean Fulahan of the Office of Management and Budget, followed by New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer and the Independent Budget Office. Members of the public will have an opportunity to testify in th this afternoon, beginning at approximately 1 p.m. For members of the public who will be testifying, we will be organizing our panels by topics. So please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the topic area of your testimony. Any senior or person with disability who requires any accommodation for an earlier panel, please make a note on your witness slip so that we know you are here and can plan accordingly. Spanish translation services are also available. I should probably say that in Spanish. Right. Eh, tendremos traductores en español si son necesarios. Por favor, pueden hablar con los agentes. If any member of the public would prefer to submit written testimony, you can still submit your testimony to the Finance Division on the Council's website at council.nyc.gov backslash budget backslash testimony, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. We will be accepting testimony until 5 p.m. on Monday, May 29th. Before we get started, I want to first thank the Council Finance Director, um, Latanya McKinney, and her entire staff, including the Budget Unit, the Revenue and Economic, and Economic Unit, Discretionary and Data Support Unit, and Administrative Support Unit, and the Finance Council for all their hard work in preparing these hearings. I also want to thank the Sergeant at Arms, who keep us safe and help things run smoothly. They include Director of Security Carl Diabla, Chief Sergeant at Arms Rafael Perez, Sergeant at Arms John Biando, Dane Hope, Mohammed Arshad, Jessica Pellegrino, Hannah Doatanj, Mackenzie Joseph, Sakim Bradley, uh, Edwin Lopez, Xavier Odehiran. Ode also, would like to thank um, the team at N WNYC Media who who allow those at home and at work to follow along with these hearings. Um, John Vigoa, Isaac Sarponga, Brian Francis, Amir Shukalik, Agron Seca, Elliot Stern, Ivan Peña, and Tony Austin. Thank you all for your dedication and work. The city adopts the fiscal 2018's budget at a time of great uncertainty about the future of critical programs and services that help many of our most vulnerable population. President Trump's released his, this proposed budget on Tuesday. This devastating plan cuts billions from vital programs, including SNAP, that earned income, uh, the earned income and child tax credits, Medicaid and housing assistance. Millions of New Yorkers, including seniors, children, and people with disability, will be impacted. In light of this, I remain concerned that too many city agencies have failed to develop contingencies if these drastic cuts are imposed. The Council will stand with the administration as it continues to fight against these proposals, but we must also be confident that, there, that we are beginning to plan carefully for what may come. Before we start, I want to provide a brief overview of the executive budget process to date. On April 26, Mayor de Blasio released the administration's fiscal 2018's executive budget, totaling approximately $84.9 billion. The Council was glad to see that this budget included several proposals that we advocated for, including providing air conditioners in all public school classrooms, enhancing support for immigrant services, defunding the proposed jail facility at Rikers Island, while funding borough-based jails and reducing excessive uh, capital appropriations. However, it failed to include key Council priorities such as additional summer and year-round youth jobs, universal school lunch, enhanced funding for social services, and increased support for the emergency food assistance program. On May 4th, the Council began fulfilling our charter-mandated responsibility of holding public hearings on the executive budget with testimony from OMB. Over the following three weeks, 27 Council committees heard approximately 100 hours of testimony from over 30 agencies. The Council extensively questioned agency heads on op operations and priorities for their respective agencies and the extent to which they are addressed in the executive plan. This administration has worked well with the Council for the past three budgets. Together we have accomplished many important victories for the people of New York City. It is our hope that this year's adopted budget continues this progress, reflecting the values and priorities of both the Council and the Mayor. 
However, this requires the budgetary transparency essential to ensure that the Council can be an equal partner in the budget process. This morning, we conclude uh, where we began with testimony from OMB Director. We return to OMB for a second time because the Council believes that the City's budget, as it currently stands, does not appropriate reflect the vision of both the Council and the Mayor. This hearing will begin will give us an opportunity to discuss our outstanding concerns and to restate our core priorities in light of the testimony we have heard during these hearings. I would like to highlight a few areas in particular. The Council has made reform for the city's capital process a top priority. We have long advocated for changes to how the city plans its long-term capital agenda, and we have encouraged agencies to develop methods to perform capital work more efficiently and economically. This year, we recommended that the administration align the capital plan with the city's ability to execute projects and establish a task force to speed the completion of projects. We were encouraged by the administration acting on the request of the council and reducing 3.2 billion excess capital appropriations in the executive budget. However, between the prelim and the executive budgets, the administration increased both the capital commitment plan for fiscal 2017 to 2021 and the 10 year capital strategy by approximately 7%. This increase was done without corresponding strategy for completing capital projects in a more efficient manner. We have asked agency after agency how they actually plan to accommodate the increase in capital funds included in their budget for fiscal 2018, and nearly all of them were unable to give a specific answer. The practice of continually front-loading capital budgets and rolling massive amounts of unspent capital into the following fiscal year must end and give way to a more transparent and realistic capital plan. Both myself as a finance chair and the council as a whole look forward to working with the administration towards this end. Furthermore, there has been a lack of transparency on a number of significant administration initiatives and plans. This makes it difficult for the council to assess them properly. Significant among these was the proposed partial citywide hiring freeze of administrative and managerial staff. Because um, the issuance of guidance on this plan went well into the budget hearings, agencies were unable to provide us any detail about how it would affect them. I would like to receive more information about this plan, including the scale affected agencies and the possibility of permanent savings at today's hearing. Additionally, we heard from agencies such as ACS and DIFTA that they were in discussions with OMB about additional funding for new needs, but heard nothing about the substance or feasibility of these requests. Given that the Council's budget response specifically included requests for these agencies, it is concerning that we were unable to receive more details at these hearings. In addition, affected agencies express uncertainty about how compliance with the recently adopted Raise the Age Law, the planned closing of Rikers, and the implementation of the Mayor's Homeless Plan will impact their budgets. This lack of information on such critical matters at this stage in the budget process is unacceptable. Finally, I would continue to urge the administration to increase the city's reserves. As I mentioned during the first OMB hearing, while total reserves were brought to $9.3 billion in the executive plan, the ratio of reserves to adjust, adjusted total spending is only 10.7%. This is below the recommended ratio of between 12 and 18%. With the continued risk posed by the federal government and the slowing of the city's economy, the reserves must be adequate to ensure the continued stability of vital city programs and services. I look forward to hearing about these issues and many more from Director Foulihan. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that each member will have five minutes um, for their first round of questions. Um, after you're sworn in, you may begin your testimony and we will hear from Director Foulihan. And we've been joined by Council Member Lander. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great. Thank you. Finance Tier, Jalissa Ferraris Copeland, members of the Finance Committee and members of the City Council. Thank you for this additional opportunity to testify on the Mayor's fiscal year 2018 executive budget. Again, I, I join your Thanks to LaTanya McKinney and the entire Council Finance staff who have been partners with us for the, for the past uh, three and a half years. And uh, I know that partnership will continue as we move to adoption. 
Uh, I'm joined at the table by OMB First Deputy Director Larry Angelo and the dedicated and hardworking OMB staff is also here to assist me in answering your questions. At the hearing on May 4th, I outlined in detail the elements of the executive budget. Uh, to quickly get to your questions, I'm going to provide a very broad overview of that testimony and of our executive budget. Our fiscal year 2018 executive budget is $84.86 billion, and both fiscal year 2017 budget and the fiscal year 2018 budget are balanced under generally accepted accounting principles. We reduced our revenue estimates in the executive budget by $567 million for the upcoming fiscal year, recognizing moderate revenue growth. We made new strategic investments and continued our citywide savings program. We maintained are manageable out-year gaps when compared to prior years, and together we achieve the highest level of reserves of any city administration. And our 95.85 billion 10-year capital strategy keeps infrastructure in a state of good repair, promotes health and safety, and expands access to education and opportunity. I also discussed, and you did as well, on both the, the first hearing and today, the risks and uncertainties we face at the federal level, including cuts to critical services. On Tuesday, the President released the federal fiscal year 2018 budget that confirmed the federal administration's intention to cut funding for critical programs, including public safety and the programs that protect the most vulnerable members of our community. It would force cities and states to absorb over $610 billion in additional cuts to Medicaid. Over 3 million New Yorkers currently receive Medicaid and 1.4 million are enrolled through the Affordable Care Act exchange. It would cut 6 billion from the Children's Health Insurance Program, threatening health care for 125,000 New York City children. Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program would be reduced by 193 billion over 10 years. 1.7 million New Yorkers receive SNAP. Temporary assistance for needy families would be reduced by $21.7 billion over 10 years. 140,000 New Yorkers rely on TANF. The budget would eliminate, the proposed federal budget would eliminate the Community Development Block Grant funds that benefit low and middle income New Yorkers and help revitalize deteriorating neighborhoods throughout the country. It cuts $72.5 billion in funding to Social Security Disability Insurance and Supplemental Social Security Income. And the city could lose up to $190 million in Homeland Security grants we receive annually, harming our ability to protect critical assets and preparing for emergencies. In addition, the House of Representatives' repeal of the Affordable Care Act would cut $800 billion in funding to Medicaid by rolling back ACA Medicaid expansion and capping Medicaid funding to states, changing the very nature of the 50-year history of Medicaid as, as an entitlement. At the same time, this bill would also eliminate individual employer mandates and the tax credits and subsidies that help make health insurance affordable for individuals. The Trump tax plan would be equally harmful to New Yorkers, and could cost city residents $7.7 billion in lost state and local tax deductions. We are actively engaged with our federal delegation, business and labor, partners across the country in challenging these destructive policies. The mayor has been clear. We will fight all attempts by the federal government to cut services that touch every New Yorker, particularly the most vulnerable. And we've already seen some success last month. The federal budget passed earlier this month, the one that concluded the current federal fiscal year, contained no meaningful cuts to programs New Yorkers depend on, and, and it provided reimbursements for our security at Trump Towers. And that is irrespective of the $17 billion nationally that the President had proposed for the continuation of the current fiscal year. With these uncertainties and challenges in mind, we have taken a balanced approach to the executive budget. We now have an historic level of general reserves, $1 billion for each year of our four-year financial plan, compared to the traditional level of $300 million. 
The mayor and the council established the first ever capital stabilization reserve, now at $250 million every year over the four-year financial plan. This is in addition to the Retiree Health Benefit Trust Fund, which is at an unprecedented $4 billion, $3.3 billion, the result of actions taken by this administration and this council. Our total reserves for fiscal year 2018 are now $5.25 billion. At the mayor's request, we have continued to find new savings. We will use space more efficiently and procure goods and services more effectively. We took $1 billion in savings in November, another $1.1 billion in January, and $700 million in the executive budgets across fiscal year 2017 and 2018. In addition, the mayor directed us to implement a partial hiring freeze on city-funded managerial administrative and support positions. And our health care agreement with the Municipal Labor Committee will result in additional $1.3 billion in savings in fiscal year 2018 while providing better care for our employees. Mindful of this financial and political backdrop, in the executive budget we built on prior investments by ex ex expanding successful programs, making targeted investments, and deepening commitments we have made to New Yorkers. For example, this fall, we will roll out high-quality, universal 3K for all programs in two school districts. And by 2021, with assistance our state and federal governments, all New York families will have access to this signature program. Additionally, we will install air conditioning in every New York City classroom by fiscal year 2022. The mayor has been making, has been making New York City affordable for all. Just last week, the mayor announced the largest one-year decline in New York City near poverty rate since 2005. This is the first statistically significant one-year drop since the Great Recession. The executive budget makes strides to protect and create affordable housing for New Yorkers. We are providing $350 million in additional funds to re for repairs to NYCHA, building on our $1 billion investment made in the preliminary budget. We are also committing an additional $1.9 billion to create or preserve 10,000 apartments for New York households earning less than $40,000 a year. 5,000 of these units are reserved for seniors and 500 for veterans. This raises the city's contribution to Housing New York to $10.1 billion. And we are working to keep New Yorkers in their homes by providing anti-eviction legal services for tenants and housing courts. At the same time, our work to help keep New York more affordable for seniors continues. Our efforts to expand the senior and disabled homeowner property tax exemption are working. The legislation passed through the State Senate last week. This expansion will give 32,000 New York City homeowners an average property tax break of $1,750. And we are committed to working with you to address other senior issues, that can, other serious issues that confront our seniors. The executive budget adds investments in public safety that have made New York City the safest big city in America. For example, it expands ShotSpotter technology into nine square miles of neighborhoods in the Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan. We must also protect vulnerable populations. In the executive budget, we fund legal representation for immigrant New Yorkers facing deportation and other immigrant challenges and it tackles some of the most urgent problems facing New York, including the opioid crisis and domestic violence. This budget addresses other quality of life issues that affect New Yorkers on a daily basis. To ease commutes for Staten Islanders, in September we are bringing lower level boarding to ferries at Whitehall and St. George terminals. And we will invest $100 million to close the gap in the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway. We are also expanding the organics program, expanding the curbside e-waste program to Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens, providing more New Yorkers with a safe way to dispose of unwanted electronics. These efforts build on our past quality of life investments, which have included strengthening and expanding paid sick leave, funding Thrive New York to help New Yorkers who face mental illness, making major improvements to parks as part of the Anchor Parks and Community Park initiatives, providing IDMYC cards to nearly one million New Yorkers. In conclusion, we have responded to the uncertainties and challenges we face by maintaining historic reserves, expanding our savings program, 
while continuing to make investments that strengthen New York's future. And as we move towards adoption, we look forward to continuing our work with the Council to address our challenges and meet the needs of New Yorkers. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Director. Um, thank you for your testimony. So I'm just going to jump right into capital and then um, go from topic to topic before we hear from Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Councilmember Lander. Um, while we understand that agencies like Parks, DDC, DOT, EDC, or SCA operate differently, serving different functions, the Parks Department and the Department of Design and Construction continue to lag behind other agencies when it comes to efficiently completing capital projects. Um, and, you know, I recognize that at DDC, it's not all capital projects, it's just certain capital projects um, that lag. What are some of the constraints that OMB is aware of that an agency like Parks or DDC operate under that the other agencies do not, that we will be able to eliminate or create a more efficient process? Because as I've asked every commissioner that's come to testify about this question, it seems that it's not even in the agency, the agency isn't the issue, it's really somewhere in the procurement process um, where they've seen most of the lag, but I'm not sure if that's what you see on your end um, as one of the challenges uh, within the capital projects. So, both agencies are making improvements. I know it's, it's not as much as we would like to see and as much as they would like to see, but both agencies have made improvements. They have, they have shortened the timeline. We have invested uh, in this budget in, 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 a, in a pro we have put forward um, activities that should help in the early stages of both design, of, of, for design, to give them additional funds and resources to allow them to do more pre-scoping and more early design work, which allows them then to have a better understanding of the actual cost and the estimates. Right, the front end planning unit in DDC, thank you. Um, and, uh, and the same effort is happening at Parks. So there are attempts, we recognize this, and we're working with the commissioners to see if we can address it. They do have unique problems, right? There are many more small projects that these agencies, particularly at parks, that, that, that cre I think create add complexity to it. Um, does it mean that we shouldn't be working with you? And I, I'm quite sure it's gonna come up several times at this hearing, it did at the first hearing, that we, we you, you've articulated very thoughtful concerns. We share those concerns. We should be working with you on additional ways to address those concerns. And we're more than open to doing that and we want to do that with you. And, and we're committed to doing that with you To We've already reduced the time periods. We need to do that more and we need to make sure that our estimates are more accurate up front so that projects that you care about and we care about can are, are more, that we're more consistent about the accuracy of those estimates and then the timeline would be better. Right, and it seems like the number one reason why the estimates get blown out of proportion is because of the time. Um, because the longer a project I, takes, the commissioner testified that it's just getting more expensive to actually build in New York City. So time, time is clearly a, a, a cost factor and it adds to it. Um, uh, once again, having the right the right, pre the right information as we enter a project so that both the council and the administration knows exactly what a project costs, so we put the right funding in, we don't have to come back, that we minimize change orders, change orders add time, they add cost, so that, that's a shared goal. So we share this with you. We have an ambitious capital plan, as you've pointed out, and we think it's the right size capital plan. We accept that, that the spacing, the timing of that capital plan needs to be redistributed. We need to work with you on that. We did eliminate a lot of unnecessary appropriations at your request. Mm -hmm. There are many more things that we need to do in that process. Um, I, I've said this before, this really is not as much a parks issue, although parks occasionally will have major serious, uh, um, serious construction, but on the very big construction projects, uh, for example, the BQE and other Department of Transportation, not having the same benefit that the state of New York has on design build, which clearly adds on major construction projects years to, to a project, uh, 
is, un, is really unacceptable. And that's un, so there are statutory changes and there are, all, are help that we need from Albany to, that will assist us on the bigger projects. So just so that we could get this on the record, if we would have, if, if we would have been approved for design build, what would, how much time would that have potentially eliminated from our projects? So we had identified uh, during the state budget process about 10 projects, and we believe that it would save on those 10 major capital projects about 450 million off those projects, certainly serious amounts of, of financial savings, and that in many cases it would have taken years off the project. Thank you. Um, yes, we're going to be uh, continuing to talk about this, and especially as we shape the task force. And, and uh, the design bill, we have the bill has been introduced in, in uh, I know, in the assembly. Do we have a sponsor in the Senate, or? Do we? We'll come I hear Senator Felder is looking for things to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back. In the okay. Time. Thank you. Um, Wanted to uh, focus a, a little bit on agency transparency. Um, while we applaud the administration's commitment to fund vital services such as legal and homeless services, transparency issues remain um, on how the current budget structure reflects the agency's spending, especially for HRA, DHS, Law Department, Do It, and the Office and uh, Gun Violence. Can we get a commitment from you to increase budgetary transparency for these agencies? In particular, personal service spending for HRA's legal services program area, um, and how the mayor's new homeless plan is funded in HRA and DHS expense and capital budget. So while we were going through these hearings, some of this is lumped in even in lines that descriptively aren't necessarily doing um, or, or are not funding what we think they're funding. So can we walk through this process before our adoption to clearly identify where we need more transparency with these new sure, projects? Sure, we're happy to walk through that process. As you know, the, a year ago in the, uh, in, in the reconfiguration of DHS and HRA, part of that actually was to provide more transparency and to have a more consistent separation. So anything that adds to that, we're happy to do with you. We should sit down with the commissioner and walk you through that. Yeah, um, and so we'll have the, the recommendations for all of these agencies where we need to get um, the descriptions more clear. And you know, a perfect example, when you've done it right, because we also have to acknowledge when you've done it all right, is you have a unit of appropriation for 3K. So we can find 3K, there's a unit, it was done right. It just seems that with these other programs, we have a lot of lump sums um, and it takes an incredible amount of time and communication between both of our teams to figure out where this money is. We're, we should be sitting down with you and explaining that we're, that the goal was to give you that information and so if that's not happening, then we're, we should be sitting down with you and make that happen. Okay. We're happy to do that with the commissioner. Okay, um, hiring freeze. So I know the letter came out um, kind of towards the end of our, of our budget hearings. So every commissioner that I asked basically said the same thing, we're waiting for the notice, we're waiting for the notice. So that's why I'm asking you today. Um, what guidance have the agencies been given in terms of determining which hiring should be delayed? Um, and has the administration established a criteria by which agency should evaluate its current vacancies position? So two different questions. Right. Uh, the, the first is that we gave the agencies, the first deputy mayor and I sent, uh, sent guidance to the agencies of how we were going to implement the partial hiring freeze on, on managers, administrative and support staff. Um, it was to give them a sense of what was going to happen. It did not, it does not change, so we should start with this, it does not change the personal service um, process that occurs at OMB right now, which are new hires and city agencies come through OMB for approval. That's going to continue and that process continues. On top of that, um, and, and then what we told the agencies, there are a group of positions that will only go through that OMB process. But then others that don't meet a certain criteria will go to a different level of review. So what are those things that are just going to stay in the OMB review? Um, maintaining, improving, maintaining uh, health and safety, direct, uh, direct caregiving, 
uniform positions uh, necessary to implement critical initiatives, new programs that we've all put out and said we want positions for. 3K is a good example, obviously. That has to go forward. Legally mandated by federal, state, local, or court order. Um, positions that, uh, that we have put forward, both at the council's request and, and the administration to create revenue that offset savings that are part of insourcing. We do those often. Those obviously will not go to another level. There are some civil service requirements that deal with provisional employees uh, being replaced, and that's a mandate by state civil service, and we're obviously complying with that. And if we did, as, as we are doing with Early Learn, where there is a functional interagency transfer from ACS to the Department of Education. That's obviously a, a, an approved function that's part of the budget, and that would continue. We then said that those positions that are not part of that will then be reviewed by, uh, by a working group made up of the first deputy mayor's office, uh, the com commissioner, two commissioners, DCAS and OLR, and OMB. And there will be another review to see if those positions should move forward. So this is, as the mayor indicated, a partial hiring freeze. We did say we would come back at adoption and talk about what type of savings we believe we can, we can reach with, with this process. Okay, so I'm going through this. Who's left? Right. Who, who are we going to free? It just seems like there, there are still many. I, I, trust me, there are many. There are many personnel actions there that come through. There are thousands of personnel actions that come through. Okay. This so was not a. The mayor didn't at any point. Uh, at no point did the mayor say this was a complete freeze on hiring. He right. articulated direct care service, and and those things were not going to were not going to be. In. So, is it still the management and administrative positions that we? Um, understood them to be? Is that yes. still within? Yes, yes. Okay. But, but this was articulating for the agencies, here are the kinds of positions that will only, that will continue through the traditional and ongoing OMB review process. Okay. So it, did this process add a layer of review? It does. It so does on those, on those positions that that don't meet, for example, if a position doesn't meet one of these criteria, then it would have an additional level of review. Okay. So, Which and it's consistent, I believe, with what the council has been asking us to do. And that gets to your second question to some degree, which is the vacancy question. Right. Which you have asked us to review vacancies. And so part of this will, will well, well, it's not directly related. They are interrelated. And the vacancies will clearly, the position uh, the, in, in certain agencies with large number of vacancies will obviously be part of this process. And is it the management and administrative positions within those vacancies or is it vacancies as a total? It would be any position. It that's be, vacant. That's vacant would still go through. All positions are going to continue to go through the OMB process. Okay. The Department of Education is the chancellor's instituting her own process to mirror this, which is also something the council has asked. And all vacancies will be going through the OMB process. The ones that don't meet these criteria will then go through this added level of review. Okay. Um, so is there a targeted savings goal or a no, targeted number? Once again, we'll, the mayor said that we would come back uh, at adoption and talk about what we believe we can achieve with this. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about some things that came up during the hearings. Um, several commissioners alluded to or actually stated um, that they were still in conversations with uh, you over in particular ACS, DIFTA, and DOE, and they wanted to ensure that we are aware of any additional revenue because they're still engaging in new needs. It seemed that the conversation, they're still identifying new needs with OMB. So on both of those agencies, the council has, uh, in the first, my first hearing, and I assume with the agency chair, with the agency commissioners, uh, the council raised additional questions about whether new needs were needed. Seniors, uh, there, there were, there was a, 
fairly extensive exchange, and we agreed to work with you right. um, on seniors and additional, additional needs of the senior community. I said it in my testimony this morning. So we're in that process with you uh, to see at adoption what, what other resources we can provide to that community. On, uh, on ACS, um, on, on ACS, as you know, we, uh, we have a new commissioner. The commissioner has been also another area where there have been concerns in, uh, in prevention and in child protection services. So we are, and as they are with you, we are in a conversation with them. Is there anything that needs to be done quickly at adoption that would help us in these two areas? And that's the conversation we're in. So I'm going to circle back with you. And remember, we did add things. I should add, we added significant program, programs to ACS in the executive budget for right. those very purposes. Right, and, and, and that's why I wanted clarity because we have add, added programs. ACS in particular is going through several levels of monitors and evaluations Correct. on Correct. what works and what doesn't work. That's right. Um, so just I wanted to understand because, you know, when you present us the executive budget and while we – are negotiating through adoption on things that we'd like to see added. Um, it just seemed that DIFTA was still engaging in conversations for funding. Um, and we just wanted to be clear that there so, isn't revenue that is going to come out of left field. No, no. The, the, uh, you, we're all watching the same revenue, the same tax, uh, the same tax numbers. The, you may have a different, uh, your staff may have a different view of, uh, of how our, our, obviously our our, our forecast is extremely cautious, as you know, both on revenues, on debt service. Um, we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, this is a little side, but clearly if we look around to other states, we're seeing reports of huge cash flow problems uh, all around us. As a matter of fact, across the country, we're not, we really did not have that problem here because of our cautious revenue forecasting. So you may, you may have disagreements that we'll have to work out on the revenue side. On, on the spending side, again, on DIFTA, I, really it is part of the, uh, it really comes out of the questions the council has been asking and are there additional things we should be providing. On ACS, on an ongoing basis, I think it's the responsible thing for us to constantly say, are there additional things we should be doing for child protective services and for preventive measures to provide additional protection? And, and there are many reviews going on, and if those reviews, um, if those reviews point to either of us that we should be adding more resources, then we're taking that seriously. Okay, um, I know that you mentioned this in your tes testimony, and thank you for being so detailed, actually, on the impacts that um, the, the president's proposed budget would have, um, and the Republican Congress seems pretty clear um, that they are also all over the place, right? So that's what we have. We have total confusion um, in the federal government. But, you know, I would like to know if we can at least agree that we probably should begin to start not, we're gonna fight this together till the end. We are your partner in this and we're gonna do that. But at what point do you turn to your commissioners and say, we may, we should start looking at some contingencies. Not that you would share, but that, you know, this process of, worst case scenario they're preparing for because commissioner after commissioner testified that they're just going to fight, that there really isn't. And maybe there was one or two, I think um, uh, um, the NYCHA commissioner said, that, you know, obviously that they're looking at contingency in ca worst case scenario. But I think everyone else pretty much was saying we're just going to fight this. So at what point do you feel um, is the right time for us to start thinking of contingencies? So. Not to repeat myself, but and and but you're going to repeat said, yourself. Well, look, the the these the cuts in that proposal of Tuesday were devastating. And you said it, I said it, the mayor has said it, and they are almost all consuming, right? I mean, they have a huge impact not just on the city of New York and and our residents, but they have a huge impact on the state of New York. I mean, the state of New York, not only are these, if, if, if it is true that the, that the federal budget and the ACA repeal, and by the way, there's still confusion, you're absolutely right, but if those two Medicaid cuts are, are, are 
additive as they suggested, then that's 35% cut to Medicaid or more. Hmm. I mean, that's quite incredible. And, and, then, and then on top of that, to say in the, in the ACA repeal that New York State will be directed on how it funds its portion of Medicaid, quite incredible action that's going to have profound repercussions on us and are we the so the first line of this is to say no it's not acceptable and that we're going to do everything we can to fight that and it turns out that in and this certainly doesn't end what is going to be a very difficult battle but but it turns out that in the continue in the in what we call a continuing resolution but is actually the end mm -hmm. of the was a federal omnibus bill that the $17 billion of cuts, there were $17 billion proposed by the President for the last five months of this current federal fiscal year, and none of that happened. And in addition, we received, which there were many doubts about, there was funding for $61 million to reimburse New York City and other communities for security for the President. Uh, beyond that, and, and I'm going to keep saying this too. Beyond that, the savings that we're putting forward, the first time this administration has done November, January, and April, in each update, in each part of our budget, more and more savings, the partial, the partial freeze, cautious, but nevertheless a partial attempt to start another level of review on hiring, looking with you at the vacancies, and then putting a level of reserves that by any measure, However we try to measure that, whether it's on city revenues, spending, or anything, these are the highest level of reserves that we've achieved together of any city administration. Those are protective measures. Those are ways to say that we are being careful about the uncertainty we face. So I'm not going to repeat everything, because we're just going to be repeating back and forth to each other. Um, we're not on the, on the same page uh, when it comes to those numbers, um, and we will continue to negotiate after um, the hearings before adoption um, on this. I wanted to just pivot um, to the human services contracts. As you are aware, the value of many of the city's human services contracts is not sufficient to support the actual cost to deliver services. Nearly 20% of the city's nonprofit providers are insolvent, and 40% have less than two months' worth of funding to cover services readily available. DHS is the only human service agency whose executive budget includes additional funding to right-size shelter provider contracts. The remaining agencies that fall under human services have yet to address budgetary shortfalls for contracted services. As you are well aware, the Council in its preliminary budget response called for a right-sizing of the human services contracts. Is OMB currently working with the city's other human services to right-size their contract and fully fund personal services and other than personal services costs based on the services that nonprofit organizations are contracted to provide? So we, we inherited a situation where as with our workforce and employees, there were no contracts. When we started this administration, there were complete contracts with basically all of our unions. With the human service providers, they had seen dramatic cuts, including at the agencies that we were just discussing. DIFTA, ACS had dramatic cuts under the, uh, the end of the prior administration. Those were being reflected in what was happening to human service providers. We have over the course of these three and a half years been addressing their problems. We did together a two and a half percent wage adjustment two years ago. We accelerated the minimum before the state law had come into effect. We funded the first, the 1150 and then the $15 minimum wage. We have now proposed a year ago, not maybe six months, uh, half a year ago, we made a, an agreement with the daycare workers and the daycare providers that gave them a pattern conforming uh, increase. And in the preliminary budget, we put forward for all these human service providers for their workers, 2% for fiscal year 18 wage increase, 2% in 19 and another 2% 
in, tw in 2020. That alone is $200 million when fully annualized. That is not ignoring this sector. That is recognizing how important this sector is. We have, we have done, um, it, it's not true that we have only done base adjustments for DHS. We actually, and, and you know this well, we made a major adjustment in Beacons, for example, which was the first adjustment since the creation of the program. They had gone over 20 years with no increase in rates until last year when we together gave them a significant rate increase to recognize, to recognize the needs of the Beacon program. We did the same and we had done many adjustments over the past two years for the Early Learn program. Going forward, what we said last year and what we have done now in the executive budget was we looked at an area that was very important to all of us and that was DHS and our shelter providers and to right size to one, get their contracts in order, which is happening and I know Commissioner Banks has testified to that, that he'll have, he'll have most of the contracts in place by the end of this fiscal year. So having the contracts in place, having the wage adjustments in place and then moving forward with a model budgeting, not a minor, not a minor amount of money um, when fully implemented, well over 100 million in adjustments being made to the DHS social service providers. We are talking to that community. We recognize how important they are to the delivery of our services and we're talking to the community and we're talking to commissioners about how we proceed. The DHS adjustment actually took a year. We had contracts that over the years different rates were being provided, some things were being reimbursed, some things were not being reimbursed, they were really all over the place. That's what we inherited, that's what we're fixing. And that's what we're in the process of doing. And we've committed that we will be talking to them about other areas in the not-for-profit community about how to reflect their costs. Obviously, it's part of the whole balance that, uh, that we do together on addressing the needs of, of the entire human service sector. So I just think that at this point uh, currently, and, and we understand the proposed 2%, the nonprofit sector is saying we are struggling. And in many ways, these are our partners. Government can't do this alone. We're talking about doing a lot of support work for families. Um, the mayor often talks about vulnerable communities. These are the organizations that are providing the services in our neighborhoods. And if they're coming to us and saying, we can't sustain ourselves, this 2%, um, I don't think anyone's gonna say, we don't appreciate the 2%, but it clearly isn't enough. So um, I would hope that we will continue to engage in these conversations um, to get to a, uh, at least to get to a better plan as we plan these, um, the growth in, in the coming years that we can increase percentages and you know, talk about percentages that may be more adequate um, to help shore up our nonprofits because I do believe that we're in crisis and they've been very clear about expressing that. So we agree they are very important and I think that the administration has shown how important they are. Unlike the prior administration, we actually made them part of a wage pattern consistent with what city employees were getting. So we did, it's, it's over a 6% increase over those three years. On top of what we did, I'm actually being corrected, it's, it's almost near $250 million of wage adjustments when fully implemented. That's, that clearly shows our commitment. Do we need to do more? Well, obviously we're saying we need to do more and we're committed to doing more and the money we're putting in in DHS for the model budgeting and what we did for the Beacons last year and what we did for the Early Learn programs for the prior two years and the agreement with 1707 and the daycare and the daycare providers last year all reflect our desire and our, and our recognition of how important they are to the programs that we jointly care about. So can you um, walk me through what we've learned from the model budgeting? On DHS? Yeah. I, I'm happy to give you, I, I want to make sure I do this properly. We're happy to follow up and give you details. I'll, I, and once again, uh, if we're meeting with uh, Commissioner Banks, we can do that together. I mean, he went through that process for a whole year. 
on how they rationalize uh, how they rationalize the rates and uh, and how they assumed costs. So I, we're happy to sit down and do that. I would recommend we do that with uh, with the commissioner. Okay. Um, so we'll follow up. Hopefully we can get this in for the adoption. We can do that immediately. Okay, great. Um, I just my last question for this round. Um, there was uh, during the health and hospitals executive budget hearing, the council raised concerns about the transformation plan, specifically the hundred million dollar placeholder in fiscal's 2020 and 2021 for development opportunities. Um, it just seems that this development opportunity was just going to keep raising this hundred million dollars. Um, but there wasn't, I didn't get a clear plan. Can you outline the process that led to the city's adding 200 million total in projected revenue from development opportunities in this plan? So, uh, the, you heard from the, uh, the acting head of health and hospitals, uh, who's done a very successful job in this year. We believe the transformation plan for the current year, we should step back for a minute, the transformation plan for the current year is on track, actually in some respects exceeding that. Uh, and that's a very positive sign that many thought would not happen. Um, at this point in time, we don't believe additional resources are needed. In the original transformation plan of, of well over a year ago now, the transformation plan did say there may be development opportunities uh, at the sites of uh, health and hospital, including uh, there are some sites that they're not using at this point, and that there may be development opportunities. It was actually a modest amount uh, to say that uh, in, the, in the end of this financial plan that there may be 200 million of available resources from development opportunities using, using land uh, more wisely and seeing if there are other opportunities there. That's all that reflected. Okay, it just um, it does not reflect the specific. We don't have at this point to tell you that here is a specific okay, project that's or a specific piece of land. It is an assumption based. The potential on of the correct. empty space that you have. Correct. Okay, um, okay, um, that's what we wanted clarity on. And also, um, we had asked the commissioner, but perhaps you can help us um, as council members. There might be development up. These hospitals are in our districts. And many of us are looking to build new schools. We're looking to build new precincts. We're looking to build a lot of new things. So if we have an opportunity to identify locations that we may not normally have within the portfolio of access, I think um, we would like, as a council, we would like to work with both OMB and h, &H um, that before it goes to a developer necessarily, that we have the opportunity to look at what we can do with, um, with the potential of bringing sites up. So we agree completely and we'll make sure that happens. Okay, great. So in my round two, I wanted to follow up on Moya, the general corporation tax, Healing NYC, a question on DIFTA, um, but I'll come back in my second round. Um, we will, we've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal and Rodriguez. We will now hear from Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Council Member Lander. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And to the Director, it is no secret that it is raining an awful lot uh, this month and certainly today. But I want to uh, use that as an opportunity to highlight that somewhere in the City of New York, in fact, I'm relatively certain that in just about every borough, there are libraries that are leaking right now. Uh, this is a serious situation. And I know I always talk about libraries and culture uh, because I'm the chair of the committee, but I also represent a lot of people, a lot of people who need those libraries, and we desperately need our libraries to be in good operating order. There is a $150 million request for capital in this budget on behalf of the libraries that would address these critical maintenance issues so that on a rainy day like today and a rainy month like this month, our libraries can open, they can be safe, they can be secure, and they don't have to have buckets uh, in children's rooms and in meeting rooms. So I want to ask you, Dean, is that $150 million request something that you think is worthwhile? And is the administration seriously discussing this? And will we have a meaningful discussion about including that in this budget? 
So I have to step back for a moment and remind that you that successfully together we actually have done significant amounts of investments in libraries and the first multi-year commitment that the libraries have had on capital. Instead of doing it on an annual basis, two years ago we made a significant commitment. We have expanded to six-day service on libraries and done significant operations. We've met major capital needs of the libraries. Uh, there are always significant needs out there. I'm not minimizing that. Uh, it, this is part of our conversation with you about what those needs are. Another place where the commitment level uh, needs work and needs improvement because there are capital projects uh, that the libraries have where they're having a hard time moving forward on those capital projects. So it's another area to go back to the very first question on capital where, where I think we all need to see some improvements um, in addition to talking about what additional resources may be available. We need to make sure that the resources we put forward are actually being used. No one wants to see library capital projects move faster than me, including at Hunter's Point. But let me just uh, uh, get from you on the record that this $150 million critical capital maintenance request is on the table and is something that the administration is seriously considering. Well, we are in discussions with you, and I, we understand that one of the council priorities is additional capital. Uh, I'm pointing out that we have successfully with you in the past made made really significant commitments, but we also need to be concerned that we're not simply, it's, it really goes right back to the first question, not putting additional resources and then nothing happens. That's right, which I think also gets to the point of, of OMB working with us and the library systems to allow for more pass-through projects so the libraries can manage those projects themselves, which I think would bring them the ability to bring those projects in under budget and on time. So, we're, in a much more frequent manner. So we're happy to, that's a conversation we should be happening, but we should make sure that that's the actual result of those and that the libraries can actually handle the additional, the additional effort and resources it takes to do those. There are a lot of very small projects that, that are handled and it may, be, it may be more difficult than it appears on its face. Uh, we should definitely pursue that. I just want to say uh, also, the investments that we have made, baselining $343 million for six-day library service and the several hundred million in capital are great achievements that we've done together, this administration, this council, I'm very proud of that, but we need to go and keep uh, uh, making progress on this very critical issue. I want to quickly address uh, culture in the arts because you mentioned all the devastating cuts at the hands of the Trump budget but didn't mention that, in fact, President Trump uh, followed through with his threat to essentially abolish the NEA, the NEH, the IMLS, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Your Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, our Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, has already said that that elimination would cost New York City cultural organizations well over $50 million in direct support, which would devastate many organizations, including our smaller out-of-borough nonprofit cultural organizations, as you know, there is a $40 million request for increase to culture and the arts. There was a $10 million increase by, uh, in the budget last year that has not been restored or baselined. We need that funding. Can you address that and how seriously this administration takes culture and the arts and Donald Trump's assault on culture and the arts in the city of New York? So let, let me start with the, your first point about the, the list I gave. I gave one page of devastating cuts. I, we could spend uh, hours going through other devastating cuts. So by no means, if I left something out, I can, uh, they're coming, section eight, huge amounts of cuts. Not on my list, actually, I didn't realize it in the beginning, but it was huge cuts to section eight. We are learning every day more and more cuts that are in this budget. I, the intent was to give you examples of huge and significant, uh, significant examples of what would happen if this budget were to go through. So, and by no means was that uh, intended to be a full list of every single thing the president's proposing to do, with none of which should be happening, including obviously what's happening on the cultural side. Uh, again, 
we worked with you very closely the last year and said, okay, there should be an additional allotment for cultures. We do care about cultural institutions and we reflected that in last year's budget and, uh, you know, again, this is part of a conversation we're having with you. Critically important that particularly as uh, Donald Trump assaults culture and the arts uh, and, and thinking people everywhere that we, the city of New York, uh, come back and support the arts right. in an even I, more meaningful way. I, again, back to the, the answer I had with the chair before, any place where we see these devastating cuts though, we should be fighting those devastating cuts, Absolutely. not ending up in a position of simply backfilling and trying to backfill fill with something that should not happen at its very basis. Resist. Thank you. Thank you, Majority <laughs> Leader. Um, we will hear from Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair and Budget Director. And, and I appreciate your one-page summary of the lowlights of the, of the budget, which I've already gotten some feedback on on, on Twitter. One, one thing I guess I want to ask about that I, I might have missed in the budget, amongst all those devastating cuts, one thing that he had said he was going to do a lot of was help pay for infrastructure for our crumbling bridges yes. and roads. Did I miss the infrastructure part I, of the we, Trump we budget? Both, we both missed it. We're still looking. Uh, so I, but I don't believe it's in there. Yeah, I don't think so either. And so for all that talk, you know, not one penny in, in uh, an infrastructure plan for a city that has very significant infrastructure needs. Um, uh, I appreciate that we are, uh, are putting significant dollars to infrastructure, and I think, you know, the chair and I, while we, I'm indeed going to keep pushing on capital projects management reform, wholeheartedly agree that this is an important time for New York City to have the capital program that we have, to invest in our infrastructure, and I appreciate you guys stepping up to do it. Um, I do want to uh, say a little more about the need for capital projects uh, management reform. We're, we're putting out a little issue brief today um, that look, just I takes a look at your capital projects dashboard, the city's projects over $25 million. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to guess these numbers, but Thank you. Uh, of them, of those projects, and these are all just city data, 44% um, of the projects are severely late and 42% of the projects are severely over budget. Of the 44 projects that are both severely late and severely over budget, 43 are managed by DDC, and on median, $30 million over budget and 700 days late, and that's on top of the slow build report that Center for an Urban Future put out earlier that showed that for the library and cultural projects, 930 bucks a square foot, about twice what commercial construction costs in New York City. So. While we did indeed, look, I know you want to improve this. I know your commissioners want to improve it. I know lots of people are taking lots of steps, but it doesn't feel to me like we are taking the more fundamental look at what's not working in this system. The DDC fact suggests actually that maybe we should look at whether the state granted superpowers that EDC and the School Construction Authority have or something more agencies should have. Obviously we support design build, but the steps we are taking are not yet close to the level of reform that we need in this system. So we have some ideas that we're proposing in, in legislation, but the truth is a real top to bottom look, which is not organized by can we shave a few more days here or there, but which is organized by this system is not delivering what we wanted to deliver. How do we re-engineer it to get there? So we're, that's the work that we are eager to start doing with you. Okay, so this is not new. It is not New new. York City's capital. No, no, and, and I've been saying it through the prior administration. Um, this no. is not the fault of the de Blasio administration, but we got a shared responsibility to do more to fix it. We agree. So uh, I agree. I, I said that at the first hearing. Um, I, I look forward to your recommendations. We need to work together to figure out how this is. I, I do think we're we need to be careful. We need to be thoughtful about this. Of course. Um, and what improvements can be made at DDC? What improvements can be made at parks? There may be many different answers to how to address this. Once again, many of these are small are small programs. We are making incremental improvements. Thank you for that. That's true. Our approach to the capital budgeting is much more encompassing and inclusive this year, including city planning, as the charter had envisioned, really for the first time. Um, so we're trying to address that, have a better sense of this, but can we, should we be doing improvements? Do we need to be doing improvements? Yeah, we, we do agree. 
All right, and I'll just note, while small projects are no doubt a problem, the stats I gave are from the projects $25 million and, okay, and fair above. Um, That's fair. Uh, and the other question I'll just ask in my remaining time uh, is about the City's Commission on Human Rights. I was very encouraged the other day to see them launch this wonderful new yep. campaign. You do have rights. It's very inspiring. I love that at this moment when we can't count on the federal government to protect people's civil and human rights, we are stepping up to do it. I expressed concern in the preliminary round that we weren't doing enough because people's human rights complaints have grown substantially to over a year. But then I was dismayed to see in the executive budget, I think it actually got worse, at least as I read it, we cut their communications budget. So things exactly like this You Do Have Rights campaign wouldn't be possible next year. Um, can you address what we're doing to make sure, I guess, both that we are able to communicate and project what we, uh, our values here, but also that people have the ability to get their claims processed so that we aren't letting discrimination linger uh, for over a year? So we have, look, we, we've done this together. We once again inherited a budget that had been decimated. We have done over 100, well over 100 percent increase in that agency's budget. Uh, certainly no increase. They just cut it so low that 100 percent no, wasn't even that much. It, it, was, it was significant. <laughs> it was significant. New, new space, new headcount. I mean, we are trying to address their needs. If, uh, once again, if we, uh, if we think uh, we're not hesitant, if we believe at some point and in during any one of our budget modifications, including adoption, that we need more resources for that, we do think it's a big priority. We agree on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Chair. And um, Director Foulihan, it's great to see you and your team always um, on top of it. So I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to follow up on two things, um, starting with Councilmember Lander's point about historic cost overruns. Um, so a couple of years ago, as you know, a watchdog um, group, Class Size Matters, identified a, a, a contract that, you know, smelled funny, and City Hall did something historic. Uh, you, you negated the contract and had them rebid it. Um, and it ended up saving the city hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there anything else since that time, because we talked about it quite extensively, um, that you've unearthed, that OMB has unearthed, that is have you identified anything similar to that since that time? I don't believe anything that's similar to that. That does not mean that through our normal process and the staff, and I actually have to go back on this, that we don't uh, question agencies about contracts and development and whether there's a better way to do it. We've certainly been doing that where we insource. Uh, DOE and the executive budget does significant insourcing. That was actually part of a process that included would you need that contract or are there better ways to do that. So there, I, I, so I don't, I'm a little concerned about using that simply as, as the model, what happened uh, a couple years ago. But do we question? Of course we question. A and does that lead to, uh, to better government and efficiencies? Of course it does. Okay. Um, it, you know, I am regularly getting uh, suggestions from that whistleblower about specious contracts. And um, I would like to know that OMB is doing a regular audit of their contracts. I understand the unusual, the relationship DOE has with the city. It's a, it's, you know, quasi-state. Um, by the same token, you know, um, even city funds pay for many contracts that are suspect. Recently, I was made aware of a $600,000 contract to a group that identifies internships for your CTE schools. Mm -hmm. One of the CTE schools reached out to me and says, I don't understand why the city pays for anyone to do that. We do that for free at our school. It's part of our mission. So. I mean, well, so I, I would want to know that well, DOE is regularly being investigated. And here's, here's my point. 
that if we were to do that, I mean, Councilmember Lander is talking about hundreds of millions of dollars on the capital side. I think if we were to do that more systemically, that we would have available to us money to spend on the things that we so desperately need. Let's look at the human service contracts. There is no question in my mind that this administration has done more than any other administration before it. Well, let's put it a different way. Previous administrations caused the problem by underfunding, systemically underfunding our human service contracts, both the workers and the funding they need for maintenance. This administration has done two things. One, begun to address the PS issues by increasing salaries. Also, you've done remarkable in right-sizing on the homeless service contracts and the beacons that you mentioned. What I'd like to hear today is that there would be a understanding that you would put in the budget uh, an OTPS equivalent to the PS funding, in other words, follow the same pattern, 2% and 2% and so on, and that a commitment to right size as we go forward with the DIFTA contracts for our senior centers, um, with you know all of our work that we do with mental health uh, facilities, that's the commitment that I'm looking for, and that frankly, 80,000 workers in this sector um, are looking for as well. So a few answers. On the Department of Education, we're, we should talk to the Department of Education on that particular program and any concern you have, and we should address it. I'm not going to assume that because one provider disagrees with the results of a procurement or a process that something was inappropriate doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't ask the question, so I'm happy to follow up with you with the department on that issue. Where we can find savings, we should always be finding savings. On the question of the non-for-profit community and the human service providers, I'm not going to repeat everything I did before because I did a fairly extensive litany. And I heard it. And, and the public and you, heard and it. And you heard it. And it's there. And are we committed to working with them? We are very committed to working with them. We're in conversations, as you well know. You and I have been talking about this. We're going to continue to talk about this. And we'll uh, try to address the, these very complicated issues, once again, in a balanced manner, with what uh, resources we have available, how we can move forward with them. The goal, <coughs> the, excuse me, the goal clearly was to move forward with them. We would not have done, this is the only one I'll, I'll reemphasize, we would have not done basically a pattern conforming wage adjustment over three years if we didn't believe that their long-term security was important to us. Uh, I'm, with permission, Chair, I'm not addressing that at all. I, I believe your commitment. What they're asking for now is a similar commitment for the increased cost of maintenance, of technology, and of um, rent, for example, uh, cleaning supplies, things that have, in costs that have increased over the past 20 years that we are now asking private philanthropists to pay for. Can you, uh, what a waste of money. The private philanthropists should be paying for new and innovative ideas. That's what philanthropy is for. Can you imagine us saying to a construction contractor, here, we're gonna give you 80 cents on the dollar and you should just cross subsidize with your other bridge jobs or, or luxury high rise jobs in order to pay for any cost, costs that are not covered by our contract. We would never do that, just the opposite. A bridge contractor tells us the cost is X, we pay them X. When there's an overage and it's a million dollars more, we pay them a million dollars more. I know you're working hard to right size. What I, I'm asking for in this budget now is a commitment to fund the increased cost in maintenance that is uh, unfairly burdening our providers. It would be like saying to the uh, DIFTA, we're only gonna, we're not gonna fund you for the increased cost in supplies and IT. We're, we're gonna stop giving you money for IT and supplies. It, good luck with that. That's what we're doing to our OTPS, for, in terms of OTPS for our human service providers. And, um, but I wanna end by saying I do thank you 
for what's been done. No other administration has done that. They dug a hole. You're getting us out of it, but we need a little bit more to go. So, again, we're in conversations with them, as you know, to try to figure out a way that we can do a balanced approach to address those needs. We have now made hundreds of millions of dollars investment. The wage piece it will end up being $250 million, and we've made other investments that total by the end of this four-year financial plan almost $400 million. That is a serious commitment to this community. I'm not suggesting, and I never did, that there weren't other needs, and are there ways for us to talk about that and address that? Yes, but at the same time, we have to recognize how much we've done in this community. That's right. You're digging us Thank out of you, a really council big Thank you, Council Member. Um, we'll put you Thank on the you. second round. Uh, council Thank Member Rodriguez, and we've been joined by Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair. First, two recommendations. One is when it comes to the fair fair. As you know, like uh, the community cost raise, the poverty rate by 2.2 percent point uh, with a greater impact of pushing people into poverty based on the study that has been released. Uh, we're working with the mayor uh, with the effort to take 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty by 2025. But also we know that the cost of transportation is so high for working class New Yorkers. It, I encourage administration, even though we know that the mayor has said that he understands the importance of the fair, fair campaign when it comes to the merits. We get it. It should be the MTA, but the MTA is not doing it. And this thing that we as a city, we had we had jump in because we say we need to do it. We cannot wait for opening. So I encourage the city to continue this conversation, especially in the negotiating team from the council and try to do phase one of this plan to put some money, some amount of million dollars to the phase one of the fair fair campaign. My second recommendation is when it comes to region zero, the three million dollars is not there for the educational awareness campaign of region zero. It, it, and I think that, you know, not because this is an important initiative that the mayor embraced it, when he was elected, but it, in order for us to reduce by 2024 the number of pedestrians being killed, it, we will do it not only with a new law, enforcing the law, but also changing the cultural and the education awareness uh, dollars is so important to uh, continue advertising the radio, TV, and newspapers. So, yes, recommendation for us to also be sure that we work together to put those $3 million that they are not there right now for the 2018 uh, budget. Question, uh, one related to DOT, uh, to transportation. You know, the governor made the announcement two days ago. Uh, Amtrak is a mess, MTA is a mess. We take the train, two train is running delay, uh, three train, most of the train, the signal system is not working. That's the MTA, the city doesn't have, you know, the major power. However, when it comes to our buses, we can have an impact in our buses. And I think that I'm calling, I would like to know, you know, what is our plan to turn the buses that we have today in our street as a above the ground train system? Because it's about, this is not only the MTA upgrading the technology but it's also about the bus lane. It, I'm not, we are not doing enough enforcement with the, with the, when it comes to the bus lane. So what is our plan? What is the part that we are doing as the city responsibility to upgrade the infrastructure of the bus lane that we can say we are planning to run our buses faster so that people that don't have, it doesn't take more time for someone to take the bus than to walk when they go to work. So we have been working on uh, bus lanes and select bus routes and, and increasing uh, signal timing. So we have been trying to make improvements in, in the bus. Let, let's remember, though, the bu it is part of the MTA. And well, well, that's city, I, I just, I, I just to 
just to step back for a moment, though, the, the, we did make an historic commitment to the MTA capital plan. I just want to put that out there, a $2.5 billion commitment in the, M in the current MTA capital plan. I just want to but, yeah, that but, you know, but my thing is that it is, I understand this. Some parts are related to the MTA. Enforcing is our part. You know, the time when the buses, they had to be, the lane had to be only dedicated to buses is our part, and we need to increase. So, so let's talk about this. I, I'm and, happy to have And we already have the Fifth Avenue as the only area in the city where we are, also in the t we are already using the technology that give priority to the bus drivers. So we need to learn from the already on technology in the Fifth Avenue. We My last question. So we should have that, we, we should get together and have that conversation okay. and what your thoughts are. Okay. And my last question is about three years ago, you came here and you say, an average of 50% of New Yorkers live on the poverty line. This is what we inherit. Three years after, what are the numbers from the three years ago and today? Well, we know uh, the, the, the mayor um, now, I think two weeks ago, put out the, uh, the, the new poverty statistics. And for the first time since the Great Recession, there was a reduction in near poverty. I will get you the exact numbers. I'll get you the numbers. I, I'll have to get the numbers of the at or near poverty from three years ago and the numbers now. There have been improvements. They are lower. No, they're lower. The at or near poverty numbers the mayor announced are lower. We'll, I'll, get you, I'll get you the comparison. Madam Chair, I think you should fill the budget director in on our hearing with the MTA, that highly enlightened Well, there was nothing to say. I can't even say anything because they didn't say anything to us. So there was no information with the MTA. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Cumbo. Thank you. I know that it was brought up um, earlier and also brought up at the last hearing with Commissioner Finkelpearl in regards to the $10 million um, not being baselined in this budget, um, also recognizing the fact that the original ask was not for $10 million, it was actually for $40 million, and wanting to know the status um, of that particular uh, allocation. Will it be baselined also in the future? Uh, we also want to know what is going to be the future of that because we also have the, um, the creative cultural plan that has been launched and announced. So the basic question is, the $10 million, will it be baselined? And will we also see that very critical increase of $40 million that the cultural community has been um, very anxious and patient, but it's getting to that breaking point where many institutions are um, questioning laying off staff, laying off uh, key organizations that they partner with. So it's really a big challenge at this time. So we are in discussions with you on what, uh, what should happen with the cultural piece. We did do, we did, as you know, at adoption last year, put the 10 million forward. That was fairly significant. It may not have been everything they wanted. And obviously we're talking to cultural institutions. At the same time, we're talking to other, uh, to the not-for-profit world about what their needs are and what they're confronting. And we're looking at that with you at this process. So it is part of the process and the discussion we're having with you uh, on what should be accomplished at adoption. Would you say that the Department of Cultural Affairs in terms of their increases over the last four years, in terms of the larger agencies, of course, would you say that Department of Cultural Affairs has received uh, the least amount of increase over the last four years? I, actually, I will have to get back to you on where they fit in and the amount of resources, cultural affairs. I do think cultural affairs is, has, the agency certainly has been treated well, mm -hmm. and I do believe the, we made a significant commitment last year on the 10 million. The, moving right along to the MWBE commitment. So, as you know, the mayor had initially put in uh, $10 million, and then an additional $10 million to match that in terms of loans and bonding and that sort of thing. Where does that $20 million, has there been an understanding of how that money has been allocated? Is there an understanding if it will be uh, regenerated and also put forward in the budget so that that program can continue 
Um, we recognized that program to be a pilot program initially right. um, with the understanding that there would be an increase over time. Yes, we, on both programs, the, uh, the, pro the, the money has been in the executive budget, was moved forward to the current year. Uh, as my understanding, and I can have uh, the Deputy Mayor, Richard Burry, who's heading this up for the mayor, give you more detail, but my understanding is these programs, which are now getting started and are actually putting forward commitments, so why don't we give you, I'll make sure that we give you an update on exactly where those programs are. Because I we know they mm -hmm. are moving forward, and I know we're clearly committed to this, and we're putting whatever resources are necessary. We continue those fu that funding into the c upcoming fiscal year and we'll keep monitoring every week. And the other question that I have is in regards to early learn. Um, and early learn as it pertains to um, it's uh, that the universal pre-K program, a lot of our uh, organizations are very concerned because the RFP um, as it pertains to early learn has not been issued yet. And there's a great deal of concern, fear, and anxiety um, about what will be the future of our early learn programs when will the RFP be issued? Will there have to be extensions in the contracts um, for the current early learn providers because the RFP has not been issued at this time? So several things on early learn. Mm -hmm. o over the past two years, we, it's one of the examples I gave earlier on the nonprofit on the nonprofit community and the human service providers, early learn um, was under great stress with the beginning of this administration, and we made several accommodations on reimbursement levels, including going back into the prior administration to make sure that they were being properly reimbursed. So the administration has made a very strong commitment to, er to early learn. Last year, about six months ago, we made a, an agreement, we were part of an agreement, um, with the day, with daycare, uh, with both the union and the daycare providers to provide a wage adjustment for their workers. In this executive budget, we are recommending that the, we are moving um, the early learn program from ACS over the next year to the Department of Education. So that, and to consolidate it under what now is the very successful UPK program. As part of that, we're also expanding, as the mayor announced, the 3K mm -hmm. uh, with two districts this fall. So part of when the next RFP comes out is actually part of evaluating, and it will be worked on with both ACS and DOE as we move forward, <clears throat> when is the appropriate time to put out that new RFP? And, and I, so I don't have an immediate answer for you, but as we make this transition, we'll keep you posted on what we think is the appropriate time to issue that new RFP. Just want to reiterate what my concern is there. My concern is with this transition that many of the um, culturally specific organizations that have been doing daycare provider work, um, particularly in the African American, Latino, and Asian communities that have been doing culturally specific daycare work in these transitions and in these RFP processes, they often get um, rejected from the RFP uh, proposal process on the back end side. And currently the major concern about that is that in order for you to be able to qualify for an RFP, you need to have a negotiated lease with the city of New York even to qualify. And currently many of our daycare providers have month to month leases that will not qualify them to uh, participate in the RFP process and that's a big challenge that they're facing. Okay, so um, we'll, we should continue this conversation. The goal is, has never been of this administration to harm and to, uh, to small community providers. Our goal has been to try to encourage that, so if that's, if that's the concern, as we're working through this transition, we should be in touch with you and those providers on how we can help them. And uh, happy to do that. And just one more thing, Chair, just give me one more moment. Just want to ask you as Chair of the Women's Issues Committee, want to talk about the fact that 41% of single mother families with children live in poverty, according to U.S. Census figures. That's a staggeringly high number, more than twice the poverty rate. One in three working age women in poverty in New York City say they struggle to afford bus and subway fares. 
I know this issue has been discussed, but wanted to know in our budget, um, what are we planning to do, if any, at this point to address fair fares um, and phasing in fair fares for those who simply can't afford the expansions um, that we're seeing in MTA? The, look, the, the mayor, you know, and you heard him on this. He uh, is more than sympathetic towards this, but he believes the appropriate place this should be funded is by the MTA. The MTA has programs. This is the MTA sets the rates. They set the fair rates. This is where the, it should be addressed. That doesn't mean that there aren't many issues that we have worked on together to address affordability. That's why I raised the anti-poverty numbers of only that were put out a week ago that said for the first time, the poverty numbers that said for the first time those at or near poverty had actually declined since the Great Recession. We've done significant work to try to address that all through the programs that we support in the human service sector, uh, in, in education. Uh, it's one program after another has been directed at, at dealing with this problem. I also want to just come back one minute on the uh, on the small community providers and early learn. So mm -hmm. Our goal, one of the things that we changed over the past two years was to address all early learn costs. So if for some reason a provide, you're hearing from providers that we're not doing that, then you should let us know because that was not the intent. The intent was to address those costs. This was one of the areas in the not-for-profit community that we believe we addressed. So I, we are not hearing those complaints. The extent that you're hearing those complaints, we should know them. I will certainly um, arrange to have a meeting with the providers in my district that are experiencing that anxiety about what the future of their 40-plus year organizations are going to be. So we should see how we can help that. That would be very appreciated. Thank you on that. And just we need to continue to find ways for particularly our single families to be able to afford to ride the MTA to and from work. And it's great that we feel the sympathy, but when they get there to that token booth, they can't bring that sympathy with them. So we need to do more to work on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Still morning here. All right. So um, I'm going to put the labor hat on and talk about the uh, where we are in uh, upcoming collective bargaining and contracting and uh, and what that looks like where we are uh, in terms of um, have we set aside do we have the necessary savings uh, to continue uh, the patterns that have been established so we're looking to do something different and of course uh, in doing so I, I think we need to talk about health care the health care gap and debt around not just active employees but retirees as well and um, and I think in the preliminary budget we talked about the state of health care and those savings that we were hoping to achieve now what that would look like but as we move forward um, a potential RFP uh, and what savings would look like in terms of providing uh, the future of health care for city employees so uh, we are getting it's, it's hard to imagine, but we're actually getting near the next round of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens when you inherit a situation which had, for in some cases, seven years of no, uh, of no labor contracts. Um, as we approach that, we will continue to do it with the same respect we approached it in the very first day of the administration. Um, we have set aside funds in 1%. Uh, as the contracts end, we have set aside a labor reserve in our out year in our out year financial plans. So we have provided uh, resources for that. The only uh, the only thing we have said, as we did last time, is that we need to keep improving both the quality of care of the health care that we provide for our employees, and we believe that we have made significant improvements, and that no one had actually focused on this for two decades that we're making significant improvements in the quality of health care, and we're making significant savings. In the upcoming fiscal year, in eight, the 18th fiscal year, we will achieve, with the, with the Municipal Labor Committee, $1.3 billion of savings. So that is something that, together with them, we should want to continue as we move towards the next round of labor negotiations. 
So um, two things. First, uh, and, and, and I generally, we're generally on the same page, but I absolutely disagree with the quality of health care that is now being dispensed by our current provider. Um, I, I don't think it's the quality of health care that our, our, our workers, our employees, retirees deserve. I think that uh, all within the industry and all those outside of the industry are, are well aware that they're kind of on a last leg and the services being provided are indicative of that. But as we move forward, which is, which is basically the reason why we interjected the possibility of there being an RFP as we move right. forward. I, I apologize. I didn't mean to uh, to in any way imply that an RFP and a and a looking at other providers uh, should not be something to be considered. Obviously, as you know, we need to do that with our partners in labor and the municipal labor committee. Um, once again, did. We believe there can be more improvements in the quality of care that we're providing. We think we've made strides in that. We believe we've also saved funds in that. We believe we can do both of those things as we continue forward. I, I in no way meant to indicate that we were saying so we, should we, we are So we are on target for the final year of 2018? We are. And, and that is the final year, right? It, so it we begin to talk year. about what health care would look like uh, beyond That's 2018, correct. which I, I think considering that we have these agreements that are now Agreed. beginning to be like a uh, really opportune time to have serious conversations uh, about that as well. Um, could we talk about some of the, some of the, uh, the, the uh, council member Cumbo before me talked about some of the MWBE contracting. I know when we were in the budget briefing, we, we uh, I think you got charged with uh, kind of investigating, leveraging some of the resources that are being, uh, the, the, the contracting resources that are going out throughout the city. Has there been in the last month and a half any um, update or response to that? I know, again, we have approximately almost nearly $2 billion in infrastructure investment going on in Southeast Queens, but none of the vendors nor the workforce reflect so the let, um, community. As I responded, let me, let, me get, let me talk to the Deputy Mayor and let's get a specific update. I know he's been working on this, but I'll touch base with him and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're going to begin the second round, so this is a, a shorter round. I wanted to talk about the collections of the general corpora corporation tax sure. um, have been disappointing throughout the fiscal year. In fact, the executive budget, you're reducing your forecast of collections by $43 million compared to preliminary budget. Can you talk about the expected refunds for the GCT going forward and how it's influencing your forecast? So, so there. Look, um, we're now two years. Uh, we're two years from uh, from what we should all be proud of, which was a major modernization of the city corporate tax mm -hmm. that had been uh, called upon by the business community and finance community for over a decade. Um, uh, we achieved that. We also achieved when we did that. We reduced uh, corporate tax rates for small business, uh, and we we uh, reduced even beyond that the corporate tax rates for manufacturers. So it, it, this was a very successful uh, change that we made two years ago together. Um, it's, so several things are happening in the corporate tax at the same time. So we, we along with the state, now have a new, a new tax system. And the implementation of that tax system uh, has uh, clearly is causing some difficulty in our understanding um, what part of the corporate tax shortfall is due to changes in filing, understanding the tax versus corporate profits and what's happened over the past two years. So we're in the process of trying to understand that. We're being very cautious about our corporate estimates. Uh, we recognize that this scenario that given current, current revenue collections are declining and uh, you know we're just going to keep working to try to understand what the ramifications of that are because there are many things happening. It's not simply corporate profits and what's happening there. It's also we did a very dramatic change. Mm -hmm. The state did and then we followed with a very dramatic change in our corporate tax structure. 
and the interplay between those uh, we need to try to isolate so we understand uh, if we need to make any more adjustments going forward. So can you just walk me through, and I guess this is an example of that, of the city set aside of the $185 million in overpayments for 2015 when the tax reform first took place. And can you walk us through the purpose and how much of this has already been utilized? It was, once again, when we did corporate tax reform, it's a perfect example. We thought there had been uh, overpayments, and we booked that at the time. We are now taking that. Uh, so we, it, in, in our forecast on the corporate tax, it's included. So that 185 is now being recognized. Is okay. And how much of it do we have? Have we utilized so far? We, we, it's all incorporated. It's all utilized. Completely, yes. So do you think that we made it need additional as you move forward? I, once again, the corporate, even with that, the corporate tax is uh, it, year to date is declining, and we should be concerned and monitor that. We should be watching. Yes, the, the corporate tax and the banking tax, right, right. combining the – Right, right. Um, so is there an, an, another number that you think kind of to help make up the, the difference of, of possible, I guess, reimbursements? I, at this time, I, I don't have anything at, – at this time, we're not prepared to say, here are changes we need to make in the corporate tax structure. We're not. We there. I think we need to – to get, it was very confusing. This was a confusing year. Some filers, some people were filing in March. Dean, if you're saying it's confusing, it could you was. imagine what it means over here it, on this so side? Some people were filing in March. Some people were filing in April. There were different filing requirements. I think we're going to have to play this out for another year and then come back and assess what's the situation. So will we have to see an additional 80, 185 million again in a year? No, or? I don't believe so. Okay. So we'll see less of it or? You, you won't see that modification ever again. Okay. The, que the question, the more fundamental question, um, as we look at corporate tax reform, were the, it was a revenue neutral change. Is that revenue neutral change uh, coming through as we had right. planned? Or are, diff are, that was additional my modif question. are additional modifications necessary? At this point, I don't think uh, your staff or our staff can answer that. Okay. Um, personnel services and cost savings. Over the last several years, the city has recognized hundreds of millions of dollars in PS accruals each year from agencies operating under budget headcount. As the most recent headcount report, the city was operating under budgeted headcount by nearly 6,000 city-funded full-time positions. Although we do see significant headcount savings in the executive plan, can we expect to see more in the adopted plan, and if so, by how much? Um, I, I don't believe – so I'm, I'm not sure of the exact number. Obviously, every time we do a budget, we're making adjustments and we're looking, we're looking at the headcount. So we'll continue to do that. I know on a more longer-term basis, you're asking us to look at the vacancies, and we're obviously going to do that with you, and that's going to take a more extensive period of time. Do you see your um, proposing an additional citywide savings program before we adopt the budget? Uh, there, um, there will not be what we had done in November and January and April. Obviously, once again, the mayor did identify the partial hiring freeze on uh, managers and administration and support staff, and we will come back and say here's what we hope that that will achieve. There will obviously be other savings for the current year that I'm quite sure we'll see reflected in adoption. Okay. Um, wanted to talk about DIFTA and contracting. It has come to, the, to our attention that the commissioner sent out a letter to all contracted providers that the agency plans to improve its contracting and procurement process and that the agency has done an adequate uh, uh, has done an adequate in processing and registering contracts and, and amendments on a timely basis. Yet the council still receives feedback that the contracted providers are still waiting for DIFTA to approve submitted budgets on time. Um, hearing from DIFTA after a council designation um, has cleared mocks. How is hiring for additional staff going to address this issue and is there a need for deeper analysis of DIFTA's contracting services? So we, we actually believe uh, and so I concur with what the commissioner said about the, the process improving dramatically as we move to the summer. Uh, they're working with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, and I think you will see much less complaints and a much faster process. So we do actually believe that they are moving to that. 
I just think that the timing of the letter was a bit confusing for some of these providers that still don't have contracts. So, you know, to get a letter that says we're doing really a lot better and you still haven't gotten your contract, like prove that you've processed actually 100% of your contracts and then send the letter out, Commissioner. Un understood. Thank you. Um, Healing NYC, um, will the administration create a multi-agency program? Uh, uh, what? I, not will. When you created the Healing NYC, and we understand that it's in a response um, to uh, the millions of dollars the city is funding towards initiatives such as Thrive, Healing NYC, New York City Safe, and Behavioral Health Task Force, over the last two fiscal years, the council have, has requested a breakout of funding, headcount, and spending by agency and by initiative. Though the council understands the complexity of multi-agency programs, we remain concerned that the distinction between initiatives and their funding has not been clarified to the public. For example, funding to Nalox, uh, Nalox oh, God, I can never pronounce this. Uh, for the naloxone kits can be found in both Thrive NYC and Healing NYC, the city would maintain hundreds of contracts with substance abuse organizations. Why did the administration create a multi-agency program as Healing NYC rather than combine the work with Thrive NYC? So the focus is, is not exactly the same. Right. I mean, so one is providing clearly mental health. It doesn't mean there aren't times where these two things overlap. And the other, or the other is to deal with the opioid crisis mm -hmm. and, and to focus our attention and direction to both of those issues and to concentrate across agencies on how best to deal with mental health and then how best to deal with the opioid crisis. So that was our goal. It remains our goal. We do think it's the best way to achieve that, the, both goals. Uh, in terms of giving you information about what ha is happening at the NYPD versus what is happening at DOHMH, we'll provide that. Okay, and so. We, that we certainly can do to say, but, but they really do have to be multi-agency and they have to be well coordinated and they do have, once again, while they have overlap, they do have different goals. Right, and, and I understand that. It just seems that there's, a, there's opportunities within Thrive FYC for the same population that we're trying to serve um, because we understand that you need, um, or we're, we're trying to understand that there's a lot of headcount at NYPD for detectives and so on and so forth yes. for the investigative process. And then there was single digit staffing additions at DOHMH, yeah. um, single digit. So it just seems that there's opportunities if, if we're trying to not make this about um, um, just the users, but really having a balanced approach on having the opioid epidemic addressed from the criminal aspect, right, but not criminalizing users. Agreed. Um, when we only have single digit um, uh, headcount in these positions, it doesn't seem to so, so we're happy to go over the program with you and our focus in both areas and, and, uh, and discuss w if, if there are additional programs or additional efforts we should be making. We thought we addressed this in an in, in a interagency way and addressed both of those issues. So like, we need to kind I, of happy, break this uh, we should We should talk more. Right. So obviously we all care about this deeply. We know there's a crisis we're confronting. This was our attempt to address that, that crisis. We think it was a great step to do it. It's our second time to try to put effort in this. But uh, if there are other ways and additional things we should be looking at, we should be talking. And again, I, I just wanted to, like, pub to publicly acknowledge, because we just read this this morning, but the hole in the Bronx has been cleared. And, and it shows enforcement, cleanup, yes, that's important. But we got to believe that those addicts just because they're not in the hole, they might be in other places in New York City. So now we have to figure out how we get the support to them. Um, also, I think it's a, a step in the right direction for the people of the Bronx, for the people of New York City, for the young people that are trying to go to school, that mm -hmm. they can now walk in this area and be safe. So I commend the mayor for that. However, you know, th it's the support in the other agencies now. Where are these, um, these people that are dependent on the opioids going to now in our city? 
So once again, in preventative services and trying to give DOH and MH the resources, but we should talk about that. We're happy to do that. Okay. We obviously have spent a lot of time on this program, and, and we care about it deeply. The mayor cares about it. First lady cares about it. We should of course. Um, the executive budget includes $18.1 million in fiscal 18 um, in the out years to support legal defense for immigrants and the expansion of Action NYC. During Moya's FY18's executive budget hearing, Commissioner Agrawal was not able to clarify just two um, points. And, and so why doesn't HRA's legal service program area break down legal services spending by types of contracts, such as legal services for immigrant or anti-eviction services? Currently, it's all lumped up just as legal services. Okay. I, um, we'll make sure that you get delineation of HRA's legal services and how much goes for, I mean, we clearly have program, programs that are delineated for immigrant legal services and uh, right. anti-eviction legal services. Uh, you've and heard me cite the numbers. Yeah. So we're happy to uh, show you exactly what that separation is. And I appreciate that. I just, you know, I, I don't want it to just be on the staff level that we get clarity. I think it's the right direction. We've been partnering for years now on transparency. I do believe that this should be reflected and very clearly um, it should not be a legal lump sum. So we'll, I'm, we will go back and we'll talk to the commissioner and see what we can do. Okay. Uh, and finally, before we hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Rodriguez, I wanted to talk about payroll employment growth in the city. Um, and has definitely slowed down from its earlier dynamic pace in 2014 and 2015. Year over year employment growth um, came to 131,000 and 125,000 respectively. In 2016, however, job growth decelerated to 86,000 additional positions. And in the first quarter of 2017, year over year, job growth slowed down to 69,000. Indeed, the two most recent months showed small declines in job numbers, the first two months in a row of job declines since 2010. OMB's forecast further slowing in employment growth, reaching only to 35,000 new jobs by 2019. Please discuss the factors that you believe are contributing to the slowdown in employment and which specific city sectors have been weakening the most and why. So since the beginning of the administration, it's over 340,000 new jobs. As you know, job growth in every single borough, something we're extremely proud of. We're at over 4.3 million uh, jobs. Uh, we're at historic high on this, and we're seeing, again, job growth in every borough, not something we would have seen only a few years ago. Um, we, we are recognizing a national trend in our forecast, and that, that's a slowdown in the amount of job growth. Uh, we are, uh, on the positive side, believes that wage growth is going to, uh, is going to accelerate and will increase, and that's a, that's a positive for us. Um, uh, the mayor, as we've seen this, has committed to, uh, to expansion and the creation of additional jobs. And we're going to keep doing everything we can to expand the job market in the city. What you're seeing in our projections are a reflection of national trend. Okay. So are there any sectors that are... Yes. Uh, it's fairly broad-based. I mean, the... the, the uh, the slowdown. Well, we can sit down with your staff and see if we have a, if we, we and we should do that to see if we think different sectors are being right because we've more. seen certain sectors. So we just like to see if yeah, we're we should be, we should in agreement. Down. Okay. Very good, um, Councilmember Rodriguez. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Rosenthal, and then Councilmember Rodriguez. No, go ahead, Helen. Okay. I think you're pretty much. Sure, you're right. Right. Okay. Um, thank you so much. You know, one thing that we heard from the chancellor that I found very confusing when we were talking about school budgets was whether or not uh, the amount going to schools, not for, you know, the special initiatives that this administration has, which is great, but the amount of money for the school budgets from last year to this year is flat. And um, one, the, one of the, and different things pop up, right? 
So one thing that popped up that I was asking her about was books for dual language schools. And her answer was, well, every school has a budget for books. Uh, but what I, she couldn't answer was whether or not at a dual language school, whether or not there was money for books in both languages. So what we hear constantly from our dual language schools is they have enough money for books in English, not enough money for books in the dual, in, the, in Spanish, in French. Um, and uh, I don't understand how we could um, not fund those things, and I don't understand how principals are supposed to get by um, with the same budget that they had last year. We lost in state aid funding 100, or if we were at fair share, we'd be at 175 million more. How, how are we, how are our principals getting by? I think it's 175 million in state aid that is a shortfall that we were expecting and didn't get. So we, uh, yes. We had made a commitment, uh, and this goes back actually to the campaign for fiscal equity, and there is a shortfall of uh, 1.6 billion uh, under the most recent calculation we did, and we had told the state that they had made improvements last year, and with those improvements, we gave more resources through the fair student funding and under this administration and under this council that we've been able to increase the fair student funding allocation, the base, the, the floor amount in all, um, in all renewal schools. Uh, we've gone up to 100% of the F fair student funding. Um, we had said if you give us a certain, if you give us an additional increase in state aid with all the other obligations we have, we would be able to increase that fair student funding level again this year. That did not happen, and that's the shortfall that you're referring to. Right, that, that is the shortfall in state aid. I hear you, and, and there's no schools, doubt the state's, you know, not doing its fair share. That's not the question I'm asking, how do principals um, get by so, when so know, even in the first instance for something as simple as books for a dual language school, they're simply not getting enough money even in their base budget. So we, I, I will go back and ask that very specific question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to go be a straight because of the timing. Dean, is investigating hit and run a priority? for this administration? I, I apologize, I didn't hear the question. So is hit and run, is investigating hit and run a priority for this administration? Yes or no? Oh, of course, yes. Yes, right? Yes. So can we, can you commit for the increasing of the number of officers at the Coalition Investigation Unit? So, so I, I will go back, I'm anticipating your question, that's why I hesitated. I, I, I will go back to the NYPD. We will talk to them and see, and see if we're, we think that they are, they are addressing this issue, if there's concerns about that. Okay. We'll have that and, conversation and, with them. And we've been partners, you know, it's coming yeah, from no, no, knowing agreed, that this, agreed. That's we why the same that's right. right. So, so in, the, in the hearing that we have with DOT, we know that there's 40,000 hit and run last year most of them are related to damage, but 4,000 ended with individuals being sent in critical condition and an average of one person dying, killed by a responsible driver who left the scene. And what we have seen, what we have shared with DOT, Chief Shannon's daughter, and we have bring to their attention is that we need to see, we need to see the increase of the funding for the collision investigation unit so that we can have more women and men power to investigate. We'll, we'll, we'll look, we'll talk, right. to, the, we'll talk right. to the NYPD about that. So my second thing is on the city bike. I know be getting into the, getting the answer uh, because of the timing. I hope that uh, the administration continue conversation with motivated 
I hope that before we do the handshake, uh, to see an agreement where motivated should be able to continue running a city bike, to expand city bike. City bikes should not be only popular among upper class and middle class. City bikes are very important to connect New Yorkers who live in transportation desert area. Okay. And it's only a suggestion to see okay. how we can see progress in that direction. Question now, with the question that I asked you before about the percentage of New Yorkers living on the poverty line, what I was searching is that in 2016, the mayor said, based on your own information, yeah. that in 16, he said that 45.1 percent of New Yorkers were living on the on poverty, the poverty line in 2014, and that number went down to 44.1 in 2015. Yeah. So we saw a one percent reduction. That you know, it looks as a slow number, but we know it's tough to change numbers. Correct. However, in the same it, it announcement, the mayor say that the analysis by the mayor's office stated that by the end of 2017, there was a, a plan or the projection to see 281,000 New Yorkers coming out from the poverty line by the end of this year. Do you anticipate that number to happen or you see that number to uh, the no, I mean, they, we'll I, number. I, I, we'll, we'll come back with the exact numbers, but I do know that we, we did announce that we were on track to meet our goals that were outlined in the One New York report, so we'll come back to you. Okay. And my suggestion in that direction, and I'm very proud to be a partner with this mayor, is to see an increase of the millions of dollars that we provide through EDC to the private sector that create jobs, that I think was around $300 million. Mm -hmm. I think it is time, and I know that the mayor is taking those initiatives, to bring those dollars to the out of borough areas. You know, we have to increase the incentive for those members of the private sector that are creating jobs in those areas where people have to be traveling an hour and a half to go to work. So can we expect an increase of the incentive for private sector who create jobs in the out of our areas? So I, the, as you know, we have been very focused on economic activity in the outer boroughs. We'll continue to do that. I'm happy to have conversations. We, we can have conversations with you, with EDC specifically, if there are particular points you, you're interested in that you think we're not addressing at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, so we, we talked about the upcoming uh, labor negotiations, and obviously, um, if, if, if I'm correct, the, the city's largest municipal union is contract is expiring within a few months. Uh, we are within yes. the period that we have. Yes. Uh, okay, I've been so, so so we're obviously now within that 120-day period, which is within the tail law that allows That's us correct. to begin to ne to negotiate. And I would hope that we have begin to have that conversation. But I know in the past that we've talked about, and it was in uh, some of the side letters uh, around um, insourcing. And we talked about some of the efficiencies and savings that was achieved there. Correct. Is that something that we are looking to expand because of the success of that program to other agencies? And if so, where are we with doing that outside of, um, and if so, um, outside of local law, what kind of oversight? Because I, I understand that part of that is a culture as well, and agencies, have, they, they kind of do what they do. Um, what are we doing to enforce and ensure that, that we're creating this opportunity and actually achieving savings? Right. We are achieving savings. We are working with the agencies. It's one of the initiatives that we think is very important as part of citywide savings, whether it's an actual uh, uh, savings that we can quantify or it's something that we can say will be a, uh, a, and a cost avoidance into the future. It's one the mayor is committed to, we're committed to. And, and we will continue to work with a, with all the agencies to maximize that effort. That, that is great to hear because we do have a great municipal workforce. We want to make sure that Agreed. we are using them to the best of their ability. Um, on that, I think it was in March we actually did a hearing with, uh, the, with the law department 
around uh, workers' compensations and how those uh, benefits get delivered and so forth. Last week um, in, in the state budget, there was a 4.5% decrease in, in the benefit, which, which is roughly about a $15 million savings for the city. Um, there is certainly uh, opinions on both sides as to whether or not those serv uh, the benefits and services are being delivered uh, efficiently and whether or not workers are, are receiving benefits, and particularly medical benefits, in a timely fashion. Um, will we be using some of these, these right. so um, additional funding to ensure that we're kind of shoring up some of the areas that we were deficient in delivering those services in terms of um, whether or not people were, um, wh whether or not the benefit, whether it was the, the, the financial compensation or them being able to see a, a healthcare practitioner in a timely fashion. Have we been addressing those through, you know, have we done an audit to be more efficient around that area? What savings can we achieve outside of that and ensuring that I think the biggest savings that we can achieve is making sure that people receive benefits, they receive the proper health care, and they get back to work as soon as possible. Um, I think that w one of the things that the, um, the hearing showed us that people are often out an inordinate amount of time for very minor injuries because of the process of getting people um, in and out of the system. How do we become better and achieve savings through that as aside from the uh, savings from the 4.5% from the state, which I think is utterly ridiculous. That we, we, we are just number 17 in the country, um, considering the cost of living here, and it took us years of battling to get to number 17, and to reduce it another 4.5% is an absolute travesty. So I hope the city can do something to make that, that, that process uh, more efficient and, and work better for the workers that through no fault of their own are injured and, and now suffering. So we agree with your goals. We are working with the law department. We have started the uh, conversation with them on workers' comp and the cost and uh, what things we can do. And those you articulated, those are those are the correct goals. Um, and you know we're, we should be working with you and get your thoughts and ideas. But we have started a conversation with law on this very issue. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Perez Copeland. Wanted to, uh, Medgar Evers is in my district, in the 35th district, and wanted to talk about CUNY. Um, CUNY has submitted a new needs request of $4 million to revamp its remedial course programming in fiscal 2018, which was not funded in the executive budget. Given that nearly 80% of students entering CUNY's community colleges require at least some remediation before moving forward with their degrees, and that only 50% of those students are able to complete their remedial coursework within one year. Why wouldn't the administration support improving that current model? I, I think through, I mean, we have with you made the largest increase in addressing community college students' needs through the ASAP program, which is going to be a commitment of over $100 million that we have, that we have made together to CUNY. So I think we have been addressing this very issue. We care deeply about this very issue. I'm happy to, I mean, you know, we'll have a conversation about other ideas. We can enhance the program that we have, uh, that we have decided to basically take on, which as a city program. But can you tell me specifically how that will, uh, the investment, which is incredible and certainly unprecedented, but how will that also address the remedial needs that we're discussing? Well, it does provide academic support. So I think we need to, I, what, we, what we should do is look at what we believe we are providing as academic support to the student. And, and if there's something that we're not providing, we should talk about that. But our goal was to provide this kind of academic support. Because we want to make sure that that particular allocation or, or the ability to put that kind of impact and investment in CUNY is also felt to shore up students before they even begin the degree program. I agreed. 
Uh, second question is with the Summer Youth Employment Program. The council and administration have worked together over the past three years, and I'm very proud of that, that to double the size of the Summer Youth Employment Program, but we still have not sufficiently met the need and the level of need for youth jobs. What are the administration's plans for expansion beyond the current 65,000 jobs? So we've almost doubled in a very short period of time. That yes, we have. And a very significant increase. Uh, last year, there was the task force, the joint task force that just recently came out uh, right before the executive budget um, with proposals, and I know we're all reviewing those proposals. Uh, there are two things here. One is how much capacity is there actually, are we actually able to do, for example, this summer? And then how would, if we, if uh, we agree on moving forward. How do we move forward? What uh, what should the focus be? And should there be a uh, how how do we delineate how we move forward to meet the highest needs uh, of 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 that age group? And so I think there are still questions for us to work out. The goal in the increase was, of course, to increase it over the course of every fiscal year. Um, with the goal of reaching approximately over 100,000 in summer youth employment jobs because we recognize that's a, at, at current times, that's the approximately the amount of young people that are applying. I believe it's actually 120,000. So the goal was to double it. We've done that. And just want to understand, are we on track to reach that goal of providing a summer youth employment opportunity for every child that applies throughout the city of New York? So no, we have not. Uh, we have not put in the financial plan, and certainly for the upcoming year, it's sixty-five thousand. Uh, so we have not moved forward on that objective. We have obviously almost doubled the program. We've made a commitment. There was the task force that talked about. Uh, changes that should be occurring, pilot programs, other things that should be happening to the program. And I know we're in conversations about what does the next step of expansion look like. Just one of, this is such an important uh, particular program for the City of New York, for the City Council. We want to make sure that we continue to be on track and that we don't get stuck at the 65,000 and draw our line of victory there. This was a progression that we want to see every year. Um, and as a city council member that has so many young people that are in need of summer youth employment, I want to make sure that we are on track and progress to meeting the original goal of the summer youth employment program expansion. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And now we're going to give Helen, uh, council member Rosenthal 30 seconds. Go. Go. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we ended on the right note with the human service contracts really appreciate all the work the de Blasio administration is doing. I'm going to be issuing a, a statement basically saying that this afternoon, and I just wanted to be on record that, Thank you. Um, you know, you guys are bringing us out of the hole. And then I want to give you one second to brag, because everyone always says that we're this liberal, you know, progressive uh, administration, and if we're such, we, we don't know what we're doing with budget. Could you please let the city know how we're doing with the rating agencies? Oh, we're doing extremely well with the rating agencies. We get, uh, we get, we get very positive uh, reports on every time we are in the marketplace. We were just in the marketplace. Um, so we, we continue to get very positive, uh, stable ratings and very positive reports. And Moody's did an actual report only a few months ago, which is actually very interesting, which they looked at the strength of the New York City economy and the New York City budget process, and uh, it was worth reading. It went into a great deal of detail, and, and not only, and really all of the rating agencies, they not only talk about the strength and diversity of our city, but they also talk about the sound fiscal management and the budget management and the institutional management of this city. So liberals can be fiscally responsible. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to briefly bring up uh, EFAP, as you had mentioned, um, and has been spoke. Actually, I think the mayor also um, brought this up. But Trump's federal budget proposed cutting funding for SNAP by 200 billion. Um, the mayor said we have 1.7 million New Yorkers who rely on food stamps. About half a million um, of them are children. So again, this is why the President Trump is going to find himself 
in a lot of trouble, in, is what our mayor said. Given this proposed cut to SNAP, the city's emergency food pantry system will be vital now more than ever in combating hunger in our city. You are well aware of the council has been pushing the administration and we have all agreed, and that doesn't happen often in this body. Um, we're all urging and asking and want to continue to keep this on the, one, the priority list of the EFAP food procurement for baselining of this budget item at $22 million. So look, the mayor made this clear that uh, we would work with you to come as we did last year to what the need was and fund the need. And we'll do that. Okay. Um, I know that there was a little bit of a discrepancy with need, so we're going to be following. So we, but we need, that's part, we do need to come to a conclusion on what, on what is that appropriate level. Um, so Vision Zero, as you know, the city's expense spending for Vision Zero is across multiple agencies. Can you give us the breakdown of the Vision Zero expense funding and headcount by agency for fiscals 2017 and 18? I know you might not have that with you right now, um, but we really want a comprehensive understanding. Yes, we can do on that. The I don't have it with me, but we can do that. Okay. Um, and just as a follow-up to Council Member Cumbo's question, uh, when it comes to SYP, I've asked nearly every commissioner that came before us whether they had some youth employment at their agency, and I think that was a call that the mayor asked um, commissioners to take on young people. One of the things that consistently comes up when we have conversations um, with the administration is that there is a capacity issue. I think we have a gem of an opportunity within city agencies to be able to give our young people an opportunity to work. Um, some agencies came and said they had none. Other agencies didn't even know what the program was. Other agencies had one or two. And I gotta admit that the agency that was doing the best was the NYPD, where they had you know, almost 200 young people working at, out of local precincts. We have to not only expect that young people, many young people do wanna work at summer camp, every young person does not want to work at a summer camp. I think it would be incredible that you partner a young person with an architect at DDC or you know, a gardener at parks or just these, we have these job opportunities and I don't think we're taking advantage of the capacity that we can build um, to place young people. Okay, I, fair, fair challenge and uh, we'll get uh, up to speed on those responses you received and see what we can do. Great, um, and in one of our uh, budget response, this was the second pair of boots for uh, firefighters. I brought this up to the... I apologize, I'm sorry. It's okay, do you wanna add anything or no? No. Okay, um, a second pair of uh, uh, boots for firefighters, we asked the commissioner he was in agreement of the need of firefighter boots. I believe it's a $4 million request, um, and it was in our budget response. Was there a, a, a reason why it wasn't included? Um, So once again, what was in the executive budget, and I've said this on many times, there were many needs put forward. It is a balance of, uh, of what we thought at the time was appropriate to put forward. We're, we're in conversations with you to make sure that, uh, that uh, our priorities are aligned. Right, well we just wanna make sure that equipment is something very important, especially for the men and women in the fire department um, that are saving lives um, every day. And I think if they're saying this is an issue, then we should be able to provide equipment. So as, 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 as you know, we've been, and we've done this together, we have done many safety equipment improvements. Right, so this one just NYPD makes sense. And the FDM. This one just makes sense, because we've done them so often. So I think this is just one that we can, you know, agree on. But we will continue, adoption is a couple of weeks away, so I'm sure we'll continue to engage. Um, we have additional questions that we're gonna get back to Good, you. thank you. Um, um, and then we'll share with you also the list of follow-ups that we have from this hearing. I wanna thank you. Um, it's our fourth budget, and I'm looking forward to a, a great handshake and adoption at the end of all of this. 
Um, and we will now call this part of the um, – this concludes the first part of today's budget hearing. I want to thank Director Foulihan for testifying. As a reminder, the public portion of today – As a reminder, of to, uh, the public portion of today's hearing will begin at 1 p.m. Um, in this room. So please be sure to fill out your witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms. Again, thank you very much, Mr. Foulihan, Director Foulihan. And we will take a five-minute break before we hear from the Comptroller. Thank you.
We will now continue the final day of budget hearings with testimony from New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer. Um, welcome, Comptroller, and thank you for joining us today. In the interest of time, and I know that we're going to have public um, joining us um, shortly, and we want to kind of stay to the, stick to the schedule, I will forego an opening statement, and the Comptroller can begin his testimony after my counsel swears him in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dennis, thanks for staying. Well, well good afternoon, and I want to thank you, Chair Ferraris Copeland, and Idanis Rodriguez of the Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify on the Mayor's FY 2018 Executive Budget. Joining me today is my Deputy Controller for Budget, Preston Niblack, and I'm happy to share that today the city's economic outlook remains strong, and that's good news for New York. We've hit the lowest unemployment rate since the government began recording it in 1976. Now it's at 4.1%. And labor force participation is up to 61.3%, also the highest on record. Wages are also finally starting to grow. But as the national economy reaches its full employment level, here in New York, we should prepare for growth to taper off. As of now, our forecast reflects that expectation, as well as a slowdown in job creation. But we are not uh, forecasting a recession. But the situation in Washington under the Trump administration is so uncertain that the risk to the U.S. economy is higher than ever. Today, my office released an analysis of President Trump's proposed federal budget that found New York City could lose $850 million in critical funding for social services, education, and housing in our city budget. New York would lose 35% of our funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, which covers health care for 128,000 city kids. And funding for the arts and humanities with impacts, museums, and education services in all our communities would be completely eliminated. This president is trying to shred our social safety net from outright elimination of programs like community development block grants and the home energy assistance programs to cuts to workforce training and public housing. On top of that, the Trump administration is proposing even deeper cuts to Medicaid funding that will add a major burden to our state and city budgets and strain our health and hospital system maybe to the breaking point. Now we have to anticipate the impact of these significant cuts and be prepared with a sound and responsible city budget. Altogether adjusted for prepayments and reserves, the FY 2018 budget is an increase of $1.5 billion over FY 2017 or 1.7% more spending. The surplus this year looks like it will equal or exceed last year's surplus of $4 billion, which is good news. And as the mayor has mentioned, reserves are high by historical standards. Nonetheless, I remain concerned that we are not adequately prepared for a potentially rocky road. The fact is our revenue growth is slowing. Last year's $4 billion surplus resulted from stronger than projected tax revenue growth of $1.4 billion. But this year, tax revenues have come in above projections by just $200 million, and non-recurring resources make up 60% of this year's surplus. Agency efficiencies still make up, still make up only 7% of the combined FY 2017 and 2018 citywide savings plan. And as I've said, it's just not enough. New spending priorities are going to require more saving to ensure success and longevity. So we have to start saving sooner rather than later. Now you've heard about the mayor's initiatives and today I want to present just a few of my priorities for improving lives of everyday New Yorkers. First, I hope we can support our immigrant population at the local level by reducing the cost burden of citizenship applications. Right now, there are 670,000 New Yorkers who are eligible to apply for citizenship, but many are prohibited by high cost. Since 1989, the application fee has grown up to 500%, closing 
climbing to $725 per application. That's why I've called on the city to create a citizenship fund, a public-private partnership that would pay for applications and help more New Yorkers become citizens. By offsetting the cost of applications, we believe we could ease the path to citizenship for some 35,000 New Yorkers. Second, we have to support our nonprofit social service providers. While President Trump comes after, while President Trump comes after our safety net, we will only become more reliant on our nonprofit social service providers. We must ensure they receive the resources they need to continue providing high-quality services to our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Recently, we analyzed contract budgets of more than 75 nonprofits across a range of agency programs, including the DYCD, uh, Beacon After School Program, DIFTA Case Management, ACS Preventative Services, DHS Tier 2 Shelters, uh, DOH, MH, and HRA Supportive Housing Programs. What we found was an utter lack of consistency in overhead rates across the contracts. And of the 105 contracts we looked at, only 10 had an indirect cost rate of over 10 percent. At the end of the day, much of the burden of Trump's budget will fall on our nonprofits, and we have to ensure that they are financially strong enough to continue serving New Yorkers. One way we can do this is by fixing this glaring contracting problem. I join you in urging the administration to undertake a thorough review of human service contracting practices and enact a consistent, and let me say this again, a consistent fair methodology for funding that will support our nonprofit social service sector and its mission. And lastly, I just want to talk about another glaring problem that needs our attention and I think has some real consequences for the long-term fiscal health of the city, and that's the procurement at the Department of Education. Time and time again, my office finds that current departmental processes are inadequate. The facts are straightforward. Whether it's through an audit of DOE or a review of DOE's contracts, we find a lack of transparency and a lack of detail that is frightening when you're talking about billions of dollars earmarked for our children. We found that there's inadequate oversight and documentation of project and contract spending, a failure to ensure that payments for goods and services are appropriate and for work properly done, a lack of transparency in the bidding process, use of limited or non-competitive procurement processes, and an inability to account for unspent funds. The DOE claims to have a system of checks and balances, but if you dig into the details, you will find a lack of independent review, a lack of accountability, and a whole lot of rubber stamps. It's time for a paradigm shift. There is no reason that an agency representing nearly 30% of the entire city budget with a contract budget of $6.7 billion should not be subject to the same level of scrutiny as all other city agencies. Now, don't get me wrong. Nobody is more for mayoral control than me. I believe we should have mayoral control not every year for renewal, but years and years. But that passion for control must be met with the highest expectations of transparency and accountability. So today, I'm asking for your help, for the City Council to call hearings to get to the bottom of this because our kids deserve a school system that functions at the absolute highest level of performance. So I ask you for that help. I will back you up. I will come and testify. But we cannot have a system where there is no more transparency. And with that said, I look forward to working with you, Madam Chair, because you have been about transparency, and the work of this Finance Committee, I believe, contributes to the long-term long health of the city and I'm very happy to be here. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Comptroller, for your statement. Very informative. I think you make incredible suggestions and, and definitely will be following up. Um, the DOE's budget is, you know, and your findings are clearly are, are alarming to us. And Thank you know you. my passion um, uh, specifically on transparency and getting and right-sizing budgets. Do you have any um, recommendations as to where we should start? Because the budget, as you said, is 30 percent over there. Um, is there a specific focus that you think we should take first? Yes. So, 
so just in just short this quick quick hits on on what I think are the central issues the DOE is presenting contracts to the PEP retroactively so there's no oversight they only outline or give minimal information to the PEP for review there has been total in the inadequate oversight and documentation of spending they don't use competitive procurement methods when it should there's a lack of evaluation criteria in RFPs and awards there's no public database on performance evaluations as in Vendex and for those who were around city government for a long time remembers scandals past and why we have Vendex doesn't require completed Vendex before submitting contracts so they can ignore negative information you follow so there's no transparency there's no way to have a checks and balance we need state legislation to make DOE subject to city's procurement rules we've been trying to work with DOE to align their procurement with city's PPB rules submit more contracts to Mox and the law department for review we're trying I think the council should, de should delve into this through hearings and we're happy to help with that effort with our experience in contracting and audit we also and I think this is an extreme measure, but I am totally uh, clear in considering proposing this. Perhaps we need an independent monitor for DOE's division of contracts and pur purchasing. I don't particularly have an agenda. It could be a state uh, monitor. It could be a DOI monitor. But I'm asking you, I feel so serious about this. We do need an outside monitor on this co these contracting. We also should amend state education law to bring DOE under the same procurement framework as mayoral agencies. And again, this is not to get into the weeds on education or classroom instruction. This is not about that. This is about the monitoring of finance in an agency that spends 30% of our tax dollars. Thank you. And we'll be following up with you on, on this suggestion. Thank um, the other one that, and I, I just wanted to have clarity, my, my background, my volunteer work in my community was citizenship campaigns. And I remember when the application was $90. Um, and because it was $90, we would get, on any given Saturday, we would get between 150 to 200 people to come out and apply. And as you stated, now it's even more of a challenge for families when you have to decide between paying your rent or um, having the ability to put food on the table or become a citizen to help others that are in your family to also get status. Because it's not just the status of that one person, but it's the opportunity that status gives you um, to help your family members also um, receive residence, permanent residency or citizenship themselves through your children. Um, so I just wanted to understand, at a, and I just did this really quickly, at $725 per application and 35,000 New Yorkers, that would be a program at about $26.3 million. Do you think that if we were able to do something where it covered half of the cost or helped assisted or subsidized some portion of it, um, would, would that work as well? So you and I are really on this, are thinking the exact same way. So, uh, you know, w when we studied this, we found that when there would be an announcement that the application fees were going up, you would see a surge in people trying to get their application in. And then we saw a drop in citizen applications. So there is a correlation between rising costs and, and, and people stepping forward for applications. In, and also, as you know, it's not just sometimes the application cost. There may be English classes involved. You may have some legal issues uh, to talk about multiple family members. So this is critical when you think about the pool of 670,000 people who could avail themselves of this. But in answer to your budget question, we did the same you know, uh, analysis you, you did. It took us much longer. You did it in five <laughs> minutes. That's why you're the finance chair. Uh, but we also looked at $20 million. But here's where I think we would have success. I think a small down payment, maybe working with the mayor's office, creating a for uh, you know a not-for-profit entity, I think the raise the potential ability to raise money uh, to defer costs would actually not require a 20 million spend. I think this could be seeded 
at an appropriate level. I leave that to your discretion in the mayor's office. But in light of what's going on nationally, given the fact that we have ready, ready to go citizens, all they need is just some help, and that help in the form of defraying some of this cost, I think we can help tens of thousands of people. And actually, even though we put out the $20 million number, I personally believe, based on my conversations with people who feel so passionately about that, the advocates, the corporations that we could perhaps, you know, making sure everything is legal and above board and transparent, uh, I think we could actually make this a national model for citizenship because everyone struggles with this in all, all the cities. And uh, when you say national model, as, as you know, I'm on the board, I'm the vice president of uh, the National Association of That's Latino right. Elected Officials, and a lot of the work that we do there is also citizenship um, campaigns. Um, but there are other cities, um, not necessarily cities, but other nonprofits that have actually done like um, a loan program, a low interest to mm -hmm. no interest loan program. So it actually helps others as opposed to just doing, you know, having to fund this every year. There's also the potential of a loan program. What is your opinion on that? You know, I, I, just, I just wonder that when the group that we're trying to target is 150, 150 to 300% of, of February poverty. So we're looking at a cap of 61,000. And when you do the different calculations, rent, food, a family, and that would be for a family of three, it's probably hard to pay back the loan, right? I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't be done. Right. But a direct subsidy, I actually think there's, there's enough support for that, given the climate. And also, I think when you do the, the numbers, we'll end up getting this back 10 times over right. as a city. So obviously, you know, you have a broader national breadth of what's going on, and, and, and you know what other cities are doing. Um, I do think that people are looking to New York City to lead on this issue. And if we can come up with a program, um, you and I have been to a lot of rallies and a lot of meetings on immigration and sanctuary city, but I think something tangible that says, look, let, let's, w it's all about a path to citizenship. Here's the mechanism to do it could be very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, and I can see this even within the citizenship now, which is an established, yes, putable entity that we've been working with for years. Yes. Okay. Um, wanted to talk about debt service. Mm -hmm. Great transition, right? Um, <laughs> As you note in your analysis in the executive budget, the financial plan projects that the percentage of local tax revenues consumed by debt service will grow from 11.5% in FY17 to 13.1% by FY2021. This is a result of the city's debt service growing at a faster rate than the tax revenues. Um, why are the costs rising and how concerned are you about rising debt costs in the city's budget? We've, I think there's a, there's, we're probably being very conservative on the high debt costs. We don't think it will end up there, but we would certainly monitor it for you as well. Okay. And do you consider the rate of growth in debt service costs sustainable? And at what point should we start worrying? I know that you're going to be moderate, monitoring it, but at what point? Should we say, okay, this is a flag now? Do you think? If, you, if, if we thought we were getting to 14 percent, then that would be the red flag that we would use. Okay, I think we're in agreement with you here on this side. We usually are. <laughs> um, wanted to talk about Trump. Your office conducted an analysis of the tax reform package proposed. Um, by the Trump administration and the impact it would have on New York City taxpayers. Uh, you said that your office is committed to continuing to run numbers on President Trump's proposals and follow them closely. We know it is early, but what can you tell us about the budget proposal released by the administration this week, and how does it tie into the tax reform proposals you analyzed in April? So we're not trying to be we're not trying to be alarmist, and a lot of the potential cuts, the $850 million is exactly what it is, a potential cut. And the reason we're crunching these numbers is because 
let's face it, in the years that we've been doing this work, we have n we've really thought about the federal budget sort of as, as an asterisk or an afterthought, right? We, we've, we're more, much more focused on what the state would do, how that would inform the city budget, and we believe very strongly that if just some of uh, what's coming from, from Washington hits us in the wrong way on health, on ha public housing, um, we think that this could be a very, this could be a real potential budget issue for the city. Uh, the state local tax deductibility is a big concern, uh, make it even harder for New York to pick up the federal cuts. So you put it all together, again, we're not being alarmist, I'm not here today to say we're in doomsday, but look, part of why we've been successful as a city is we navigate what comes our way and we're forward thinking about it. That's why we talk a lot about reserves. That's why we talk a lot about, you know, a strategic plan to deal with Washington and the state. But we also know that sometimes we get hit very hard, both by the state and the federal government. Right. This is our moment to be very strategic and cautious on these issues. So what I'm gonna do, and I've asked, you know, Preston and, and folks in my office, we are taking a very hard look uh, at the, the proposed budget, what could be a budget. We're monitoring what's happening in Congress because I want to give you as much information I can as the city's chief fiscal watchdog to make sure that you have all the information you need to act accordingly. And if you have questions or council members want to sit with us, we can share the information that we have. We're not proprietary about it. Uh, we want people to understand it and we want to work with you to figure out uh, where we have to save, where we have to invest, and what kind of strategy we have going to Washington. And one of my questions you actually answered in your opening statement, and that was independent of what's happening in the federal government, what are, other, what are areas that we should be watching, not necessarily for risk, but for potential, uh, imp let's say, improvements? And an example of that was the DOE. Do you see any other examples um, that the council should be you know, we, we have, you know, in a way we have a similar role, right? We are, we are, you know, we manage the pension fund, but we also do audits. You pass legislation, but you also do oversight hearings. And I think the more that we do the kind of oversight work, uh, that's how we create balance and transparency. And I think uh, whether it's capital budget transparency or the things that we're working on, we will share with you uh, because I think we get a better, you know, I think we get better performance when we're looking. I am concerned, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but uh, I am concerned about DOE. I'm prepared to go in uh, and take a deeper dive there, but, you know, I also am mindful about how much power we, we really have, and that's why I come to you today to just work with us uh, to maybe change it a little bit. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to say every commissioner that has come before me and the OMB director, um, we've been questioning about yeah. capital spending. We've been questioning about the procurement process. All of this has come up. Um, so I just want to ask if we can engage in a conversation on this process because you are a part of um, so – I'm going to say some of the challenges that comes up with some nonprofits where, you know, it's at the controller's office, it's at the MOC's office, it hasn't at the council, it's going to the mayor, it's going back to the agency. And it would be great to hear ways, one, that we can improve things or how things need to get to you so that they can come out of your, your office expeditiously um, and, and ways that we can do that better. I am, you, you tell me when and where, I'm there. Great. Uh, I'll bring our deputy controller uh, for contracts, Lisa Flores. Uh, I can tell you that I am uh, very proud of the way in which we are registering our contracts. Uh, they are held up at the agencies. There's no secret about that. But again, this is not, you know, he said, she said, or, you know, he said, he said, she said, she said. This is about uh, us resolving problems, and I'm happy to come and do this because the stakes are very high. Thank you. Um, we will hear from Councilmember Rodriguez, followed by Councilmember Matteo. Thank you, Chair. Controller, thank you for your service to the city. Thank uh, you for listening to my presentation. I, uh, 
I have um, my first question, two questions. The first one is on October 15, 2015, when the five New York City retirement system announced that they will invest $150 million in pension in the AFL-CIO housing investment trust, you, you say, quote, that, uh, that economically, as I say, you as a, in the role that you have as a trustee, as an investment advisor, you stated that uh, how crucial, important was to use those tools, investing in housing economic developments. Uh, we know that as a city, we say that, that the 32,300 jobs that the private sector added in the city during the quarter 2017, uh, half of them, they were gonna be low wage industry uh, uh, jobs. So when you look at the investment that those five pension retirement are doing, uh, at the local level, uh, what, are, what, are, what industry do you see as good candidates to create large numbers of good paying jobs that will employ city residents? So I'm not sure the, the question, is it? First one, you did the investment. Well, we've, five we've always invested uh, in a, the very successful housing trust fund, which is union built affordable housing and we continue to add, I think we're up to $850 million in total investment. Maybe we're approaching close to a billion. We get a good rate of return and it's been very successful. Okay, so let, let me break the question into one on the housing and the other one with the economic piece. When it comes to the housing, like as this was a, like a very specific sector that the $150 million was invested in October 2015, which are the other sectors that the five pension retirement system that you also advise are prioritizing uh, as group that they are investing on building affordable housing in our city. Well, we that is our that is where our economically targeted investment money goes into that fund. We have a we have other funds that we invest, but broadly, uh, putting my fiduciary hat on, the way we invest is first and foremost as a fiduciary to get a rate of return uh, that hits 7% that allows us to uh, you know, pay the retirement security of our retirees. So that is how the Bureau of Asset Management goes to work every day thinking through that. And every year I come to this council hearing and the chair of the finance committee before I leave always says, how are those pensions doing what is the rate today? She hasn't asked me yet, um, but as, if I may, because you're gonna get there eventually. Um, you know, last year we, we had a rate of 1.5%. Julissa wasn't happy with that. This year so far, and remember we have a different time clock uh, than controller uh, DiNapoli, but so far, uh, year to date, not knowing what's going to happen in June, where it a return of 8.8 percent. So, of the three years I've been controller, we will be over the 7 percent actuarial target. So, can we then expect to see? Because I think that this particular 150 million dollars to the AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust was part of the, their initiative to invest more than a billion dollars to build affordable housing for yes. neighbors, right? And one challenge that we face as a city is sometimes that when we build affordable, on, when we build housing, and we go, let's say, through rezoning, unless there's some programs that also come to incentivize a funding for affordable housing, then we will, we will be limiting on how hard can we go on affordable. So can we, can we expect to see more investments, such as the $150 million that those five pension retirement already did in 2015? Well, I have an idea. I think you have to change the way you look at how to build housing in this city. Right now, the housing tool that's being used is to incentivize for-profit developers uh, to build housing, and they build tall buildings, whether it's your district or around the city, and in exchange for that heightened density, 
they commit to building a certain percentage of affordable housing units. I've done some of the numbers on those units, and very often they're not affordable housing units for the people who live in the community where the luxury development is going up. So that has to change if we're really going to build true affordable housing. And that is what's happening around the city with the zoning plan. You've taken action in the council to support the zoning. I don't have a problem with it, but it's not enough to deal with the crisis that we face. So here's my suggestion, and then I'd be happy to talk about other investments with your ideas. We need to look at the 1,150 vacant properties I've identified in my audits, city-owned property. Some of it's been vacant for up to 30 years. I'm not suggesting every one of those parcels could be used for affordable housing. Some could be community gardens. Some could perhaps be daycare centers or other uses. But that land, the people's land, that's the land that we should identify to build affordable housing. But maybe we should also ask not-for-profits and others to participate in the building of that, of, of that housing. Right now, we should be setting up a land bank land trust. There's a bill in the city council that would create a land trust. We could look at delinquent property. We could look at vacant property. I've been talking about this now for two years. Pass the bill, get Eric Schneiderman to seed the land bank, and then we could actually build real housing that meets the needs of people who are living in homeless shelters who work and other people who cry out for affordable housing, but real low-income housing. And then I'm happy to have a conversation as a fiduciary Right? I had this conversation once with the administration a few years ago. Obviously, we're open to assisting where uh, that would benefit the retirees because it's not my money or your money, it's their money. Right. So my other question, my other, the other part of the question is related to the economic development piece. As you know, you moved to the west side, but you are from northern Manhattan, from Inwood. And as someone that knows our community, you know, the target is at 225th. You know, today uh, it represents the second share in the nation per square feet. Say it again? The target at 223 yeah, in Broadway uh -huh. is doing, is a second sale per square feet in the nation. And I'm pretty sure that when that investment took place, not many people thought about the importance of investing in the out of borough areas. So how can we also incentivize investors and partner of the retirement fund to say, guy, we want you to look at the out of borough area because I think that a lot of investment has been done in the Midtown area, now in Brooklyn, now in the Long Island City. And we have this great opportunity now to incentivize investment to think about all the area that have been left out for decades in our city. So how can we expect to see, you know, you using your influence as advisory? to work with the private sector for them to look at the possibility to invest. Well, let, me, let me just repeat one thing, because sometimes people don't realize, w you know, the pension fund is not the city budget, right? So we are guided by certain um, fiduciary, a, a, a very high fiduciary standard, meaning we can invest in something that we all like, but we have to have a rate of return. And you and others are welcome to bring to, well, actually, you, you, qualified people are welcome to come to the office, investors and others who are not placement agents or people like that, uh, can come to our office and make proposals. But we are, we're not the, you know, some, sometimes people get confused. We're, we're not the city budget. You know, we do have an economically targeted investment program, but that also gets a rate of return to grow the pension fund. That's, that 2% is factored in for good projects. But I would happy to sit down with you to talk about some of your great experiences in Washington Heights, especially as it relates to growing communities around the city. And I'd be happy to work with you, Adonis, on that. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge, Councilmember, you got like 10 minutes on that question because our <laughs> clock wasn't on. I, so. <laughs> I know you didn't say it. You didn't say a word. <laughs> it's the old neighborhood, Julie. <laughs> uh, Minority Leader Matteo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Charles Stringer, uh, I want to follow up on a, an issue I brought uh, to your office's attention um, last month about uh, the city's tree and sidewalk program. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but 
um, the contract for the Staten Island uh, portion of the program uh, was defaulted. And I'm working with Parks on, on the, the bigger issue of the contract. But um, when it comes to someone who's into the tree and sidewalk program and they receive a rating from the Parks Department, usually over 72, that they will get repaired. Um, now with a delay in the, in, with the contract, um, the point is we're trying to get homeowners to do it themselves because they want to be responsible to right. fix the sidewalk to make the sidewalk safe. And the question that I pose to you is, is your office willing to reimburse for the city portion uh, of the sidewalk that's damaged from the tree if you're doing that already? And if not, are you willing to do so so more homeowners can start repairing these sidewalks themselves, getting them off the list, saving the city time and money, and getting through the program so then when the, we get this contract back, you know, there could be, you know, maybe even a handful, even more homeowners who are willing to do it themselves and ask for the reimbursement. And I'm just trying to get a clear- As opposed to doing it which way? That the city comes in, repairs right. it themselves. So that the homeowner would do it submit the bill and then parks would approve that the homeowner actually did actually did it and the city the, <coughs> you know sometimes it's not the whole sidewalk it's mm -hmm. just a few of the flags parks would sign off and say they have repaired it um, we don't have to come and do it and then we would ask for the reimbursement from your we, office. Let, let me let me talk to you let me talk to you about it It sounds like a very interesting idea let me talk to our general counsel's office and um, the uh, the, the people who uh, do our settlements, and let, let me see where we're at with that. I appreciate okay. that because I think if we can, no, and you have we can move this program along. We can really make a, a difference in getting some of these sidewalks repaired in a much. Uh, no, and I want to thank you. Did contact our office. We are taking a look at. It. I thought it was an interesting idea. Let right. me see what we can do. Thank you. Yes. You have uh, one, 30 seconds. Fair, fair. fair. Uh, what is your assessment on how fair, fair? will have a positive impact for the economic or especially working class uh, New Yorkers and therefore an uh, impact to the, whole, to the whole city. Look, I, I, I want to I commend your leadership on this issue as transportation chair, you and uh, the Riders Alliance and Community Service Society have done a great job in raising the issue of uh, a, a, you know, a half fare for working people who are struggling to make it so that they can get to school, get to a job. Again, this is something I support. I know you're negotiating uh, the budget. You know, I don't think the whole proposal has to be implemented today, but it would be nice if we could have uh, a step forward in it. But I, I support it. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and now, we are coming to an end. There's some questions that we're going to get to you if you can respond to us expeditiously so that we're able to use them for um, before the adoption of the budget. And I just wanted to take this opportunity. I know there's a lot of people here from the public. And when the controller alludes to my constant question about pensions, I think it, it is also important to publicly acknowledge that that increase is important to all of us, um, to our city for its sustainability, but also to those who benefit from our pension funds and the fact that that has happened under your leadership. Um, I don't only ask the tough questions. I also give credit where credit <laughs> is due. So, um, well, you have, been, you have been very much asking those, those tough questions, and, you know, it just it makes us work harder. And that's, you know, we get checks and balances from you, so, so I appreciate the question. Well, thank you very much. Um, this concludes this portion of today's budget hearing. I want to thank Comptroller Stringer for testifying. As a reminder, the portion of today's hearing for the public will uh, begin shortly after the IBO's presentation, who's the next group to um, present. Please be sure to fill out your witness slip with the sergeant at arms. The public panels will be arranged by topics. So please indicate the topic on your testimony on your witness slip. We understand that many seniors and people with disabilities wish to testify must leave by a certain time. So we will try to accommodate the need by putting in some earlier witness panels. If you require accommodation, please let the, please write it down on your witness slip. Again, Comptroller, thank you very much for coming to testify today. Um, we will transition. As soon as IBO could get to this table, we can start.
We will now continue the final day of budget hearings with the New York City Independent Budget Office. The committee will hear testimony from IBO Director Ronnie Lowenstein. Uh, Public testimony will begin uh, following IBO. We're going to take a small break so that we can transition. Um, in the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement. Um, Director Lowenstein, you can begin your testimony after my counsel swears you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, and I'm accompanied by uh, George Sweeting, IBO's deputy director. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify um, in the effort to get through as quickly as we can given how many people are waiting to testify. I'm just going to give a few highlights from our testimony and as always, we're available for more depth and more discussions as the budget season goes on. In March, when we testified before you last, um, our forecasts for revenues for this year and for next year were very similar to those of OMB. Since then, our forecasts for this current year, and especially for next year, have increased um, while at the same time, OMB's tax forecasts for this year and next year have declined. Um, what that means is the difference between the two forecasts has widened in a fairly short period of time. We now expect for 2017 tax revenues to be uh, just slightly more than OMB projects. And when we couple that with our expectation of slightly lower levels of spending, we project that this year will end with a surplus of about $4 billion, which is a little over $300 million more than OMB is expecting. The differences are bigger for 2018. For 2018, our tax for forecast exceeds OMB's tax forecast by more than, well, by $1.1 billion. These additional revenues are partly offset by our expectation of somewhat higher spending levels. But taken together, we project that rather than having 2018 exactly in balance, as is always the case for the next year in OMB's budget, uh, rather we're expecting a surplus for next year of $940 million under the mayor's executive budget proposal. Finally, if we assume that that $940 million is carried into the fo following year, 2019, and used to bring that into balance, the remaining budget gap for 2019 would be $1.9 billion. Uh, to put that into context, it's uh, just under 3% of city-funded spending. Uh, not an easy thing to address, but certainly an order of magnitude that the city has routinely dealt with in the past. And it's that $1.9 billion is about half the size of the gap that's being forecast by OMB. Also looking back to our testimony last time, uh, we noted that this year looked different to us. In a typical year, the city is very cautious in its tax forecast. Um, over the course of the year, it builds up revenues. Taxes, are, taxes come in greater than expected. And the city typically uses those greater than anticipated receipts to bring the following year's budget into balance, but not this year. Um, and as we pointed out last time, um, the city was going to be relying most heavily on the savings program uh, to achieve balance for 18, and that's in fact what's occurred. Um, as the controller noted, uh, when the budget was adopted last spring, the forecast for total revenues turned out to be eerily correct. Um, right now it looks like we have only $200 million more in tax collections than we anticipated this time last year. Um, so that's very different. Okay, so the savings plans. Uh, we've got a savings plan uh, for the course of the uh, financial plan, but for this year and next year, it totals roughly $2.8 billion, and we're using a lot of it both to bring next year into balance and to fund some new initiatives. Uh, the savings plans have received some criticism of late, um, mostly because the preponderance of savings isn't actually increases in efficiency or productivity. And in fact, for this year and next year, it's only about one-tenth of the savings are 
are such. Um, what I want to say is that that's actually pretty typical of past PEG and savings programs. The important thing is that we're doing the savings program. Um, certainly when we've been in parts of the business cycle where the city's had to cut dramatically, uh, the city has done so. But more typically, the PEG programs have a lot of re-estimates and a lot of funding swaps and a lot of picking of low-hanging fruit like eliminating vacant positions. So uh, kudos to the council and the administration for having a savings program. Um, this one's not such an outlier. Um, I think there's looking at uh, what's going on in spending. Um, certainly for the current year, the administration is focused on sustaining existing programs, making sure they're funded, making sure they're growing. Um, but the focus shifts somewhat for 2018. I, I don't think that's a coincidence, given that 2018 is a mayoral election year. Um, but I just want to note the three big ticket initiatives that, that the administration is proposing, um, interesting enough, interestingly enough, really don't have much of a short-term impact on the city's budget. Uh, two of the initiatives are capital spending, and those don't normally do much to the expense budget for several years. Uh, the biggest is $1.9 billion to deepen subsidies for affordable housing. Um, another $1.1 billion to close Rikers and start moving those jail facilities elsewhere in the city. Uh, much of the funding for the uh, Rikers Island closure is actually coming from funds that were previous, capital funds that were previously budgeted uh, for construction on Rikers itself. And the third big new initiative, uh, the plan to provide pre-K for three-year-olds, starts small but grows over time. Uh, so initially it would apply only to two school districts and by 2018 it would be up to eight. Finally, I just wanted to say something to conclude about reserves. Um, this administration has consistently increased reserves from the time they started up. Um, I don't believe that there's any level of reserves that we could have that would be sufficient to see, us, see the city of New York through even a modest downturn in the, in the local economy. Um, so the question is, how much is enough? Um, and the answer to that question depends upon how you view the role of the reserves. Um, we see the reserves as providing enough of a cushion to allow the city to make the really difficult choices about cutting spending or raising taxes once a recession hits. So you need money to tide you over in order to make changes. And if that's how you see the role of reserves, um, then the f four plus billion we've got in the reserves now, it's more than that, um, uh, provide a basis for doing that. So having said all of that, I guess one more thing I wanted to say is one problem with reserves is where they're very visible, they're very visible targets. And it was just last year we saw uh, Albany attempting to effectively grab some of them by having the city up its contributions for CUNY and the MTA. So we just have to be aware of that as we go ahead. So having said all of that, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and we're available for your questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for your perspective on the reserves. As you know, that this is something very important to this council, and I do believe that it's because we still have members in this body that lived through the recessions and the many rounds of pegs. Um, some lived through the property tax increase and no one wants to be in that position. Um, so it is just innately a part of, of how we want to provide proper oversight to our city, making sure that we have as much reserves necessary so we're not back there. And I, and I think that your point in really it's about how you see it and what the reserves roles are. Um, it helps me understand why Dean says we're doing great and I also understand why we're saying we need more. Um, so I just thank you for um, putting that additional filter in how we talk about our reserves as a city. Um, I wanted to talk about the strong revenue forecast 
um, and I know that you spoke, you just spoke about it, but if you can just walk me through specifically addressing the property tax, the personal tax, and the two transaction taxes, because you know that is what makes the, I guess, the great difference. So what is it that you see that's happening that really sets off this huge difference between the OMB projection and yours? Okay, and George will be answering that. Thank you. Um, let me start with the property tax. I think one of the things that's it's important to, no to note there is, yes, we're definitely higher than them, but it's not really all about um, the forecast for market values in the city or billable, assessable, billable assessment value. Um, we're higher on, on the levy forecast than OMB, but that's only, that's less than half of the difference between our forecast and their forecast. Particularly in the first two years of the financial plan, much of the difference comes in the forecast for the reserve, and particularly refunds, cancellations, and um, Uh, delinquencies, excuse me, um, and we've you know we we've put a lot we've always put a lot of effort into forecasting the the uh, reserve. I think our forecasts have tended to be better than OMB's. They're not perfect, but I think we're closer than OMB gets. And you know I think there's just there's always there's a pattern of OMB being extremely cautious on those forecasts. Um, so in the in 2018. 75% of the difference between our overall property tax revenue forecast and theirs is due to these, uh, to the reserve items. It trails off as, as you uh, get out to 2021, but it's still almost a third of the difference. The remaining difference is just our, you know, somewhat more optimistic outlook on market values. And also, again, this is sort of a technical issue, but I think we do, we have a, a pretty good handle on the pipeline of assessment increases that are waiting to be phased in. Um, and, you know, OMB is also trying to forecast that, I assume your, your staff is too, uh, but I think that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that drives our overall forecast of the levy, is the uh, provision for, um, uh, for the, the pipeline. Uh, in terms of the, the personal income tax, I'd say, first of all, that, you know, yes, there are differences there, but they're, they're not huge in percentage terms. I think fundamentally it has to do with our somewhat more optimistic forecast for employment growth um, and personal income, and at least in the first year or so of, of uh, average wages. Um, the, on the transfer tax... So is that, not, because we've identified that there's actually a slowdown in employment. So is it that you're, you're basing this on wage increases? We, we, we also have a slowdown in employment. We just don't have as big a slowdown as OMB does. Um, so it's, it, absolutely, there's a slowdown. Uh, it's not, but it's also, it's not a decline, it's not a loss of jobs. It's a slowdown in the, in the growth in the number of jobs. Um, in terms of the transfer taxes, um, I, I, I think, you, you have to look at it. The, the, the really big difference in the forecast stems from the outlook for 2017. Um, after that, the sort of the, the pattern of the growth rates are pretty similar. They're not exact, but they're, they're fairly similar. We have a, you know, we, we think that 2017, based on current collections through March and April, uh, just looks stronger than, than what OMB has. And uh, OMB, you know, aggressively cut their forecast there. Uh, you know, our reading of the current collections and the current market conditions is a little more, it's, yes, we, we also have a decline. We just don't have nearly as big a decline as they do. And then because we're, we start out from a higher point in 2017, it then grows on from there. Uh, but the, the growth rates aren't that dissimilar in the subsequent years. Um, and I asked this of, Dean, of um, Director Fulahan, the in the state controllers in his report on the preliminary budget stated the city set aside 185 million for overpayments in 2015 when the tax reforms took place, and that's the GCT. Um, and we wanted to know, you know, what are your thoughts on this 
uh, can you talk about the expected refunds to GCT going forward and how is it influencing your forecast? Um, you know, we, we noted that too and we're still trying to track that down. Um, we know that there have been some changes in the city more aggressively re refunding money uh, when, when taxpayers build up um, balances on account. And this is actually a problem that, that goes back decades uh, in the city that there are these taxpayers seemingly want to lend the money, the, lend the city money. Um, and they leave it sitting there. For some reason, you know, it, it may be that for the tax department in a big corporation that worrying about whether, you know, you've got 50 million over or 50 million less doesn't matter as much for New York City as it does, uh, you know, for, for their liability with the whole country with the U.S. Uh, tax, tax burden. But so the, the, the city has stepped up once again their efforts to get to avoid the problem of companies building up these large balances on account. And so it's my understanding that some of it is, you know, sort of procedural and technical that they've been pushing that money out faster. To be frank, our forecast, I mean, has, you know, we, we have that large refund amount in 2017 and then we actually keep it fairly large and I think it's larger than OMB and it may be larger than, than the council's uh, forecast too. It's basically sort of, a, we're, we're sort of assuming whatever's happened is going to continue um, and that it's not a one-time thing but we're not. Which is know, exactly what Dean Fulahan <laughs> said would not be. He said it's a one-time yeah. thing. <laughs> Um, and, and I guess the other question for us is, is this, will it be, is it revenue neutral, right? Because that was the whole point of a lot of the engagements for the reform on business taxes. Well, well, that's a broader question. I mean, I think the story is still open on whether the, whether it's revenue neutral. And also, I think you have to pay attention, are you, what period of time are you talking about revenue neutrality over? Um, I don't think there was ever the expectation that every single year it would have you know, it would be neutral. There would be some years where it's up and some years where it's down um, as different, different uh, pieces of the, tax reform, of the tax reform program come into play. Um, so I think you, you have to let it run over probably three, four, or five more years before we can really say was it revenue neutral or not. Uh, but I don't think the expectation was that it would be revenue neutral last year, this year, next year, you know, every single year. Right. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming to testify. This concludes this portion of today's budget hearings. I want to thank uh, Director Lowenstein for testifying. We will now take a 15-minute break before we begin with the public. Please be sure to fill out your slips. Um, and include your um, topic so that we can put you together by topic and then I promise to get you guys out of here as soon as possible, okay? So we're gonna go grab a bite to eat right there, I promise. Um, so see you in 15 minutes.
Good afternoon, everyone. May I please have your attention? We're going to continue with the public portion of the committee uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so just a quick note. So if you're here to testify, uh, please, you have to fill one of these slips out. And once your name gets called, uh, come, you're going to sit right here on the right side uh, of me and to, towards uh, your left. Uh, if you have a written testimony, uh, whenever your name gets called, please bring that with you. We'll take it from you. Uh, we'll give it to all the council members that are here. And if you have any extra copies, we'll put it out for the public. So if any else wants to read it uh, they can take a copy and read it uh, if you uh, if you're if you're not able to stay and you have to leave and you have a written testimony please give that to us we'll stamp it and we'll put it in the record uh, so if you're not able to say please uh, give us your name and your written testimony uh, this way we can submit that into the record uh, and uh, once again just uh, put your cell phones on vibrate or silence uh, because we are uh, we have about uh, 80 people signed up to testify so we're gonna be here uh, for quite a while and we don't want uh, we don't want to disturb anybody else. So please uh, be mindful of that and put your cell phones on vibrate or silence. And uh, also, if you agree with something, uh, please do not clap. We use this gesture. <laughs> so if you do agree with something, please go like this. Uh, so uh, that's about it. If you have any beverages, please uh, finish them outside. If you have any food, uh, please finish that outside uh, in the rotunda as well. Thank you very much.
Uh, we will now conclude the final day of budget hearings with the public portion of fiscal 2018's executive budget hearings. Mm -hmm. As a reminder to all members of the public who wish to testify, please be sure to fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms. The public witness panel will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on your witness slip. We understand that many seniors or people with disabilities um, who wish to testify must leave by a certain time. So we will try to accommodate the need by putting you or some of the on um, some of the earlier witness panels. If you require the accommodation, please make a note on your witness slip. In addition, in the interest of time and fairness to all of those who wish to testify, members of the public will have, um, I'd like you to summarize your testimony in two minutes. We have over 70 people here to testify today. And while I love all of you, I'd like to get out of here at some point. Um, but we are very eager that you're here. We want to hear everyone's story and narrative. What we will see is that there'll be multiple people advocating for the same thing. So that is why in the interest, we want to keep it as concise and focused um, on what the differences are. So in other words, let's try not to repeat the same things. Tell me what's different, what's your experience, and that would be a great way for us to be able to push um, our agenda forward. Uh, if you require uh, any additional support, we will ha we do have Spanish translation available. Tenemos eh, traducciones en español para aquellos que quieran o necesiten eh, el mecanismo para poder traducir las audiencias públicas hoy. Puede identificarle al, al as el asistente para que le pueda proveer el, el traductor. Um, in addition, in the interest of time, um, we ask that you please be respectful of the clock. For any member of the public who wishes to submit written testimony, if you can't say if it's getting late, you can also submit your testimony. Um, you can still submit your testimony uh, either here today or on our website. Uh, and the website is council.nyc.gov backslash budget backslash testimony. And the staff will make it a part of the official record. Testimony will be accepted until Monday, May 29th via the internet. I will no, now call up the first panel, and then uh, we'll be able to begin. The clock is over, just behind or beside this um, door here so that you can measure your um, and wrap up, OK? Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that Minority Leader Matteo is here with us, so thank you. And I know that I believe Council Member Miller will also be joining us um, at some point today. So our first panel is John Heislop, the president of Local 1321, DC 37. Donald Nesbitt, uh, vice president of Local 372, DC 37. Um, Judith Arroyo, president of Local 436, DC 37. Brenda, I think it says Medina, Medina? Uh, local 420, DC 37, and Fran, Schloss, President, uh, local, President, Local 1757, DC 37. And I'll just let the next panel so you can start making yourselves. Um, okay. Uh, UF, UFOA, you'll be the next panel. So just make yourself start getting in that direction. You may begin in the order that you'd like. Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman Julissa Ferreras Copeland and the rest of your City Council colleagues for giving me the opportunity to testify at, at this year's Finance Committee's hearing on, the on this year's budget. I am honored to be here. My name is John Hislop, and as president of Local 1321, Queens Library Guild, District Council 37, asked me, AFL-CIO, I represent the men and women who create and provide the excellent library services that make our library system an essential asset in every Queens neighborhood. Every day, thousands of customers come through our doors to go to our online or, or go to our online presence for information, education, entertainment, social interaction, civic engagement, and so much more. Whether it be story time in every branch, ESOL for home health aides at Seaside Library, family toy time at East Elmhurst Library, teen time at Rosedale Library, homework help at Woodside Library, movie night at South Ozone Park Library, online book renewal all over the world, Queens Library staff meet the needs of our customers. 
Fix this successful nurturing and open environment has fostered exceptional growth. However, the system is straining under the weight of our success and our resources are overwhelmed. Custodians are cleaning more because our people are coming to the branches. To, because more people are coming to the branches. Maintainers are doing more to keep the libraries functioning and safe. IT workers are doing more projects because more people require 21st century technology and 24-7 access. Children's, li children's librarians are doing more programs for children all of, of all ages. Adult learning teachers are providing more classes for adults. Our branches are bursting and every seat is filled. Our children's rooms are overflowing our staff have and our staff have trouble scheduling programs because we lack meeting space. The CIS, this city council and the mayor have done so much for our libraries. Two years ago, you recognized that our shared public library values of democracy and equality are a community necessity. Last year, you baselined our funding. Thanks to you, we are in a stable position, but stable is not good enough for anyone. Our customers are demanding more, and we cannot meet that demand. Help us, help our customers, your constituents, get, to, get the 21st century library services they need. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member and Chair Ferreras Copeland and distinguished members of the Finance Committee. I am Judith Royal, President of Local 436, District Council 37. This is the local which represents the public health nurses, public health epidemiologists who work to keep all New Yorkers healthy. In 2004, the City Council passed Local Law 57, which requires the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to make nurses available to public and private primary and intermediate schools. However, in recent years, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has had difficulty in recruiting and retaining sufficient nurses to not only comply with the law, but to provide nurses for the universal pre-K program, expansion of Thrive New York, and other school health initiatives. And also, please note, it is the same public health nurses the city deploys in response to emergencies such as staffing shelters, point of distribution centers, and responding to disease outbreaks. The salary and benefits for the public health nurses in the schools are now no longer competitive when compared to the school nurses employed by the Department of Education. There is almost a difference of 10 to 15 percent higher for DOE nurses as to compare to DOH nurses. The Department of Health keeps telling us they don't have enough money, so we are here to tell you that for them to be competitive and be able to recruit and retain future hires, they need to spend close to $15,000 per nurse for a total of $13.5 million. When the City Council passed Law 2004-57, you affirmed that the right to affordable, accessible health care includes supportive health care services in the schools. I am asking you to continue to support those services by supporting the nurses who provide them. Thank you for allowing me to testify this afternoon. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Good afternoon, Chairperson Ferreira Copeland, Chairperson Johnson, and the members of the committees. On behalf of President Carmen Charles and the more than 8,500 members of New York City Public Hospital workers representing by Local 420, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be heard here today. My name is Belinda Medina, and I'm currently the second vice president of Local 420 DC 37 ASME. Our members perform a wild a wide range of hands-on support, technical, and other services within health and hospital system. I do, not, I do not need to tell you our members are working within our overburning system. Yet even as more and more of our city poor and working poor comes through our door, our head count continues to fall. As we in Local 420 watch and wonders, as our numbers for health and hospital continues, their ever-expanding effort to create a shadow workforce. It is a workforce built with outside contractors. Contracts with private contractors are nothing new. Companies like Sedesco and Quather have had arrangement with health and hospitals and other city agency for years. As each contract is renewed and expand, working opportunities are lost to our members. We have spoken out about the harm done to our members and our union. The harm is not ours alone. The men in union who are hired by these contracted agency workers are like our members placed on the health and hospital payroll. Unlike our members, however, they are denied union benefits and have no union protection. Over the course of the past several years, our, our members, our union has 
through grievance procedures, been able to secure union membership and protection to some of the long-term temporary hires. We will not give up in our effort on this issue. Local 420 is also not blind to the radical changes within the city and our national health care system. As we already heard here today, as our last hope for the poor and uninsured, the health and hospital system is already overburdened. Based on the recent action of Congress, there is um, a- I hate hope to interrupt you, but if you can wrap up. Sure, I'm sorry. The local, um, the members of local serve 420 has served the city well for decades, and we are prepared to continue to serve. We understand that we need new training and educational program to make the system work. We must insist that all of these legislators within the state and city, as well as health and hospital, remember the work our members have performed in the past, and future training and educational are funded as to protect our future. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Fran Schloss, and I am president of DC 37, Local 1757. Local 1757 represents assessors. Once again, I'm going to speak with regard to the critical need for the hiring of more assessors and assistant assessors as part of the Department of Finance's budget for the coming fiscal year. The hiring of 80 <clears throat> additional assessors would not merely backfill vacant districts, but would also serve to create smaller, more manageable districts. It is projected that taking into account a new employee's learning curve and the cost of salaries and benefits, an additional $100 million in property tax revenue would be generated the first year, and it would be sustainable. This is where the money should be spent and not on pieces of equipment that currently lie dormant in a desk drawer. In addition to what I have just stated, Local 1757 is urging stringent review of real property tax exemptions. The granting of exemptions as it exists today diminishes the tax base. The tax rate, therefore, must be increased to fund the required revenue. In conclusion, the hiring of additional assessors and the reexamination and possible reform of the granting of property tax exemptions are two aspects pertaining to the city's budget that warrant consideration for the coming fiscal year's budget and further city budgets. Local 1757 thanks you for your consideration, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for all of you that came to testify. I think, you know, it shows the diversity of issues that we have to make sure this budget responds to, um, and the diversity of constituents that we serve, because in one way or another, all of our constituents are touched by every one of your um, working, uh, you know, by your municipal labor force. So first, I want to thank you um, for providing that labor force and for staying focused. And we appreciate you coming to testify, and we'll continue to take you and your issues with us as we adopt the budget. So thank you for coming today. Thank you. And the next panel. The next panel will be George Farinacci and Vincent Speciale. And we've been joined by Council Miller. Council Miller Miller. And then the following panel will be NILAG, uh, NIFA, New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, Agadath Israel, and uh, Legal Aid. So what we'll do is we'll make this first row here available for the next panel. So if we call you as the next panel, just make yourself comfortable right here in this first row and that way we're, we're gonna be real efficient today. So the following panel would be uh, Helen Druck from NILAG, Sarah Gilman, Kevin Douglas, uh, Yerukum Silber, Hello, I'm uh, George Farinacci, uh, representing the UFOA um, Fire Officers Association. Uh, to my right is uh, Vincent Special, uh, representing the firefighters. Um, we just want to make a brief statement uh, regarding a request for a budget item uh, to outfit us with a second set of boots. 
Uh, fire officers and firefighters are asking that City Council support a budget line in the Mayor's executive budget for a second set of boots used for fires and emergencies. Uh, the second set of boots will be used when the first pair becomes soaked or contaminated. Um, the second set of boots facilitates more efficient responses to fires and emergencies in New York City. Wet soaked boots can take up to two weeks to dry. As a result, they lead to a number of negative impacts on our performance, health, and safety. Wet boots may cause delays in responding uh, and delays in arriving at locations for fires or emergencies. Um, due to the increased efforts required to climb stairs with the added weight, um, as much as four pounds uh, for a pair of boots, um, it increased um, uh, fatigue and difficulty in putting the boots on and off when they're wet. Um, on May 16th, we had uh, several companies out of service for hours due to gross contamination of the gear, um, and the coats and pants were able to be replaced immediately. However, the boots they had to wait on for a, uh, uh, somebody to supply them to them, and it took hours that they were out of service and they couldn't provide service to their communities. Um, uh, having a second set of boots for firefighters would allow them to do a better job, both faster and safer. The second set of boots would extend the life of the first pair through rotation and minimize premature wear that occurs when boots are continued to be used while they're still wet. Firefighters are issued two coats, two pants that are swapped out when they get soaked or contaminated, but only one pair of boots. The UFOA and the UFA are asking the city council members to please support the long overdue budget line for a second set of boots for all fire officers and firefighters. Help us help you in the communities you serve. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Could I, could I step in? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Obviously, thank you for your service. I'm the chair of civil service and labor. I, um, I know that you guys have an, an expiring CBA coming up, right? And, and part of Do you have a uh, uniform allowance? In, is, is this a part of the allowance? Um, we had a uniform allowance uh, that we negotiated in trade with the city for what we call a quartermaster system. And the quartermaster system provides the gear to us now, and, and we no longer receive that uniform allowance. Okay. All right. So do you have a – is there a, a cost associated with this? Uh, I believe the number we have is $4 million. Okay. Um, to outfit everybody with that second set of boots. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. The next panel could come on up, and the panel after that. And then the panel after this one is Michelle Jackson, Christopher Hanway, uh, Paul uh, Feuerstein, and Justin Nardilla. Okay, I think there's confusion. The panel that should be up here, go ahead, I, you belong there. Let's get some clarity. I knew it was too <laughs> smooth. Helen Druck, Sarah Gilman, Kevin Douglas, uh, Joachim Silber, and uh, Sarah Gilman. Uh, good afternoon, um, council, uh, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Gilman. I'm a supervising attorney with the Legal Aid Society. I supervise the NIFOP program, which is the first public defender system in the United States that provides representation for immigrants who are detained and facing removal from the United States. Uh, NIFOP was actually created by the... Yes. Uh, NIFOP was created uh, through the visionary leadership of this city council um, and has been in existence uh, since 2013. And we are asking that NIFOP continue um, for the future in the nature that it currently exists, which it provides universal representation to all individuals who are facing removal from the United States and are detained and have their cases pending before the Varick Street Courthouse, which is a short distance from where we sit today. Um, the wonderful thing about NIFOP is the universal nature of the program. It doesn't have any type of restrictions attached to who we represent. It's based upon financial eligibility. Um, we try to represent everybody who we interact with who is facing removal and detained by the government. Um, any restriction imposed by, on this program 
would really take away the universal nature of the program and would also be an affront to due process, which is embedded in the idea that everybody deserves an attorney um, to fight against the government who has an attorney fighting for the government. Um, some of the proposals that have been announced by the mayor's office include restrictions involving criminal convictions. This would be an affront to due process. Again, the visionary leadership of the city council enabled universal representation for everybody, and we believe that's imperative uh, to continue to ensure NIFOP's uh, continued existence and the success um, of the program. As this council already knows, um, NIFOP has been a tremendous success and it's been recognized nationwide um, for the past three to four years. Um, we also ask that the program be continued for all, all individuals who are detained by the government and facing removal before the Barrack Street Courthouse. The idea that there would be any type of restriction placed on the program in terms of people's residency uh, is not acceptable and should not be imposed. Residency in the context of immigration detention is a notion that has to be understood in the sense that when someone is detained and taken from the I'm going to need you to wrap up. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Um, in summary, we'd like that the NIFOP program continue in the way that it was envisioned by this council, which is a universal program that allows for representation for every individual who's detained and facing removal without any restrictions imposed on the program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just introduce myself. I'm Judith Goldner from the Legal Aid Society. I don't have prepared testimony. If there are any questions about um, the uh, Legal Aid Society, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair, Council Members, staff, for having me here. My name is Ellen Druk, and I'm a senior staff attorney with NILAG, New York Legal Assistance Group. We represent immigrants, uh, disabled, elderly victims of domestic violence, victims of trafficking, victims of crime, uh, the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, I will just um, go over quickly. There is a lot of information in the testimony that I submitted. I just want to focus on um, New York City immigrants, victims of domestic violence, and members of LGBT community. Um, it is imperative that the City Council and the Mayor's Office uh, support the expansion of community education and legal services programs to protect New York immigrants. Specifically, the Immigrant Opportunity Initiative, the IOI, funding should be increased to allow the current legal service providers uh, who already have the infrastructure to provide free legal services to immigrants uh, to serve more uh, low-income clients. Um, NILAG received hundreds, literally, of Know Your Rights presentation requests from churches and schools in the community. Uh, the fear is huge. Um, you know, as, as, as many uh, of you here probably know, um, you know, people are afraid to be picked up by ICE. Um, so we increased funding for immigrant services would allow NILAC to grow large-scale community clinics, which is um, we're working with the city council, key to the city events, which allow us to identify people who may be eligible for relief. Um, um, let me just quickly wrap up since I see I'm running out of time. Um, so an increase uh, in the case rate, actually, across the board will give agencies like ours um, the opportunity to serve those clients who are most in need in, those ch in this changing immigration client, uh, climate. Rather. Increased IRI funding um, will allow us uh, to handle complex cases and represent those most vulnerable. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Ferris Copeland, Minority Leader Mateo, and Councilmember Miller. Thank you for the opportunity to present this afternoon. My name is Kevin Douglas, and I'm the co-director of policy and advocacy with United Neighborhood Houses of New York. And today I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, which is a coalition of over 40 providers, community-based organizations, libraries, and the CUNY system who believe that every New Yorker who needs English skills should have the ability to enroll in an adult literacy class. I want to thank you, Chair, and members of the Council for your leadership last year in securing $12 million for adult literacy programs. We're very concerned that the Mayor's executive budget did not renew that funding. As it stands right now, if that funding is not included in the final budget, over 5,700 New Yorkers will lose the ability to learn English or earn their high school diploma. 
we believe that it is a very good thing that City Council and the Mayor are striving to make this a sanctuary city and a safe place for all immigrants. Our contention is that we need to go beyond sanctuary and create a place of opportunity. So we don't just want immigrants to have the ability to stay here, but to earn family sustaining wages, go to college and really create opportunity. And they can't do that without English proficiency. So we're really looking for this council to work with the mayor to renew this funding and very importantly baseline it. Uh, we can't expect someone that has immigrated here with very basic English skills to learn to be proficient in six months or a year. This requires an ongoing renewed investment and we also need uh, a new procurement. Currently the reimbursement rates for providers are way too low for the cost of services and so with a baseline investment we're hoping that DYCD will craft a new RFP that will allow for an adequate reimbursement rate. So I will leave it there. I thank you for all of your support and hope that we can see a successful conclusion in the budget. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the City Council. My name is Yerucham Silber. I serve as the Director of New York Government Relations for Good Affairs of America. We're a national advocacy organization, but when we're focusing now on the social services, we provide comprehensive community-based services serving all populations. Our services include employment and training divisions, patient advocacy, neighborhood stabilization, comprehensive housing services, including the maintaining and developing of affordable housing, and immigrant services. What I really want to highlight today was what my colleague mentioned our adult literacy program. This program provides literacy education, supportive counseling, job skill development, and job placement. Services target high need populations citywide, Latin American, Mexican, Caribbean, Asian, African, and European immigrants. Most are newly arrived, existing at very low income levels. A majority are unemployed or underemployed. Almost all have extremely limited English proficiency and lack high school diplomas or the equivalent. Students receive group instruction, tutoring, college and career counseling, job development, and citizenship assistance. Job training, benefits, counseling, and other social services are provided via interagency and linkage referrals. In the current fiscal year, over 500 students participate in both our Manhattan and Brooklyn locations. The current success of this program was due to the $12 million that the council and the mayor put in last year's budget providing these, these, these vital services. However, as was mentioned, much to others may, the $12 million was not part of the upcoming in the mayor's executive budget. Especially now, with proposed cuts to immigrant services on a federal level, this funding is more vital than ever. Good Affairs was a proud member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, and we're proud to join the other members in advocating for this funding. We're fully aware that members of the City Council have been extremely supportive of this funding in the past, and we implore you to have a baseline within the City budget. Continuous one-year funding makes it difficult to operate programs, retain instructors, and can have a major impact on student gain. We ask you to restore this funding and make it permanent. Thank you. For coming to testify and for making sure that your issues are on the record, greatly appreciated. We'll have the next panel come up. And, and then the panel after this one is Art uh, Tolivan, Carmen Collado, and Yolanda McBride. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me this opportunity to testify. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Director for the Human Services Council. You're familiar with our organization, so I'll save a couple seconds on that. <laughs> I want to thank you for providing me this opportunity to testify and also for the Council's generous support of the human services sector, particularly of our Sustain Our Sanctuary campaign. We really appreciate how uh, far the Council has come in advocating for the human services sector overall this year. Uh, we greatly value our partnership with the mayor and the city council, but decades of underinvestment, lack of increases, and stagnant rates on contracts have really left the sector on the brink of collapse. Back in December, HSC and 218 human service agencies in New York shared a letter with the mayor asking for a 12% increase on our contracts. You'll hear from providers today about the impact of this chronic underfunding on the sector, and I'll begin by saying here that this underfunding has really reached an apex, and the sector cannot continue to serve New Yorkers if the system goes unchanged. As the administration has stated earlier in their testimony, investments have been made in the human services sector, in programs, um, in our workforce, which we're very grateful for because our workforce is definitely underpaid and doesn't have parity with city workers. However, the problems that the sector faces are structural, and that's what we're sounding the alarm on. 
Um, the problem, there, the additional funding that's added to programs without addressing these structural issues has really left the sector on the brink, and it's a little like putting new tires on a car when the engine is on fire. We have to stop and make these structural investments in the sector. There are providers that the city relies on to build strong communities, and there are programs that the city council supports around domestic violence, ending homelessness, reducing hunger, mental health, and the organizations that you rely on for those programs are really saying they can't continue to stay in business. Just today, there was an article in Cranes, um, an op-ed penned by Carlos Menchaca, Council Member Menchaca, about Turning Point Brooklyn, an organization that serves uh, people in Brooklyn uh, that's having to close a lot of really valuable programs in order to stay afloat. 18% of nonprofits in New York City are insolvent. Think about what this means. If 18% of providers were to go out of business in New York City, it means 32,000 jobs would be lost and 450,000 people would be without services. We don't want other council members to write op-eds <laughs> like the one that was in Cranes today about services uh, and providers going out of business. I'll end by saying that what we're asking for is for the council to work with us on rate, admit, uh, rate rationalization uh, that the administration has offered to do, but it will take time and we need the council's support to make sure it's done right. And we're also asking to go along with the COLA that's been proposed, a 2% uh, OTPS increase um, on our contracts so that organizations can float and, and stay active while we do this larger rate rationalization piece. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Ferraris Copeland, and good afternoon to the members of the New York City Council Finance Committee. My name is Justin Nardella, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer of CAMBA. The New York City nonprofit human service sector has long been sounding the alarm about the impact of chronic underfunding of government contracts, and we've reached a breaking point. We are calling for an immediate investment in human service contracts to stop the closure of essential services that make New York a safe, diverse, and inclusive sanctuary for all. Without this crucial investment, CAMBA will not be able to provide the same quality services to the same number of clients. We ask that the City Council support to sustain our sanctuary campaign by urging the administration for a commitment to 10% investment in the human service sectors over the next three years. CAMBA is one of New York's largest and most trusted community-based organizations. We operate over 160 programs across the five boroughs that together, that together serve 45,000 New Yorkers. We provide integrated services in six program areas, economic development, education and youth development, family support, health, housing, and legal services. We currently have over 120 city contracts to support roughly 75% of our annual operating budget. Due to the gaps in funding and the lack of cost escalators in our city contracts, we have had to take the following types of actions not making repairs to our facilities, delaying or not hiring replacement staff, and not maintaining our IT infrastructure. In our Scotted Side housing programs in particular, rent increases have devoured our budgets, leaving us to rely on accruals to fund basic expenses, like replacing client furniture, repairing and maintaining apartments, and paying utility bills. Elsewhere in our city contract portfolio, we are facing expensive new service mandates without any corresponding increases in our budgets. The administration's commitment to rate, rational, rate rationalization across human services is a good step and has the potential to finally right-size contracts that have been undefended for decades. This investment is crucial now more than ever. CAMBA has begun to look at our contracts that provide insufficient rates and will have to make difficult decisions about what contracts are viable and those we must turn away. Thank you again for providing us this opportunity to testify. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mary Jane DeSablis, and I'm here representing the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies. Uh, Kafka represents 50 child welfare agencies across New York City. I'm also here representing our CEO, Jim Purcell, who wrote all sorts of wonderful words that I am not going to read to you, but if he asks, please tell him that I did. <laughs> uh, we share the same agenda as HSC and our, our fellow provider agencies and representative agencies that the nonprofit service sector has been underfunded and it's a structural issue and we need to see some improvement along that line. Uh, we want to specifically mention preventive services which are providing a crucial part of the child welfare spectrum at this time. The RAND Corporation just came out with a report this week that says that child abuse prevention and family preservation are some of the most cost-effective and best outcome-producing programs that a city can invest in. And we'd really like to see investment happen for our preventive services. Um, ACS has provided us with some supports in, and in, it's in the executive budget and we appreciate it, but it is insufficient for what they want to, want to have happen over the next year. Um, currently, as they're in, 
as ACS is experiencing a spike in investigations, they are they have an increased demand for preventive services, but the pre preventive service providers can't take on additional slots that are going to dig their deficits that much deeper. Um, so I'll just conclude with saying that we support HSC's agenda and we hope that uh, we can see some relief for our preventive providers and other child welfare providers in the coming budget. My name is Paul Fjordstein. I'm the CEO of Barrier Free Living. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Paul Fjordstein. I'm the CEO of Barrier Free Living. We're an agency that works with people with disabilities in the areas of homelessness, domestic violence, and mental health. We opened the first not-for-profit single shelter in the city system in November of 1990. When we met with uh, Commissioner Taylor in 2014, we did an analysis of our budget and found that our budget was $1,000 less than it was in fiscal 91. We were able to get some things put into our budget in this, with the de Blasio administration, particularly getting additional security, which we've been asking for since fiscal 92, and uh, get uh, a director of social services, but our OTPS remained the same. When we started, we could afford to have a registered nurse, we could afford to have a certified dietitian, we could afford to provide people with disabilities with a diabetic diet, a low-salt diet, a dialysis diet, and a regular diet. We have $35,000 in our present budget for food for the year. It is with the help of our friends from uh, City Harvest and the Food Bank that we're able to put three meals a day on the table. And we feed people whatever we can get. So when the state comes from OTDA and says, why do you serve hot dogs so much? We say, well, that's what we can get from the people who donate. Um, we are in a situation now where we're getting squeezed on OTPS. We have not been able to move on that and we are looking forward to having a rational conversation on rates that allows us to provide people with the healthy food that they desperately need. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming to testify. You clearly know where I stand on this. We will continue to push. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next panel can make their, selves, their way up. Do you want to come up this way? <laughs> the panel after that will be Jesse Lehman, Carla Rabinowitz, Robin Howald, and Ashley Sol uh, Solaris. And then after this panel will be Mary Haviland and Robin Vitale. Thank you, Chair Julissa. Thank you, Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland and members of the Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Yolanda McBride. I am the Director of Public Policy at the Children's Aid Society. And for more than 160 years, Children's Aid has helped children, youth, and families living in poverty to succeed and thrive. Uh, children aid, at Children's Aid, we are also a member of the Sustain Our Sanctuary campaign, and my testimony will be about um, our concerns. At Children's Aid, we currently have 115 government contracts and 73 or 63 percent of those are through the city. Our, city. our city contracts total $60 million, currently half of our $125 million annual budget. But it's getting harder and harder for us to balance our budget. We have leveraged state and federal funding as well as philanthropic support. We have shaved programs and services over the years and we can no longer shave. So I just want to give you a couple examples of some of the challenges that we're experiencing. Uh, because there is a cap on our rate for family foster care, we have 673,000 unfunded mandated costs for services like childcare, transportation, and supports for birth parents. Our daily rate is $35.44 for family foster care, but our true costs are really about $50 a day. Just over the last seven years, our rent, occupancy costs, and healthcare 
health insurance costs have increased by $6.1 million without an increase in our contracts. If our contracts actually pay what it actually costs to run our programs, we will be able to retain and support our staff through adequate, adequate compensation and professional development. We would also be able to provide supports that we know are necessary for high quality programs and for which we have to raise private funds to do or do without. We have laid off staff, reduced program hours, postponed necessary repairs to buildings, and we are just at a breaking point. And so we just uh, really need the investment and thank you for your support. Hi, good afternoon. Jefferson Ferraris Copeland. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, members of the New York City <coughs> Finance Committee. My name is Robin Tolliver, and I represent the Children's Village, Harlem Dowling, and Inwood House, three organizations founded in Manhattan in the early 1800s. Together annually, we serve over 15,000 of New York City's teens and families. Today, we provide one of the most, I'm sorry, the broadest continuums of care in New York, from preventive services that allow children to remain in the care of their families to adoption and foster care and juvenile justice programming that includes evidence-based diversion programs to keep teens in schools safe and with families. Our long history and recent experience confirm what research has shown. Well-funded and managed programs are critical to engaging children and family, and they are non-negotiable when we look at long-term personal success. I have served <clears throat> our sector on New York City's front lines for nearly 20 years. I have spent the last 17 years working with teens in our way to independence program. Working with teens who have spent often a decade in foster care is not easy, but I am proud to report that over 80% of those teens we work with obtain a GED or graduate high school, uh, with more than 60% attending college, and over 75% are being employed. However, in the past decade, uh, achieving success in this type of, has become very difficult and challenging. I am here today seeking your leadership to address the disparity and lack of appreciation for those like me who serve on the front lines. I am not only keeping children safe and helping them achieve success, but every day. I and thousands like you make our city great with the world-renowned city that we live in. We cur currently serve over 18 neighborhoods in New York City. These are demanding services aimed at keeping children safe and most often families together. Until now, our generous donors and philanthropy have made up for the city's persistent underfunding. However, they can no longer continue to subsidize New York City at the levels needed. Without a more responsive approach from the administration, dedicated staff will continue to make the difficult decision to leave the sector due to insufficient salary structures, and our organizations that have served the city since the early 1800s will be forced to reduce critical frontline supports in our most stressed communities. In closing, we appreciate the mayor's support in the previous COLA, wage floor, and investment plans for a 6% COLA spread over the next three years. However, we must ask for consideration for not just our workforce who need and deserve these investments, but for all contracts as well. Our current contract lasts upwards of 10 years and do not account for increasing costs in our beautiful but expensive city. Thank you, City Council. Good afternoon. My name is Carla Rabinowitz, and I'm the advocacy coordinator for Community Access, an old 43-year-old, mostly mental health housing agency in New York City. We offer 1,300 units, mostly permanent housing, um, throughout the city. And like the others here, we're from the um, uh, Sustain Our Sanctuary campaign, asking for a 12% across-the-board increase on our contracts. We just had layoffs. Our our Private fundraising has to raise over a million point five a year, and even that doesn't put us at the zero level. I just want to tell you how the lack of funding affects uh, the tenants. We have right now a 21 percent staff vacancy rate. Staff are leaving in large numbers because the rate is better at Starbucks. So consider a tenant, Phyllis. She's had over nine service coordinators in her 10 year stay at Community Access. She lives in our scattered side housing, and she counts on the support services to find ways to cope with her severe PTSD, encourage her to get out in the world, and give her someone to talk to 24-7. She suffers from the great symptoms, uh, suffers great symptoms from PTSD, and her life story is not easy to share. Each time a new coordinator comes on board, she has to share everything and every little bit of her story over and over again. She's had a fortunate, the last service coordinator has been here for two years. And during that time, Phyllis has been able to join the Tenant Advisory Committee and really find her voice. So we're asking you not to take that away from Phyllis and the other tenants. 
these service coordinators. They need consistency of their service coordinators, and they're vastly underpaid. Also, the infrastructure in our buildings, um, we don't get enough funding for that. For instance, we had a fire in another building, in another apartment. You know the tenant doesn't have insurance. Our insurance costs don't cover all that needs to be done for that. Um, we have a constant lack of maintenance men in the building, so they're living in these permanent buildings that are beautifully built, but they don't have people to take out the garbage. So um, please, we ask you to convince the mayor to provide the 12% across the board increase. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ashley Solaris. I'm the harm reduction specialist at Community Access. I work at our Cedar and Vice Avenue locations in the Bronx. Um, in my experience working for Community Access, I've found that there are certain aspects of my life I've had to put on hold due to lack of sufficient income. For example, I can't afford mental health services. While some can argue that this is an insurance issue and not the fault of a low salary, the reality is that I have a serious mental illness that is going untreated because affording weekly copays for things like therapy and medication are unrealistic with all my other bills and necessities. If I need surgery or suffer an injury, I do not know how I would ever afford these medical bills, even with insurance. There's also the matter of life goals, such as paying off my student loans, starting a family, and moving into a more stable home. These are all out of the question for me at this time. These may not be life-saving necessities, but is it fair to expect me to choose between putting my life on hold for a low-paying but very fulfilling career where I can help the most vulnerable members of our community or abandon my values for another job in the private sector where I'm only benefiting myself? I do feel that I'm fortunate after all, many of my colleagues in lower paid positions are working two or more jobs to provide for themselves and their families. But I hope my voice can bolster theirs and that we can come together and see some change. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to testify. In particular, your story. I appreciate you sharing your personal stories and your anecdotes. Thank you. As I said, we keep pushing. We're on the same page, so I don't have any questions. Um, we will call up the next panel. I know you know who you are and the panel following that. The following panel will be Enrique uh, Herver, uh, Hunter Citrin, Suzanne Robinson Dyer, Anthony Feliciano, Clara Londano, and Maria Lazardo. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Council Member Ferraris Copeland and to Council Member Mateo. My name is Mary Haviland. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. And I'm here today on behalf of the Sexual Assault Initiative, an initiative that has been supported by the New York City Council for almost 10 years. We're respectfully requesting the City Council to increase the level of funding from $600,000 to $700,000 for the four service providers that are included in this initiative. They are Kingsbridge Heights Community Center, Mount Sinai Savvy, the Alliance, and Mount Sinai St. Luke's Crime Victims Treatment Center. We're requesting these funds to allow us to engage in a more proactive way the undocumented and foreign-born survivors of sexual assault in New York City. The New York City Council funding supports the New York City Alliance, uh, Alliance's training program. It's a forensic examiner training institute. It's the largest of its kind in the state. We train uh, in fiscal year 2017, we trained over 900 health and human services professionals thanks to the City Council uh, funding. The Sexual Assault Initiative in total served almost 4,000 victims of sexual assault in the city and conducted 11,000 counseling, uh, counseling and training sessions. CBTC is providing the only free services for male survivors uh, in New York City. 20% of their clients were male or transgendered and they provided almost 6,000 counseling sessions. Kingsbridge Heights is the only free full service facility serving victims of child sexual abuse. And in fiscal year 2017, they saw 2,000 clients 
in their Bronx offices. The fourth partner, Mount Sinai Savvy, provides services to trafficking victims. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so these programs provide um, services to all five boroughs, um, and we're extremely thankful for the council's support, um, and we ask for ongoing support in this year's budget. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Councilmember Matteo. My name is Robin Vitale. I serve as the Vice President of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association here in New York City. I will be synopsizing my testimony as much as possible. Um, we are certainly very supportive of many of the initiatives that have been proposed in the executive budget that focus on health and wellness promotion for the city. Um, one of our first initiatives we wanted to highlight is the mayor's intention but helping to close one of the gaps around the Manhattan Greenway. Um, a hundred million dollar investment to uh, close the gap between 53rd and 61st Street. It's a good first step. We're equally concerned about the gaps that exist up at 125th and 135th Street, as well as 145th and 162nd Street. If you're looking at the health outcomes in neighborhoods across New York City, those neighborhoods truly deserve access to physical activity. So we would love to see in the ensuing years having those gaps closed as well. But essentially, we love the idea. We just want more of it. Moving on to um, another concern for us around physical education. This is a preeminent concern of the Heart Association as it helps to inspire physical activity in our youngest New Yorkers. We applaud the city and city council for the investments that have been made over the last several years. Um, the executive budget last year codified funding to help hire PE teachers as part of the PE Works program. We're making wonderful progress on that. We certainly applaud it. We are concerned, obviously, once that funding ceases in FY 2020, what is going to happen to those teachers. We would love to make sure that that funding is consistent and sustained, and so we'd encourage the consideration of baselining those dollars in the years ahead so that those teachers can stay in place and continue the good work that has begun. And as we know from Local Law 102, teachers are not the only gap that exists around the quality of PE programs. I know that there has been some discussion around capital construction costs and helping to improve this space for physical education in our schools. We encourage the council to continue looking at that as well. And lastly, we have some proposals related to healthy food access. We would love to make sure that the city is investing dollars into the programs that our neighborhoods desperately need to help to improve food and healthy food access for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Ferreras Copeland and Councilman Mateo. Uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I am the Director of Policy for the Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, we represent 180 member organizations in New York City that provide job training and job placement services for New Yorkers. It's a range of community based organizations, community colleges, and labor organizations that help roughly 800,000 New Yorkers every year get some element of crucial skills or job development to help lift themselves and their families out of poverty. Uh, and we're testifying today because there are areas of this year's executive budget that fall short in terms of helping those New Yorkers lift themselves out of poverty and get better jobs. And I'm, I want to address just a few of them uh, and, and run them off quickly. Uh, first, I want to stand with my uh, allies and colleagues in the Coalition for Adult Literacy uh, and point out that in our city, if we're going to be a sanctuary for immigrants from around the world, we need to help provide a pathway for those immigrants into our workforce. And that means that we need to have real quality adult literacy programming for them. We need the $12 million back that were in last year's budget in this year's budget. Frankly, $12 million isn't even enough, but it's what we need right now to help create that pathway and give basic adult education to, to hundreds of thousands or at least in that case, several thousand slots of New Yorkers who need it. Um, moving beyond the, the basic adult literacy, uh, we're also very disappointed that this year's budget does not have a substantial increase in funding for bridge programming, which was identified by the Mayor's Career Pathways Plan as a crucial need to help New Yorkers uh, who lack either a, a critical element of education or credentials uh, take that next step and get over that, that barrier towards a good job. Uh, there are successful bridge programs already in existence, like CUNY Prep. Uh, we think they could be expanded and new ones could be launched. Uh, there was an immigrant bridge program that was successfully piloted a few years ago. We want to see that restarted. Uh, we also support the Fair Fares campaign because we know that uh, the price of getting to a job interview or the job training should not stand in the way uh, of anybody getting a good job. And cutting across all of this, the last one is that 
we cannot provide quality job training and placement services to these hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers as long as the contracts for human services, which include job training and placement, are chronically underfunded. Uh, we needed really the 12% increase uh, for human services contracts. We know that that's not going to happen in this year's budget, but we believe that 10% over the next three years would start to get the human services sector on the pathway to where it needs to be, and we hope that you will fight for that uh, in this year's budget and in, in the coming years. Uh, it's important to us as it is to the entire human services sector. Thank you. And then after that are um, the individuals testifying from Picture the Homeless. Minority leader, Mario, I think everyone is making you Latino today by calling you Mateo. Um, his name is Mario, a council member Mario. But you know, being Latino for a couple of minutes isn't bad. Uh, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the executive director of the Commission on the Public Health System. I'm actually here with some of our uh, fellow community partners. Um, uh, ensuring that an initiative called Access Health NYC uh, remains as part of the City Council priority but also gets enhanced um, in terms of more funding. So Access Health NYC was something that we thank the Council for stepping up where the state didn't step up when it came to outreach to communities, particularly low-income communities, immigrant communities, around their rights to access to care but also the issues around coverage. And so we worked closely with 13 awardees from this that they'll discuss where they've been at least as of May over 100 um, trainings and workshops that are done by our partners, New York Immigration Coalition, Federation of Positive Welfare Agencies, Coalition for Asian American and Families, and Community Service Society. There's been over 5,000 people reached with these workshops and trainings and over 300 through SF Media. And so we think it's an important and a critical time right now with this federal um, climate that people need to know their rights about accessing care and around coverage issue, particularly as we start seeing perhaps cuts to Medicaid and several other areas. So we think it's even more critical to have this. But also in terms of equity, to ensure that the more community-based organizations have the opportunity to sustain the work they already do as places of, that are sanctuaries, our community-based organizations. The other aspect I'd like to speak of is on the public hospital system. That is something that the commission for us that we were created around when they want, in the 90s, when they wanted to privatize the public hospitals. And unfortunately, we're back at that same place where the financial crisis of the public hospital is causing them to make decisions around perhaps closing of services, changing of services, but also could be closing of hospitals. And I know the mayor's administration has stepped up in providing more funding, but there has not been clarity about what's going on with their plan financially, how to deal with public hospitals. And it cannot be done in a silo. And so we want to make sure that our public hospitals are supported and that there's a, the city can step up with our, our organization to look at those issues in a more comprehensive way. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hunter Citrin. I'm the advocacy and communications coordinator for Boom Health, an innovative community-based nonprofit organization that delivers a continuum of prevent, uh, prevention and harm reduction services to over 14,000 of New York City's most vulnerable individuals. And I am here along with my other colleagues to, uh, today uh, on behalf of my organization to urge the New York City Council to include $5 million for Access Health NYC in the FY18 budget. Um, thanks to Access Health NYC, Boom Health has been able to give the Bronx's faith-based community the tools to utilize the health care system with greater comfort and confidence. And what I believe is to be the most important factor, we've been able to dispel much of the fear, uh, confusion, and misinformation that has spread due to the dangerous rhetoric posed by the federal administration. In just two years of operation, our Bronx Health Access Program has engaged over 13,000 individuals through social media campaigns, uh, community health education workshops, special events, and um, enrollment assistance days. And operating primarily based uh, in the faith-based community, 
Um, we have opened up a platform to discuss very controversial issues such as HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, substance use, and LGBT related health issues, which previously have been forbidden to be discussed, especially in these drastically isolated communities. Um, so uh, just to sum up, in uh, FY16 and 17, the City Council allocated $1 million in funding to support this fantastic Access Health initiative. And increasing this commitment to $5 million would allow community leaders of all five boroughs to continue highlighting new needs for those that they serve, while giving resources to us sitting here and also to expand our efforts to reach even more difficult to reach communities. So uh, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you so much. Um, my name is Suzanne Robinson Davis, and I am from Bedford Stuyvesant Family Health Center, a federally qualified health center in Brooklyn. And I am here to support the Access Health Initiative to request an increase in funding from $1 million to $5 million for Access Health NYC and FY 2018 budget. At our center, we have been working to connect underserved populations to healthcare services. We found that of the 16,000 unique patients served by our, our center in 2016, 2,100 were without insurance. In many cases, people often do not access um, services because of inability to pay, and they are unaware of the options available. Access Health has enabled us to reach some of these people. However, we want to do more. We want to increase our partnership with community organizations like mobile testing units, health promotion workers, to, be, to begin reaching people in non-traditional settings. After work, clubs, LGBT centers, party goers. We are working to connect people to care for hepatitis C, for HIV, for insurance, and for quality health care in general. However, we want to do more. The Access Health Initiative makes a significant difference. It changes the landscape. It provides hope in the midst of fear and uncertainty. It is a pathway for everyone who calls New York City home. In 2016 and 2017, the City Council generously provided $1 million in funding to support organizations to do this essential work in communities like bed -Stuy. We call on you to refund the Access Health Initiative and to refund it at a higher financial rate, as $5 million is the ask. And in doing so, we build on the city's investment and broaden the programs to reach, um, pro the programs reach so that all of New York City's community can benefit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, I am Clara Londono. I am for Urban Health Plan plus the Social Center. We are really friendly with uh, Julissa, and I am here to urge the council to help us with $5 million for the next year budget. Uh, what is supporting a, a opportunity in um, Access Health New York City is the ability to respond quickly and provide critical information to communities that are deeply affected by fear and instability through the organization that they trust. Uh, and it's clear, this is a clear way to make real this positive commitment to immigrants for the New York. Uh, Urban Health Plan, we are for the Bronx, for East Harlem, and now, and Corona, Queens. And our mission is to continually improve the health of communities and the quality of life of the people we serve by providing affordable, comprehensive, and quality care for them. We provide care to anyone who enters through our doors, regardless of insurance, income, or immigration status. And with the funding that we receive, we increase the awareness and access to health care services through health education and screenings, increase of the community collaboration and partnership uh, and we are giving to all of our patients and all the, the population the most resources that we can. 
and we utilize internal outreach and enrollment assistance to educate screens and enroll individuals and families into health insurance program. We want to continue with this, and we want to continue with the New York City to provide better uh, access to the health to our New Yorkers. Good afternoon. Hello. I am Maria Lizardo. I'm the executive director of a settlement house called Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. We're located in uh, Northern Manhattan, and we serve the residents of Manhattan as well as the Bronx. I'm here with my colleagues today to ask for the council to um, increase Access Health NYC from $1 million to $5 million. We are new to this coalition, and we started our work in December. And since then, we've been able to reach over 2,700 community residents. We've also participated in over 60 events. And we were able to do this by hiring an outreach coordinator who's really out in the community, focusing on the hard to reach um, uh, immigrants in our community, those that are undocumented and those who have language barriers. And so we're also the lead in coordinating Hike the Heights, which for the past 13 years has taken place in Highbridge Park. And it is a, it's happening on June 3rd, where we bring over a thousand community residents. And it's really about promoting our beautiful parks in northern Manhattan, as well as healthy living and healthy activities. So Access Health really gives us an opportunity. And so moving forward, if we're able to do this for another year, and as our communities are under attack, with health care, this will really afford us the opportunity to reach even more New Yorkers and cut across all five boroughs. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Enrique. Uh, thank you for your time, Council Member Ferreras. Uh, I am at the program director at HANAC and Hell Access. I am here to testify the great work that my colleagues do and also the case workers. To summarize our request, I will say that Health Access provides all the services that we heard before today. We work with domestic violence group, also people that were incarcerated before and they are coming to the community. We deal with Medicaid and all the complicated healthcare system that we have here in the United States and also New York. And also we advocate for the immigrants that we have for the Latino, for the European, for the Asiatic and different language barriers. And we spend every day or time to provide this service to the New Yorkers. We need the funding because our sources are limited. Our staff are part-time. We do advocate, we do outreach, assist uh, the transportation in New York is a little bit complicated and it's time consuming to go to different places, hospitals, work with social workers, and that's why we are here to request to increase this funding and also still provide these great services to New Yorkers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The panel after that will be uh, Janet Poppendijk, uh, Rachel Sabella, and Jennifer Ratner. Uh, my name is Jenny Action. I'm reading on behalf of Lima Berkeley. My name is Lima Berkeley, and I'm a resident of the Catherine Street Shelter through DHS. I'm also a member of Picture the Homeless and a supporter of the work of CASA and Benali Kelly to mobilize and form tenants associations um, and other efforts to stem the displacement of New Yorkers. What I'm asking for here and now is not new or novel. Simply put, we need an independent review board or panel to monitor DHS monitor the monies that are funneled to DHS, how, when, where, and on whom DHS spends its money. The need of a review board is not to put the spotlight on one site or one set of staff, but to shed light on the whole shelter division from the bottom rung of DHS to its top echelon. The definitive question that no one has uttered yet, let alone addressed, is this. If we don't do it now, when? Here are some of the issues that the board could shed a little bit of light on. First, housing specialists. Are they trained? Do they aggressively bypass and cut through rhetoric and red tape? Uh, how much money is allotted for their training? 
Is there an incentive or merit pay to offset their jobs or other responsibilities? Should a separate division exist dedicated only to securing housing for people so that move out rates can be better tracked and monitored? Security. How secure is security really? What is the response time and the reporting time to DHS? What is the training for security and non-security officers? And most importantly, perhaps, is transfers. Why every three, six, three to six months is there shuffling of shelter residents from one site to another to serve different populations and constantly convert at great cost? And how are DHS providers potentially profiting from the processing of paperwork and overtime needed to absorb an influx of shelter residents? Um, these transfers take a significant toll on residents and often lead those uh, requiring medical attention ill-equipped. For the above testimony and other areas that time don't allow, I say a review panel is needed now more than ever to determine where the resources in DHS's massive and expanding budget are going and ensure that they're being used properly. My name is Scott Andrew Hutchins, and I am an activist with Picture the Homeless, a five-year resident of the shelter system, and have a master's degree from CUNY College of Staten Island with $66,000 in student loan debt. I was recently laid off from my job and made $17,000 last year. I am imploring the city council to fund more housing for people making under $20,000 using funds currently budgeted for shelters. Thousands of New Yorkers are working and cannot afford housing, and landlords often use pricing strategies to avoid taking vouchers. Mara Gay noted in an April 10, 2017 Wall Street Journal article that thousands of working New Yorkers are living in shelters because they lack the income needed to pay the rents in this city. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 260,000 college graduates are working for the federal minimum wage, not accounting for higher local minimum wages. A 2016 study by Zero Head showed that 52% of new jobs created are minimum wage jobs, and 23% of those working them have at least a bachelor's degree. Poverty is less a result of skill level than of available jobs. Most of the working poor in shelters are not people who qualify for supportive or senior housing, nor are job developers in the shelters equipped to help people into jobs that pay a living wage. According to documentation from HRA, they pay my shelter $2,325.66 per month to house me, more than double the $1,018.75 rent to the apartment I lost in 2012. HRA also pays nearly $274 a month to store the property I once had in that one-bedroom apartment. My current shelter has me in a large dorm room with 22 strangers, some threatening, with only a painful cot and a small locker to myself. The food portions are very small, the cleaning is inadequate, and the staff is not useful to me. This $2,599.66 per month would be better spent on a one-bedroom apartment, but the link voucher limits the cost of the apartment to $1,213, of which I have to pay $500.50, which is unreasonable on unemployment. According to Gay's article, the city has only 2,662 apartments for the 865,000 households that make under $25,000 in New York City. The mayor's pseudo-affordable housing plan does not address any of these households where the need is most dire. If conservative Utah can provide housing for such people, why can't progressive New York? For these reasons, city council should oppose the building of new shelters and instead use that funding to create permanent housing for people who make under $20,000 a year. Okay. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Charmel Lucas, and I'm a member of Picture the Homeless. I've been in the shelter system since 2013 when my partner and I were displaced by Hurricane Sandy. My question to the council is, why is the city opening up 90 more shelters? Why instead we cannot create 90 new buildings to house people, which would release some pressure off the city, um, off the shelter system? The city is presently spending uh, $4,200 per month for my partner and myself to stay at a hotel. Our case managers are not trained to work with families. We're receiving little to no support on site. My shelter is still training a person to be a housing specialist, although we've been placed there for nearly two months. The staff has no idea how much money is being spent on us to stay in the shelter. They were shocked to hear the dollar amount. Why is the city spending over 4200 for a family to be in the shelter when that money could house at least two families in a one-bedroom apartment. I, I'm also concerned that the capital budget for DHS was increased by $300 million, most of which will upgrade and expanding shelters. Instead of those funds being increased by $300 million, why, we can't fund, why can't those funds go towards housing? What I would like to see 
is for these funds to be used for extremely low income housing that really that's really the issue and those are really the people who need the housing the most the city is saying that it needs 90 new shelters in order to close down hotels and cluster shelters but why can't you just increase housing instead of more shelters and how can you keep people in shelters up to 10 years hpd keeps building condominiums and rental housing throughout the city that the most vulnerable people cannot afford. We are watching the homeless population increase every day. Why are you not building extreme low income housing? Why we are not holding landlords accountable for warehousing vacant buildings and vacant lots for stabilized apartments? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Cecilia Grant and I represent Picture the Homeless. I've been homeless since February of 2014 when I returned to New York from Florida. I entered the shelter system for the first time and I was unaware of the system that I believed initially was supposed to help me find housing. Instead, it's an agency that doesn't help people but instead causes more problems. It's unsafe, it's unhealthy, and I've had numerous traumatic experiences with my life being in danger with staff members that are really there for a nine to five, and their main concern is that you sign that ILP so they can get paid. After being jumped in the spring of 2016, I decided that I would be safe in the street. That's really funny. And then after coming across Picture the Homeless, I began to research the numbers regarding people and the money in the shelter system. For example, when I was in the shelter, the city and agencies paid $3,000 a month for a bed that I could not sleep in because if I burped or fart, I was in danger of getting beat up. I was issued a voucher that no broker or law landlord would not want. And I've had one experience with a housing specialist in which she told me I was not sick enough for her to assist me in finding housing. After I learned about the waste of money that does nothing to enrich the quality of life that I am accustomed to, before becoming homeless, it's a crime. I've walked the streets and see vacant lots that have been counted by picture the homeless. There are so many vacant lands and lots that you can house the ever-growing 88 plus thousand homeless people. In addition, it could prevent displacement of possibly 40,000 people that are not homeless, but they are close to losing their housing due to rising rents, overcrowding, lack of stable employment and harassment <clears throat> in the public housing. If we did this, there would be no ho homeless problem and it could be done economically. Right now, there's only $1.9 billion going into the capital budget for housing this year. Meanwhile, there's over $1.6 billion, nearly $600 million difference going towards operating DHS. Roughly half of that funding comes from city tax levy, meaning that could be committed to other uses. Additionally, the executive budget adds $300 million to DHS capital budget. We don't know how that money is being used, by the way. But they say for upgrading of shelters and to create 90 new shelters proposed by Mayor de Blasio. This is not in the best interest of human beings in need of security and safety for the sake of their children, elders, and all New Yorkers. That money can go much further towards ensuring a community of security, bringing families back together in a safe, healthy community where people can put their lives back together. I urge the council to look at ways to create quality of life for all and not selling the city out. These funds should be diverted from the decrepit DHS system that uses I, money I need to you to wrap up your testimony, Human beings in psychological please. despairs. That money should go into permanent low-income housing for all those who need it, regardless of your income. Stop putting more and more money into a system that does not work. It's a disgrace and a crime. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Rodriguez. I'm a proud member of Picture the Homeless, and I'm also proud member of, of Banana Kelly Residents Council. While the city's homeless population continues to rise, there's a visible rise in new buildings being built throughout the city. The city's poorest of poor have no access to these apartments. The city spends money on new shelters and not spending enough money on making 
housing more affordable to extremely low income households. Ex experts say that it costs an extra forty to forty five thousand dollars of, of additional money to reduce the, the area medium income by 10 percent or to get housing at the affordability we all need. This is the same amount that it costs the city to house a, um, a homeless family in the, with children for one year. Picture the homeless would prefer a DHS and HPD utilize monies accumulated by the city tax payers to invest in truly low income affordable housing instead of warehousing human beings for years in demoralizing conditions. People in shelters are unable to achieve their dreams and desires that most of us take for granted due to the in inhumanity of the system. When I was in the shelter, at times I felt debilitated. There's a real feeling of being humiliated due to being stigmatized or even criminalized in the shelter system. Having housing makes you feel confident and allows one to pursue the things in life that make all New Yorkers unique. Not only does providing housing not shelters cost less, it's the right thing to do morally. P PTH is asking the council to use the powers to help the tens of thousands of truly low income New Yorkers living in shelters on the street, in their cars, on someone's sofa, or on the verge of losing their homes and community ties. New Yorkers have the highest rate of homelessness in the country. I'm always hearing New York is a sanctuary city. If this is the case, PTH is asking to, for assistance to provide sanctuary to the thousands of truly low income and minimum wage earning New Yorkers in the form of extremely low income housing. Thank you. Thank you for testifying and for putting your story on the record. This helps us to continue to advocate on your behalf. Thank, Thank you. you. The next panel. The panel after this one will be Ron Cope, Randy Levine, Maggie Maroff, uh, Jackie Oakenburney, Pamela Stewart, and Ruth Wengerin. So that panel that was just closed, called, if you can make your way up to this front row so that we can get everybody shifting. Oh, uh, can you repeat the names again? Ruth Wangerin, Pamela Stewart, Jackie Oaken Burney, Maggie Maroff, Randy Levine, and Ron Cope. I was thrilled to hear Chair Federas Copeland at in her very first question. I'm all. sorry, I want to make sure that you're heard. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to please, if you have conversations, to take them outside. I need to be able to hear the testifying panel. You may begin. I was thrilled to hear Chair Ferris Copeland, in her very first question to OMB this morning, address the inefficiencies in New York City Parks' completion of capital projects and the bureaucratic inefficiencies of the procurement process. This is really at the core of what I'm going to address. I think the system itself really needs help. I'm Jennifer Ratner. I'm the board chair of Friends of the East River Esplanade, 60th to 120th Streets, the conservancy for the waterfront that stretches from East Harlem down to Yorkville and the Upper East Side, the only contiguous area of waterfront in that area where community members who love and use the waterfront, runners, bikers, walkers, fishermen, our organization is dedicated to the restoration and reinvention of this beautiful and precious waterfront. Unfortunately, the Esplanade is literally falling in. Many of you may be familiar with the approximately 50-foot section of the Esplanade seawall that fell into the East River just behind Gracie Mansion a few weeks ago, dragging fencing and part of the walkway with it, and luckily, no people. There are other areas where you can see the East River water lapping just beneath, spots that have been there for not days or months, but for years. 
Some of the necessary funds for repair have been allocated in past budgets, but we are urging full funding for these repairs so they can be done in an expedient manner and the city doesn't have to emergently do a patch job. One of our main focus points has been the pier at 107th Street. It too is falling in. At present, the city intends to simply repair this valuable resource with a patch job that involves cutting 40 feet off the end, placing a chain link fence there, a repair that is la a costly repair intended to last just five years. Why not build a resilient state-of-the-art pier right now? The plans are there. This is what the fishermen, children, sur surrounding communities deserve and want. It could be a model of reinvented waterfront in the inner city for all of New York and indeed nationally. There's approximately $3 million of state funding already in the state budget for this. While we 1,000% support the $100 million in the budget for a new esplanade just south of 60th Street, because truly who's not in favor of an extended greenway, but at the same time, we urge you to fund the expeditious repair of the waterfront that already exists and the resilient and state-of-the-art pier that East Harlem and the East Side deserve. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Sabella. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Food Bank for New York City. You have my formal written testimony. Um, I'm going to be very short right now because I know there's a lot of people that want to speak. First, I want to say thank you. This council, Chair, you said it best this morning, is very rarely united, and you have presented a united front with every single member of this council supporting $22 million to support food pantries and soup kitchens and saying that no New Yorker should go hungry. So we want to thank the council for continuing to prioritize that. I also want to do personally thank the council staff as well, especially the finance division. Everyone here works so hard to make this happen, and I want to make sure I say thank you too. The state of hunger is uncertainty. Even before this week in the White House proposal, the state of hunger was uncertainty. What we heard this week is there are proposed cuts both to the SNAP program that helps with food insecurity and to food commodities programs. Now more than ever before, we need need our city to be united to support New Yorkers struggling with hunger. We need to be proactive and support programs that do that. One is universal school meals. We want to see free lunch for every student in New York City. And two, we want to see those increased dollars for food pantries and soup kitchens. And no more of this one-year add-ons. We want to see baseline dollars. We want to see the commitment from the administration that they've said to support pantries. The most important thing in my testimony today is a letter signed by more than 200 food pantries and soup kitchens throughout the five boroughs who are saying they need more food, they need more help. So I want to make sure you hear their words. That letter will be going in the mail to the speaker and the mayor as well. Um, I'm going to stay under time, and I want to say thank you again for your support, and we look forward to continue to working with the council on this. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Um, I'm Jan Poppendick, and I'm testifying on behalf of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, which is located at the CUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy. At the School of Public Health, we recognize that nutritious food is essential for health and that school food programs can and do play a vital role in shaping the health of our children and youth. For those who participate, they provide balanced meals and displace the consumption of less healthy alternatives. For those who fail to participate, they provide nothing at all. I am here speaking on behalf of universal free school meals because I'm primarily concerned about three groups of students in our schools. One group are students who are not eligible under the federal guidelines for free meals, and therefore if they want the school meal need to, to find $1.75 a day um, <clears throat> for lunch. And we know that there are many families in our city who are above the cutoff, which is 39000 a year for a family of three, but still struggling to make ends meet, who need that assistance. And sometimes the families are scraping together the money for school meals at the expense of other needs, and sometimes they're not providing it and kids are picking up a bag of chips at the corner store making do. We want to include these students in school lunch. The second group that I'm particularly concerned about are, are immigrant children, children in immigrant families. Many of them are, in fact, income eligible, but for many reasons in this uh, context of anxiety and in some cases terror that the new administration in Washington has unleashed in the immigrant communities, parents are wary of filling out forms that give information to the government. And so many immigrant 
children who are income eligible for free meals are not receiving them. That's another group who would be drawn in and enormously helped by universal free school meals. And the third group are students who are failing to participate even though they are income eligible because of the stigma that has become attached to school food. Um, you have the rest of my argument in my testimony and I hope you'll take a look at it. But I just want to say the council has been supportive of this year after year, but somehow or other at the point of the budget negotiating process, it didn't stick. And this is the year you gotta make it stick. Well, I hope you see as you've been sitting through the testimony why some of the things don't, because it's a lot of priorities that we're trying to get through here. But thank you very much for your testimony. It was in our budget response. We're still very much interested in making this happen. I know that you have um, your, your testimony today before we'll call up the next panel. But you may begin. Hi, my name is Pam Stewart Martinez. Um, I'm a mom of seven, first and foremost. Um, I'm on the Citywide Council for Special Education. I'm also on the ECC, and I am a parent member of Lunch for Learning. And the reason I'm here today is first and foremost, I wanna thank you, um, Chair, and um, all the other council members for your continued support in prioritizing um, universal um, school meals. Um, I appreciate your efforts in, in trying to push that through. Um, I, I believe that you've heard me speak before. I am a product of the New York City Public Schools from grade, um, I would say first grade all the way to nine. And I have children who attend public schools in New York City. So um, to me, this is very important. Um, to the people that I represent on the Citywide Council for Special Education and just the parents in general that I come in contact with, it's very important that we hopefully make this a priority this year and make it happen for a multitude of reasons that were just expressed just now. In my neighborhood, there's a variety of families there from different backgrounds, and a lot of them are afraid and have approached me about it, being afraid to fill out forms. Forms that they told, they're, they're being told it's safe for them to fill out, but they don't wanna take that chance. Um, also, there are families like myself. We are well above the income level but because I have added expenses that aren't taken into account, prime example, my daughter just graduated from Spelman, I am $160,000 in debt for college. <laughs> I understand. And then I have another son who has two more years of college and the debt is adding up there. And then I have, I told you I have seven children. So I have more who are going to college. I'm not sure how I'm gonna pay that off, but even though I don't qualify for it because I don't meet the guidelines, there are a lot of families that are in the same boat as me trying to figure out how to make it work. So um, I hope we can work something out this year and thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I know you got here at 10 o'clock in the morning, so I appreciate you sticking around and, and, and adding your contribution to this um, for the record. You know how, where I am with the food pantry. I think you should have free feminine hygiene products, but that's a whole other campaign. Um, and when it comes to middle school lunches, as I said, this is something that's been important to this council. Uh, and in reality, just for, for an update, we asked this of Chairwoman Farina, of Chancellor Farina, and you know, she said that she didn't really see an increase or a difference in young people um, getting more lunch. So. You know, I beg to differ, and that's what we were here for. So I just want you to know that sometimes because things don't make it on the budget isn't because we're not pushing. It's the pushback that we're getting. So we got to just keep pushing, and, and I think we're going to get there. So thank you. I don't know if members have anything to add. We can call up the next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Yes. And the panel after this will be uh, Jessica Andrade from Make the Road, Carlos Pula. Um, make the road, Ca Carlos Puja, um, and oh, Sien Siena, Siena, come on up, Siena. What's your last name? Fontaine, Siena Fontaine. So just sit on this first row so that you're ready um, when the when this panel is done.
thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity when you got your emoji. I look forward to your parents for your parents for your education. We are a parents and to get an advocate to advocate to work for more inclusive, inclusive opportunities for kids with disabilities in our school system. We've been doing a lot of work this year with the Department of Education and other advocates on increasing the number of accessible schools for kids with physical disabilities in the, in the city school system. We all agree that, our, that all students deserve equal opportunity to, to, to education. And to the fact, we know that DOE has implemented a school choice structure for all students at all levels to have choices and opportunities. But these choices are not available to all students. Kids with, with physical disabilities do not have an equal opportunity to choose their schools. We know that the city council has been asking a lot of questions on this issue recently over the budget proceedings, and we applaud the we applaud the efforts. But we are here to testify to uh, to implore you more additional funds for the increased accessibility of schools in the city. You know, there are so few fully accessible schools in New York City. And then there are partially and functionally accessible schools that are just not up to par for the kids who need fully accessible schools. Their their ramps, their their doors, their bathrooms, kids in wheelchairs cannot access these schools. So again, I'm gonna be really sure I'll be finished to implore you to increase the funding being given to the DOE on, on the effort. I know the DOE is doing a lot of work on the issue. We will for that. But the end of the day, they need the money to, do, to, to make the, the renovations and to build the schools. And they need your help to give them that money. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Maggie Morf, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Arise Coalition, a coalition of parents, advocates, educators, and academics that push for systemic reform. I'm gonna pick up where Jackie left off um, and talk a little bit more about accessibility in New York City public schools. New York City lacks a sufficient number of accessible schools at every level. There are six, um, six of the city's community school districts have no full, fully accessible elementary schools, seven have no fully accessible middle schools, and nine have no fully accessible high schools. So given the dearth of fully accessible schools, the DOE relies instead on something called partially accessible schools, and those are schools that offer students access to some, but not all of the building. Um, that doesn't work for many children. Some of those schools have limited elevator access, others have cafeterias, science labs, auditoriums, libraries, nurses' offices. Um, and other key school spaces that aren't designed to accommodate students who use wheelchairs. Arise members have been working with the city um, for about a year now to discuss increasing accessible options and ensuring that families have more information in this process. And we've seen movement, I want to acknowledge that, but it is slow and it is insufficiently funded. The 2015 to 19 capital plan allocates $100 million for improving school accessibility. That translates to major improvements in about 17 school buildings over the course of five years, and that money has already been spent. Um, spending for school accessibility represents less than 1% of the capital plan. It's really a very small amount, and the city quite simply needs to invest more to improve school accessibility on a shorter timeline. So at a minimum, what we're recommending is that the city double its funding to making schools accessible um, that money could be used for major, major capital improvements to another 15 to 17 buildings, as well as for smaller renovations, I'm almost done, I promise, to improve accessibility at other schools um, identified by both families and the system. 
While I have your attention, I just wanted to thank the City Council for recommending additional funding for improving accessibility in its response to the Mayor's preliminary budget, and we look forward to continuing to work together. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Randy Levine, and I'm Policy Director at Advocates for Children of New York. AFC works to ensure a high-quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low-income backgrounds. We're pleased that the executive budget includes increased funding for several important education initiatives. I'm going to use my limited time today to focus on a few issues that were not adequately addressed in the executive budget and that we urge you to prioritize. First, Department of Education supports for students living in shelters. We were relieved that the administration restored $10.3 million for Department of Education supports for students living in shelters in the executive budget, and we're grateful for the council support in that effort. Among other supports, this funding will provide after-school literacy programs at shelters and will allow 43 DOE social workers to work in elementary schools with high populations of students living in shelters. Unfortunately, this funding is one-year funding that is not baselined, Furthermore, given that more than 150 schools serve a population in which 10% or more of the students live in shelters, <coughs> funding for 43 social workers is insufficient. We ask you to negotiate a final budget that baselines the $10.3 million to ensure continuity of the support and add $6.2 million to bring the total number of DOE social workers for students living in shelters to 100. Second, school climate. We're grateful to the City Council for funding the Restorative Justices, Justice Practices Pilot Program in the FY 2016 and 2017 budgets. This has shown impressive results, and we're asking that you continue this program and expand it. We're requesting $5 million in FY 2018 for this initiative, which would allow us to continue restorative practices in the first 25 schools funded by the council and add an additional 25 schools. Finally, I wanna echo my colleagues in thanking the council for including school accessibility in your response to the preliminary budget and urge you to work on getting increased funding for school accessibility in the final budget. We have additional recommendations in our written testimony, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for uh, thank you for this hearing. Uh, my name is Ruth Wanger, and I'm a, um, assistant prof adjunct assistant professor of anthropology at Lehman. I just gave my last my last final this morning. Uh, I know the our union, the professional staff Congress, talks with the city council. I know the chancellor and the vice chancellor talk with the city council. I'd like to talk. Uh, from a different point of view, which is the students and the underpaid faculty, which are absolutely essential, which are going, all of this activity is going on all the time, and nobody seems to be paying attention to a really serious problem at City University, and that is that for years now, and the plan seems to be to keep doing it, is uh, they're staffing the classrooms on the cheap. You would never staff a firehouse with half temps and yet there seems to be the assumption that you can just reach out into the talent pool that is New York City and bring in a teacher at the last minute and they're gonna be just fine. They gotta learn the ropes, They've, they get no in-service training, uh, it's an insecure position and it's highly underpaid. I have a PhD, lots of years of experience. I'm supposedly good. I'm on the uh, faculty senate and the university faculty senate. I'm active in the union. How much do you think I made last year? I taught a two-thirds full-time level, if you compare me with a doctoral lecturer with my experience, or a three-fourths of a full-time load compared with an uh, assistant professor of my experience. What do you think I made? I'll tell you. $27,038.94. That's less than half. Um, council member Rosenthal in, our, in a committee meeting talked to Vice Chancellor Sapienza about comparing administrative with faculty salaries. Is it two to one, is it four to one? Well, how about if we put the, the bigger half of the faculty into those equations? What are we talking about? 10 to one, four to one, six to one? It's, people know we're underpaid. We want 7,000, we want it now. 
This can't keep going on like this. Uh, you're giving us a cent from the 2018 dollar, and I'm just listening to all these things, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> I made $27,000, and I have a little Social Security. Give the food to the children. On the other hand, something's got to be done about this, because to hold this university together like this with duct tape is ridiculous. Something's got to be done. And uh, maybe you can make a law or something if you can't find the money. Okay. Well, thank you very much for testifying. And, you know, we have to feed the children. We have to do all these things. But the children end up being adults, and they need to go to college with wonderfully um, qualified professors. So and we, supported. We, I, and supported, of course. So we thank you for your testimony. And it's equally as important as everyone else and everyone else that still has to testify. So thank you. Thank you. So don't guilt trip each other to think that you have to, you know. <laughs> Everyone can ask. This is the time to ask. <laughs> Next panel, after this one. Come on up, make the road. ¿Alguien necesita un traductor? You, okay, you're translating. Okay, very good. The panel after this one will be Nancy Rankin, uh, Carlin Cowan, Stephanie Gendel, Faith uh, Behem, Gregory Brader, and Christopher Hanway. I saw someone cheering like they won the lotto when they heard their name. Come on up. <laughs> Come on down. Good afternoon, I'm Jessica Andrade, and I work as a total education program administrator at uh, Make the Road New York. With over 20,000 members, Make the Road New York is the largest grassroots immigrant organization in the New York City, working to build the power of Latino and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice. Based on the experience of people in the communities we serve, we ask the council baseline $12 million in fiscal year 2018 so that thousands of immigrants can continue to learn English and access economic opportunity. Literacy and basic skills are 100% necessary because it is connected to everything, employment and economic mobility, school performance, health, information, community safety. Uh, the Council must stay strong and promote adult literacy as a Council priority because Mayor de Blasio did not include the $12 million, um, in funding in his last executive budget uh, release. On behalf of our students, I urge you to defend and protect adult literacy in your negotiations with Major Office. I studied English myself when I came here from Ecuador, and I know how challenging learning English is and how important. I went on to college and got a job at Make the Road. Both were things that would have been impossible without English. I now do intake testing and program administration of English and citizenship preparation classes at Make the Road New York. I get to know the students and their hopes and dreams, place, place them in classes and help them to connect to other services. Over the last three weeks, I was very inspired to see over 1,000 immigrant students coming together in Brooklyn, Queens, and this Monday in the Bronx for press conference highlighting the tremendous need for adult literacy services in our communities. The ener energy at this event has been incredible. Students know that they are fighting for their futures. We are counting on the city council and the mayor to put education for New Yorkers of all ages and backgrounds first. In this fiscal year 2018, budget we need you to baseline 12 million in funding to community based organizations like ours who provide critical adult literacy services. Thank you for your support. Buenas tardes, yo me llamo Carlos Puya y soy el miembro de Hace Camino a Nueva York. Soy ecuatoriano, he vivido en el área de Brooklyn más de 15 años. Nunca he tenido un acceso de seguro médico y salud. Aproximadamente dos años me he enfermado, perdí el, mi trabajo y no he podido trabajar desde entonces. Ha sido una gran lucha estos últimos dos años y he sido inundado por una deuda médica grande. En mi comunidad muchos de nosotros tenemos miedo de buscar atención médica 
o ir a una sala de emergencia para recibir tratamiento debido a altas facturas médicas y nuestra incapacidad para pagar como resultado de muchos de nosotros sufrimos en silencio. Sin embargo, los merecemos el acceso de, de servicios de salud accesible y el derecho a una vida sana. Fui contactado con un promotora de, de ese camino de Nueva York que me informó sobre los servicios de la, de la organización y de la que me podría beneficiar el día siguiente. Me encontré con un navegador que me ayudó a inscribirme en el Medicaid de emergencia. Me fui capaz de, de cubrir algunas de mis recientes facturas médicas. Entonces me fui referido en un defensor de, de la salud de ese camino a Nueva York que me trajo conmigo para reducir mi deuda médica y me ayudó a obtener servicios de salud en una escala móvil en mi centro local de salud, el hospital y otras clínicas bajo de costo. Esto me, me, ha, me ha perdido aliviar el estrés y, y, y ha, ha causado la deuda médica, pero la asistencia no detuvo allí. También me informaron sobre el, la despensa de alimentos en fin de acceder la comida que pudo recoger enlatados y despensa inmediato para ayudarme a través de, de estos tiempos financieros difíciles. Más, más tarde me convertí en voluntario de la despensa de alimentos porque me informó dar gracias a apoyar a la comunidad. Estoy agradecido por toda la ayuda y orientación que hace camino Nueva York ha podido ofrecerme en el tiempo tan difícil debido a, a la iniciativa del ayuntamiento como Access, Access Health NIC, la iniciativa de la salud de los inmigrantes y la, y la financiación de EFAP para despensas de alimentos que me permiten hacer en ese, ese camino en Nueva York. Llegué los, llegué los miembros a nuestra comunidad proponiendo estos servicios esenciales. Gracias. Hi, I'm going to translate. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Puya, and I'm a member of Make the Road New York. I am Ecuadorian, and I have lived in the area of Brooklyn for over 15 years. I have never had access to health insurance. About two years ago, I became sick, lost my job, and have been unable to work since then. It has been a great struggle these past two years, and I have been overwhelmed by large medical debt. In my community, many of us are scared to seek medical care or go to an emergency room for treatment because of high medical bills and our inability to pay. As a result, many of us suffer in silence. However, we, are, we deserve access to affordable health services and the right to a healthy life. I was approached by Promotora from Make the Road New York who informed me about services at the organization which I could benefit from. The next day, I met with a navigator who helped me enroll into emergency Medicaid, which was able to cover some of my recent medical bills. I was then referred to a health advocate at Make the Road who helped me with the rest of my medical bills and helped me obtain health services on a sliding scale. I was also informed about the food pantry in order to access food and was able to pick up produce and canned goods from the pantry right away to help me through these tough financial times. Later on, I became a volunteer at the food pantry because it was a way for me to give thanks and support the community. I am thankful for all the assistance, help, and guidance that Make the Road was able to offer in such tough times, and it is because of the City Council initiatives like Access Health NYC, the Immigrant Health Initiative, and EFAP funding for food pantries that allow Make the Road New York to reach community members and provide these essential services. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Sienna Fontaine. I'm the Deputy Legal Director at Make the Road New York. Um, thanks to Committee Chair Ferris Copeland and the Committee for allowing Make the Road to testify today. Um, the Council has demonstrated impressive leadership in building safe and inclusive communities uh, for immigrant New Yorkers, but there's more to be done. We urge support for these key initiatives in the fiscal year 18 budget. You have an, ex an extensive list of recommendations in front of you, um, including critical asks for adult literacy funding, restorative justice in schools, and access to legal representation and housing to prevent displacement, key things that support immigrant communities and communities of color. 
I want to highlight a few other things. Um, as you heard earlier, New York City should baseline and expand funding for the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, or NIFUP, to $12 million for the coming year. NIFUP has provided critical legal services to indigent immigrants facing deportation. We urge the city to fund this program at $12 million and without any limitations um, based on criminal history. Second, uh, the city should expand resources to the Immigrant Opportunity Initiatives, or IOI. These initiatives fund legal services for immigrants, more critical now under this current federal administration's heightened enforcement regime. We urge the city to continue funding for this program. The city should baseline the eye care initiative at $3.8 million to ensure the representation of unaccompanied minors fleeing violence in their home countries. There's a deep moral urgency to ensure that these young people have access to legal representation. Um, and as part of the earlier discussion in the earlier session, New York City should create a fund to support legal permanent residence efforts to naturalize with an initial level of 20.7 million. Many LPRs are ready to obtain citizenship, but the $725 fee is simply too costly for them. Lastly, we request your support for one million in city council funding for the rapid response raids initiative. The proposed initiative would involve a citywide network of six to 10 volunteer coordinators who would use a make the road develop protocol to respond to ICE raids in real time, confirming activity, coordinating with city government, and working directly with affected families. As panic has grown in our immigrant community since January 20th, we hope the council will provide this kind of crucial support in this important moment. Um, um, and that's it. I just want to say that New York City has led the way and should continue to lead the way um, with the most forward-thinking and strongest pro-immigrant policies. So thank you very much. The panel after this one will be Brad Grimm, Scott Daly, Lisa Caswell, Rebecca Balin, and Patrick Cannell. And we've been joined by council members Chin, Rodriguez, and Gibson. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Nancy Rankin. I'm vice president for policy research and advocacy for the Community Service Society of New York a nonprofit organization that works to advance upward mobility for low-income New Yorkers. First, I would like to thank the Council for its leadership on fair fares, um, in particular Council Member Rodriguez for your extraordinary leadership, Council Members Chin and Gibson, we appreciate your support. By including $50 million in the Council's response to Mayor de Blasio's proposed executive budget, the Council stepped up on behalf of the lowest income New Yorkers who struggle daily to afford subways and buses. That $50 million could be used in fiscal 18 to phase in half-price metro cards, starting with city residents in deep poverty and greatest need. We urge you to make funding for fair fares a priority as negotiations proceed on the final budget agreement. Fair fares has widespread support, 40 of the 51 council members for the five borough presidents, the public advocate, controller Stringer, uh, editorial support from the Times, Daily News, El Diario, City and State, the Amsterdam News, um, Mayor de Blasio stands virtually alone in his opposition. He's called the proposal for half fare discounts a noble idea, but said paying for it should be the state's responsibility since the governor controls the MTA. Here's why we disagree. First, fair fares is a subsidy for the poor of New York City, not for the MTA. Second, According to the mayor's own poverty report put out just last week, commuting costs, more so even than payroll taxes and childcare expenses, are pushing workers into poverty. 
Third, affordable fares combine with fair evasion policing to criminalize poverty. Fourth, fair fares is a women's issue. 41% of single mothers with children live in poverty in our city. Fair fares is one of the few things we can actually achieve locally. The, power, the mayor has the power to do it and immediately to address income inequality in a real, tangible way. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Gundell. I'm the Associate Executive Director at Citizens Committee for Children. Our full testimony includes the areas of the executive budget we support and a longer list of things we'd like to see in the adopted budget. I just want to highlight some of our largest concerns. One is that we feel like the budget needs to go further to help homeless children and families in shelters, particularly those in hotels who currently don't have access to many of the things that would make for an appropriate placement like laundry, food, um, places for recreation and socialization, et cetera. Um, we're also concerned that these, uh, that families in shelter, the um, staff that help these families um, with issues related to school don't currently work in the evenings or in the summertime and we need to um, ensure families have access to assistance year round. Um, and we also support the ask for more social workers in schools. We were really disappointed to see that there's $16 million of elementary after school programs, 6,600 children with one year funding that's not continued in the upcoming year. We actually need to see these programs extended, um, expanded. We were, while we were happy to see that the mayor included funding so that we didn't stand on the city hall steps in an election year to bring back summer programs for children, we need to see that money baseline so that we're not back next year. We also need um, to see universal lunch for all children. We just released a report in the past few weeks that show there are about 110,000 children who are low income but not eligible um, under the federal guidelines whose families struggle to pay for lunch. The chancellor's response that the children can walk, the elementary school seven-year-old children can walk up to the counter and say they can't afford the lunch is not an acceptable um, way to resolve this issue. Finally, we support the 2020, $22 million ask for emergency food and our colleagues in all of the human services agencies who are in desperate need of a 12% rate increase. Um, we support that. My organization does not accept government money, so it's really for our colleagues. Thank you, and thank you for being such great partners. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Ferreras Copeland. Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Rodriguez, and the other members and staff of the New York City Council Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again today. My name is Chris Hanway, and I represent Jacob A. Reese Neighborhood Settlement, a 127-year-old community-based organization serving the children, youth, seniors, and families of Western Queens, many of whom are low-income and or immigrants, and the majority of whom are residents of public housing. I'm here today to join my colleagues by asking that the City Council support the Sustain Our Sanctuary campaign by urging the administration to make a kit commitment to a 10% investment in the human services sector over the next three years. A baseline investment of 2% in fiscal year 2018 at a cost of 20 million and a 4% in each of the next two fiscal years for a total of 100 million by 2020 will go a long way toward relieving the chronic underfunding of nonprofits through insufficient contracts that put our long-term solvency and sustainability in jeopardy. This year in the executive budget, the administration included a 6% cost of living adjustment over the next three years. While we are greatly appreciative of this uh, movement in the right direction, it's not nearly enough to stabilize the sector. Many of these programs that serve our communities are chronically underfunded and the effects are becoming more and more evident. At resettlement, this situation has had significant consequences on the individuals and families we serve. We provide after school, summer camps, violence prevention, job and college readiness uh, to children and youth. We allow older adults to age in place and we work with immigrants from around the world through over 20 city contracts from five different agencies. But as I explained back in March, the chronic gaps in funding and lack of cost escalators in these contracts have forced us to take numerous actions, including holding back on hiring, holding back on vital infrastructure support, and offering fewer English language cl classes. Additionally, we are now in the place where we are really carefully looking at all contracts 
that offer insufficient rates and really deciding on whether we can even take these contracts or turn them back. And basically that means we're serving fewer folks in the communities that need us. The residents of public housing need us. If we were to close our doors or cut back, there would be hundreds if not thousands of individuals without services. I thank you for your time today. Good afternoon. My name is Faith Bayham. I am an advocacy and policy advisor in the Government and External Relations Department at UJA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 18 executive budget. First and foremost, I'm going to echo our colleagues in the human services sector and ask that the City Council urge the administration to commit to a 10% investment in the human services sector over the next three years. We acknowledge the Council's call this year for a comprehensive review of human service contract prices and an overhaul of the structure of human service contracts. This review must be accompanied by a flexible increase to all human services contracts in order to make the system truly fair and sustainable. We support proposals to fund security training or improvements at vulnerable institutions. The recent wave of bomb threats targeting our JCCs and community providers are a source of deep concern for their clients, their staff, and our community more broadly. UJA community program partners and JCCs are committed to providing safe, welcoming, and high-quality services to their communities. Identifying and addressing additional security needs is critical to delivering on this promise. With additional funding to enhance security, our nonprofit partners will be more effectively able to provide these critical services to all New Yorkers. Lastly, we ask that the Council continue their support of the Holocaust Survivor Initiative by investing $2.5 million in fiscal year 18. Many of our nonprofit partners receive initiative grants to provide specialized programming and comprehensive services for Holocaust survivors. These, ser these services include food delivery when individuals run out of SNAP benefits, information and referral services, social pro programming, and thousands of congregate meals. Many of the individuals served with this funding are frail, isolated, and living in poverty, and without these services would have even less connection to the communities they live in. As our nonprofit partners continue to care for this last generation of survivors, we urge the Council to maintain its support for this important initiative. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. And uh, Chair Ferris Copeland, um, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Rodriguez, Councilmember Chin, thank you so much for staying and, and listening to all of us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm from United Neighborhood Houses, and we are New York City's Federation of Settlement Houses. You've already heard from a couple of our member agencies, including from uh, Chris Hanway at Jacob Resettlement, as well as from folks at the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation and CAMBA, who all testified today. Um, we're really grateful for the Council's partnership over many years in working to preserve and expand core services for our communities. This year we really need to work on two things, both doing that, expanding and preserving our core services, but also making sure we stabilize the very nonprofits, the organizations that are responsible for providing these services. Therefore, we join with uh, many others you've heard today um, in support of the campaign to get a 10% investment in the human service sector over the next three years. This includes a baseline investment of 2% in, in city fiscal year 2018 at a cost of $20 million, and a 4% increase in the following two fiscal years for a total of $100 million by fiscal year 2020. This is about something that will help right-size contracts and ultimately strengthen the capacity of the human service sector to improve the lives of all New Yorkers. We've already seen some of the impacts of not having the sector uh, fully funded. Um, in DIFTA funded naturally occurring retirement communities are struggling to meet the requirements of providing nursing services three days per week. Providers of home delivered meals for older adults are struggling to find the number of staff necessary to live, deliver the required numbers of meals in their service areas. Adult literacy programs have not been able to have full-time teachers and are relying instead on a patchwork of part-time staff, which prevents the programs from retaining experienced educators. Uh, After-school programs have assigned a single education director to cover programs at five or more sites all throughout a borough. Um, all these sorts of things, oh, did I already run out of time? Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, to, to wrap up, we have a long list of programs that also the Council has supported over many years uh, where we both need the investment in human service providers themselves, 
but also the restorations of core services for things like older adults, um, adult literacy programs, after school programs, where really the core of these programs often depends, as it shouldn't, but, but does, on the work of the City Council. And thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm a policy analyst at FPWA. I'd like to thank Chair Ferreris Copeland and the other members of the Council Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify today. FPWA strives to build a city of equal opportunity, and in order to fulfill these goals, we encourage the City Council to fund several initiatives that support upward mobility for New Yorkers. First, FPWA envisions New York City as a place where we can all safely remain in our homes and continue to contribute to our communities as we age. It's critical for the city to plan for and invest in building up safety net services as the number of people aged 65 and older rises. Instead, funding for DIFTA remains just 2% of the city's spending on human services. We ask that the city commit to fully funding services for older adults with 15.7 million to baseline discretionary funding for core services and 44.9 million to fill in the gaps in current programs. Second, as New York City declares itself a sanctuary in response to a climate of xenophobia from the federal government, we must ensure that the city of immigrants remains a safe haven for all of our residents. Sanctuary should mean safety not just at home, but also in the workplace. This means that while the city increases its investment in legal services for immigrant communities, it should also make proportional investments in programs that connect all immigrants to services that allow them to achieve economic advancement. There are two programs that we urge the council to fund, enhancing the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative to 3.2 million in FY18, and enhancing the Day Labor Workforce Initiative to 1.8 million in FY18. Third, in order to be able to save equal opportunity, we must reduce health disparities by ensuring that all New Yorkers have health care access and coverage, and that targeted programs and policies are in place to address health crises that have disproportionately impacted low-income and disenfranchised communities. For this reason, we recommend that the City Council provide an enhancement to the Access Health NYC initiative to $5 million in the FY18 budget. Lastly, we ask the Council and the Mayor to commit to shoring up human services, and I echo the ask that the rest of my colleagues have made. Thank you for the consideration and the opportunity to testify. That was right on time, yes. <laughs> well, you know, our lack of questioning is not because we don't believe in what you're doing, it's because we're your advocates, and we agree. So thank you so much, but we need to get these things on the record, so we appreciate you coming today. Um, thank you, come on board, and um, my council will read the next panel. The panel after this one will be Emily Skydell, Cherise Crowther, Heather Woodfield, Carl Goodman, Veronica Conant, and Brian Rogers. Good evening. My name is Brad Grimm, and on behalf of the board and staff of the Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation, I would like to thank the Council for its steadfast support of our mission and to urge your support of our fiscal year 18 citywide funding request of $1,325,000. With the Council's support, we have become the largest provider of free school-based after-school and summer programming in New York City, serving over 20,000 young people, 12,000 with Council funds, a year operating in almost every council district in the city. SASF programs offer a wide variety of educational enrichment activities, counseling services for children and families, parent engagement, college and career readiness, STEM activities, and a wide array of sports and arts activities. In fiscal year 17, SASF received $1 million under the council's after school enrichment initiative. With this funding, SASF successfully launched 110 summer camps in 2016, serving over 8,000 students in 41 council districts. Fiscal year 17 funding also supported our weekend sports and wellness and sports leagues, serving over 4,000 students in 72 elementary and middle schools. Strongly driven by issues of social justice for the children of our great city, the mission of SASF is to help bridge the academic performance and opportunity gap among underachieving students the overwhelming majority of whom are black and Hispanic youth from the highest poverty neighborhoods in the city. SASF Council, SASF Council funded programs operate in almost every council district. With the council as its partner, SASF's programs are successfully addressing this gap 
and the huge inequalities of educational opportunities by providing New York City youth of all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds with after-school and summer sports, arts, and educational programming. This year, children and immigrant families are especially fearful. Threats of deportation have created levels of worry and anxiety in young people not seen before. SASF City Council summer camps and its after-school programs are and always have been safe havens. Now more than ever, it's necessary. And in conclusion, in order for SASF's free programs to operate this summer and next school year, um, we need to enable SASF to keep up with rising fees as well as rising personnel and equipment costs. Two, allow SASF to meet the requirements of our $325,000 challenge grant from the Charles Hayden Foundation, and three, allow more youth to receive summer programming through the creation of 10 additional SASF summer camps. So in conclusion, on behalf of the over 12,000 students and 9,000 families who receive free after-school and summer programs as a direct result of your funding, I thank you for the Council's longstanding support of SASF and our mission. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Mike, how's that? Is that better? No. There we go. Now, how's that? Is that better? There you go. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Council members, and staff of the Finance Committee. My name is Scott Daly, and I am the director of the New York Junior Tennis and Learnings, also known as New York Junior Tennis League, NYJTL's free tennis programs throughout the city of New York. We meet the needs of the kids of the city of New York. I'm not going to be reading from my testimony. Everybody has it up there. I just want to highlight certain areas that uh, I feel are vital to what we do. We're almost 50 years old. We change lives on a lot of kids throughout the city of New York in neighborhoods where they would never be exposed to this sport. We give them a safe haven. This could not be done without the continued support of the city council. We are in all five boroughs. We are in all 51 council districts. Last year, we serviced 88 separate programs on the free community tennis. In addition to that, we bring our tennis programs into the school system. We teach the gym teachers how to expose these kids to that. Over 250 teachers have partaken in this during the past year. Everybody is accepted, nobody's rejected. We take special populations and during the summer, all District 75 schools are invited to come to one of our locations. Character, self-esteem, value of sports, safe havens, these are all catchwords, but they are real. You see it out there. About 10 years ago, our funding was cut. We are grateful for what we received, but we have maintained that somehow with smoke and mirrors. We have asked the council this year to increase us back to the levels of 2008 to $1.2 million. We employ many people throughout the city of New York. We have basically an auxiliary summer youth employment program. We hire the kids that play with us who come up through our system. In closing, I just want to say tennis is the hook, but there's so much more we do to, for them. On behalf of all the kids, the teens, and the parents of the City of New York, I want to thank the Council for its long-standing support of NYJTL. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Caswell. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for the Daycare Council. I want to just thank the members of the City Council for your steadfast support of our membership in the last few years in particular. Um, we have a 60-year history going back to World War II. We do labor and mediation. We have a professional training institute, policy, policy and advocacy. Uh, we have an employment initiative. We have over 100 members providing over early childhood education programs in uh, 200 centers across the city. I just want to state right off the bat our, our serious support for the Sustain Our Sanctuaries uh, campaign. M many of our members are couched in nonprofits that are heavily impacted by this. Uh, so I want to just talk about two things in particular. Um, to be clear and put ourselves on the record, we strongly support the mayor's effort to expand UPK to three-year-olds, but we are stating our support based on a conditional 
uh, evidence of his ability to actually address the problems that are continuing with the nonprofit sector. And so I'm just going to read basically from two paragraphs related to that uh, because we have some serious problems in terms of maintaining staff and we have some facilities problems. Um, we represent our membership in collective bargaining with two unions, the Council of Supervisors and Administrators and District, District Council 1707. Although we spent a year negotiating with the city administration for salary parity for our members certified teachers, we were not awarded increases that matched the Department of Education's starting salaries or longevity steps. We were able to make changes that led to more affordable health care benefits and receive funding for a career ladder scholarship fund. Unfortunately, the mayor's recently announced 3K for All initiative will make it harder for nonprofits to hold on to their state certified teachers. Difficulties in hiring or retaining certified teachers also impacts our members' ability to maintain operations at full capacity. I'm sure you're aware of the difficulty of maintaining funding for child care right now. Every seat is costing us a lot of energy. If you can't roll out a classroom because you don't have staff, you have a real problem in terms of sustainability. Right now, the whole system is at 88% capacity, and it would be a tragedy to continue with this problem if it's related to maintaining staff. Um, from the standpoint of facilities, uh, many of our programs are in NYCHA buildings. You're aware of the federal cuts. They're fined regularly by, de by the Department of Health. Um, we want to state our strong support for consideration with regards to facilities, particularly looking at what was proposed by the Comptroller in terms of city-owned facilities. Where, where could we build buildings that had child care on the ground floor? Right. What is it that is contributing to the Can fact you that many of just our wrap up? <laughs> yeah, many of our programs are operating with year-to-year -year leases right yes. now. Yes, 28 out of 72, which is not a sustainable situation. Yeah. So, um, and then lastly, just we all these programs need to run a full day, um, Thank and you. they need to run all year. And that's Thank an you. issue that needs to be addressed. We Sorry really appreciate it. No, we understand, and thank you for getting on the record. Yep. I just wanted to say, when I was the Beacon director, there was no, no better call than when you got a, a call from your agency to say we're going to provide you with sports equipment. Um, so you not only just help providing the after-school programming, but the organizations you partner with are so important. And the same for uh, the New York Junior Tennis League. Even though the U.S. Open is in my district, <laughs> the young people really learn from the New York Junior Tennis League. So thank you very much for your testimony. It is greatly appreciated. I mean, while the next panel makes its way up, I just wanted to publicly say that my mother just told me to spit out my gum. She saw me chewing gum. <laughs> so, Mom, I've done it. I know you're watching somewhere. It's in the garbage. Thank you. <laughs> So if you think we're not real or that we don't have mothers, that <laughs> we do. Thank you so much. And who, which is the next panel? The panel after this, which will be our last panel, um, will be uh, Jin Kui, Shamshir Sandu, Johnny Zhang, Evan Phillips, Daniel Kim, uh, Ksenia Novakova, Liz Aklis, and Judy Luong. Hi, thank you for holding this meeting. My name is Emily, um, and I'm a campaign organizer from NYPIRG, the student directed, largest student directed um, nonpartisan organization in the state of New York, representing students from across campuses um, across the city. Um, New York City's budget provides a really an important opportunity for the city council to make critical investments in programs that support economic and social justice and enhance skills to boost civic understanding. Higher education and mass transportation systems are, are key equalizers. Uh, a college-educated workforce nurtures the growth of New York's economy and helps stimulate civic participation, both of which boost individuals' prosperity. Um, to start, CUNY's opportunity programs have a steady track record of success in increasing graduation rates among at-risk students. College Discovery, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Creative Art Teams, 
Arts Team, Dominican Studies Institute, Murphy Institute, Center for Worker Education, ASAP, and many other programs help city students overcome the financial and academic obstacles of completing a college education. More than just tuition coverage, many of these programs take a comprehensive approach to college access and affordability by building in academic counseling, mentoring, and coverage of related costs such as free metro cards, textbooks, and childcare. This approach works and increases graduation rates. We urge the city council to increase funding for opportunity programs, which are really a, a great answer for our, our question around free college in New York State. Um, and CUNY's Citizenship Now program provides much needed immigration legal services. We urge the council to support CUNY's request of $4 million, $2 million to keep this service going strong, and an additional $2 million to meet the growing demand from communities facing new threats throughout New York City. With private daycare centers as well charging upwards of $200,000 a year, the university's campus child care services provide New York City parents with the opportunities to pursue a college degree. It's essential, it's essential that the City Council includes CUNY's request for an additional 5000 for child care services in its final budget. Um, lastly, I just want to mention the importance of the Fair Fairs campaign for college students across CUNY. Um, it is really, really critical that college students are not choosing between a Metro card um, and paying for a meal. So please, um, we thank you for providing this opportunity for us to share our thoughts on higher education and mass transportation in New York on behalf of New York's college students. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Chair Ferris Copeland and other members of the City Council. My name is Sharice Crowther and I am the Strategic Partnership Specialist at the Center for Court Innovation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The Center for Court Innovation was grateful for the Council's recommendation to baseline CCI at 500000 for City Fiscal Year 2018. As the Council is aware, the Center for Core Innovation is seeking a total of 700000 which includes an enhancement of $200,000. This funding will support all going course, core operations and communities around the city and expand alternatives to incarceration for vulnerable New Yorkers in several key neighborhoods. The Center has created 28 community and court-based projects spanning all five boroughs, serving nearly 60,000 New Yorkers annually, including immigrants, the poor, young people, women, the LGB, LGBTQ community, and communities of color. With more funding, the Center would be able to grow its programs and benefit even more New Yorkers. The Center provides young people across, the, across New York City with opportunities to avoid Rikers Island and in many cases a trip to court. Through its adolescent and young adult diversion courts across the city, the Center provides judges and prosecutors and police with meaningful alternatives to business as usual. These, this includes linking individuals to counseling, tutoring, and community benefit projects. We currently serve thousands of young people each year through programs such as these. With council support, we can serve hundreds more. In addition to helping divert New Yorkers out of the justice system, we are working to help people transition back into the community after spending time behind bars. One such project is the Harlem Community Justice Center in Manhattan, which provides hundreds of individuals who are released from prison each year. Council support will allow us to increase the number of individuals served by 30%. Um, lastly, I just want to say that the City Council support has been invaluable to the success of the center, and we look forward to continuing to work with you um, particularly as you push forward legislation regarding Raise the Age and the Criminal Justice Reform Act and bail reform. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm, I'm Veronica Conant, a retired academic librarian, member of the Committee to Save the New York Public Library, and past president of the West 5455 Seed Book Association, speaking in my own name. I strongly support budget increases for all three library systems. I agree libraries today are more important than ever before. Um, I have a couple of concerns about the New York Public Library, relating to the New York Public Library, uh, mo uh, particularly about the research libraries. Why is the New York Public Library outsourcing both its unique research collection and library jobs, moving millions of research items to an off-site storage facility shared with Princeton and Columbia at Recap in Princeton, New Jersey, 50 miles from New York City? As of July 16, uh, 
there were 5.2 million research items there, and the problem is that now uh, this consortium, this arrange, they want to make the arrangement permanent and not return the millions of research items remorded in 2013 from the 42nd Street book stacks. Um, access to the off-site collection has been taking too long since 2013 and is fully organized and is causing research and researchers severe problems. Uh, the stacks are empty and would need 46 to 47 million dollar one-time expense to upgrade the existing HVAC and sprinkler system. That is all it would need and then uh, it could, they could be returned. Now due to the outsourcing, uh, since 2000 about 800 research library jobs have been lost until the end of 2015 as a result of this move. Uh, both the 42nd Street Library and the land on which it stands are owned by the city, so it is the city's obligation to maintain the building. I highly recommend upgrade of the book stacks and return of the research collection as first priority. Only what cannot be kept on location belongs off-site. Now the second concern I have relates to the sale of public libraries during these very troubling days. As libraries, uh, the NYPL sold already the Donnell a long time ago uh, and replaced it with something much interior, but it currently wants to sell the Science Industry and Business Library, which is the best wired library in the entire system, and it is loved, spacious, easily accessible with a large collection, research collection, and uh, the Five floors of the offices have already been sold, but now they are planning to sell the li rest of the library for $93 million. Why not keep this in Can you please ability? bring your comments to an end so that... I'm sorry? Your time is up, so if yes, you can I, I just want to finish it. Why not keep it uh, and fill it again with computers and library users and, and allow it to continue its important fu function? Um, libraries are free, safe, and use them needed more than ever before. They must be protected and cherished, not sold. Now the Inwood Library. Uh, Ma'am, I'm gonna have to yes, ask I you know, to wrap up. I have a couple, just very short now. We mustn't allow the power of real estate developers be greater than the power of knowledge. I have to say this time. <laughs> okay, thank uh, you. So transparency, accountability, and oversight of the mm -hmm. entire New York Public Library system is much needed. Thank you. Oops. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to testify on behalf of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, an advocacy organization which is the culmination of a merger between the New York City Arts Coalition and 1% for Culture, who collectively represent over 600 organizational partners. We commend the council, the administration, the Department of Cultural Affairs for their continued commitment to supporting culture and the arts. With ongoing threats of federal cuts to arts, humanities, and science, it is critical that the city continue and grow its support for culture. We are therefore asking for a funding increase of $40 million to the Department of Cultural Affairs to be divided equally between the Cultural Institutions Group and the Cultural Development Fund. With a $40 million increase, the DCLA budget would still be less than 0.3% of the overall city budget, a very small contribution in light of the vast social and economic benefits culture brings to the city. An additional $40 million would provide DCLA with the fiscal capacity to increase funding for currently funded institutions and organizations, the five borough arts councils which administer regrants programs that serve individual artists and local organizations, and a wider and more diverse array of new grantees. With an additional 40 million in funding, cultural organizations could expand lifelong learning opportunities for all New Yorkers, access to culture and arts for city residents, collaborations with city agencies, and workforce development opportunities, including artist support. Also, while we do not know yet what the recommendation of the city's first cultural plan will be, we anticipate that cultural organizations will need additional funding in the upcoming fiscal year to achieve the plan's short-term goals. We urge you to increase funding for DCLA by $40 million to be divided evenly between the CIG and the CDF. Thank you for your time and for your consistent support of the cultural community. We look forward to continued collaborations between city government, cultural organizations, and artists which benefit all New Yorkers. 
Uh, ain't it great? We're working together. My name's Carl Goodman, and I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Moving Image and also chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, a uh, coalition of 33 institutions occupying city-owned land and city-owned buildings, and we're proud to be their custodians. Um, we're also proud to be part of the Coalition New York for, for Culture and the Arts and to work with them on advocating for, as you heard, a $40 million increase in the DCLA budget to be split evenly between the CIGs and the CDF. Um, this does get us back to around the levels of 2008, which you've heard before from others. Sounds like a lot of money, but there are three to 4,000 of us in the city, so uh, actually, and it represents, a, again, a very small percentage of the city budget and also of the Department of Cultural Affairs budget. Um, the threat of losing federal money is very real. We invest that federal money, millions of dollars as a group in specific programs that lift up through the skill building, knowledge enhancing, empowering, life affirming, and life changing power of the arts, sciences, and humanities, the lives of all New Yorkers, especially its most marginalized and underrepresented voices, and especially those who are now under siege by dangerous ideologies. We have a footprint in every neighborhood, every district, through our programs and the homes in which over our our over 10,000 employees live, and through millions of the New York residents who participate in our programs, either on location or in their neighborhoods. Of particular importance is the work we're doing with immigrant public populations, public housing residents, the incarcerated seniors, people with disabilities, and the city's over 1 million school children who log 2.5 million visits to our institutions per year. These activities make it clear that your on our ongoing commitment to social justice, workforce development, and cultural equity and access. Where I work, I'm going to tell you that if we have increased funding, we're going to open on Tuesdays. We're going to expand our work with public housing residents outside of Western Queens, provide more free hours, further develop our programs with youth on the autism spectrum. My colleagues will do the very same thing. So listen, um, uh, the, the, we have been trying to meet with every single one of you over the last um, three or four months, I think we have, to tell our stories and how those stories affect our districts. We are under threat. Our facilities need more um, upkeep. Um, this is a race against time. I just lost it. Please do not let this happen to arts and culture in New York City. Thank you. <laughs> that was a good one, but you got it all in. We got you. We heard your voices. Thank you very much for your testimony today. And to all my colleagues, this is the last panel, and it is 439. I think this is historic um, that we've been able to kind of get all of our wonderful New Yorkers' voices. Please, the next panel, if you can come up. Mm -hmm. Chair Ferreras Copeland, thank you for the opportunity to testify and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Liz Ackles, the Executive Director of Community Food Advocates, and we are spearheading the Lunch for Learning campaign for Universal Free School Lunch. And I want to say most of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for leading this fight for Universal Free School Lunch, for really Universal Free School Lunch for every New York City public school student. I'm not going to read my testimony. I'm just going to point to some charts in there that I hope you will look at in response to um, what you said, the Chancellor's pushback around participation. So it, in the first two pages there are charts. We did analysis that was, there was complete similarity in DOE analysis. When there are 582 schools with universal free school lunch, almost all middle schools, some high schools, some elementary schools. There is a dramatic difference in participation in schools with universal and those without, and all grade levels. So I hope to share that with you so you can take that to the negotiations. Um, in middle schools, middle school students with universal free school lunch have over 65 percent participation, 60 percent participation. Those without it, 40 percent, 20 percent difference in participation. For high school students where the numbers drop the lowest, there's 30% participation for students without universal free school lunch, and that's most high school students don't have it. For high school students with universal free school lunch, the participation rate is above 45%. It's a 15% difference in participation in the same school year. 
even elementary schools where we anticipate seeing the least bump up because elementary school students eat the most, there's a 10 eat school lunch the most, there's a 10% difference. 80% of New York City public school elementary school students with universal free school lunch eat school, wow, that was fast, okay, eat versus 70%. That, I just want to say that to you, that there's a chart in there, um, and there's been very little effort in the middle school s situation to do, to do any publicity. If you're going to do a new initiative and be excited about it, you need to tell people about it. UPK is an example of that. Uh, I will say one last thing. There's $11.25 million baseline for middle school um, universal. Our estimates is that it cost $2.5 million last year. That's the, that was the total cost. Maybe share that with your staff. So, and so I just want to put, yep, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Ferreris Copeland and all the council members here today. My name is Judy Loon. I'm a parent at East West School of International Study in Flushing, Queens. Okay. Because the school is, has a middle school that's attached to high school, we don't qualify for free lunch. But I'm not here today just for East West School. I'm here today to advocate free lunch for all students in New York City, whether they are in elementary school, middle school, or high school. I was born in Saigon, Vietnam. So on April, April 30th, 1975, when the communists took over, little, literally overnight, my parents, my family, we lost everything. Food became scarce. The new government wanted to send my father to Cambodia to fight the Pol Pot regime. We had no choice but to escape, and we did. We became known as the refugee boat people. We made it, and we got sponsored to the U.S., but we came to the U.S. with nothing. My father worked at many odd jobs, low paying, but eventually he got a job as a mailman. But even with a mailman salary for a, a family of seven, we were struggling financially and we were living from paycheck to paycheck for many years. We heavily rely on the free school lunch and we ate a lot of instant noodle. Even today, there are good folks who have honest jobs, such as school aid, office assistant, who may make 30 or 40,000, but they don't qualify for free lunch, but they are struggling financially. They may not have enough money to afford to pay for the kids' school lunch, so the kids either go hungry or they eat poor nutritious food. The only solution to this is to have universal free lunch for all students in New York City. I know the council support this and I truly appreciate it. But please make universal free school lunch the highest priority and to make it happen. Thank you. Hello, Education and Finance Committees of the City Council. My name is Ksenia Novikova, and I am a student at New Utrecht High School in Brooklyn, New York. On behalf of the students testifying, we would like to thank Chair Ferraris Copeland and, all, and members of the committees for giving us the opportunity to testify here today about why implementing universal free school lunch is so important. As a student at a school where 75% of the students are economically disadvantaged, I know firsthand that the current school lunch program has so many negative results. One major problem is the tedious and intrusive school lunch forms that are often not filled out. Lunch forms tend to be something we often ignore, but when many immigrants come to America, they often flee terror, regimes, and horrible circumstances in their home countries. Therefore, when filling out this information on their financial situation, they often feel paranoid that this will somehow hurt them. My mother was born in the Soviet Union. She fled a horrific regime where she had little to no freedoms. Eventually, she came to America and had to become accustomed to life here. However, that mindset and feeling that she was being watched and the government knew everything about her has never left her. These forms may not seem intrusive to some people, but to my family and many others, they are. As a low-income student that does stay in school until up to five sometimes for extracurricular activities, free school lunch is a necessity. However, when my mother is paranoid and frightened to fill out this form, because of her past experience, it is difficult to receive free school lunch. My mother's terrible experience in an oppressive regime should not impact me eating school lunch, but yet it does. 
There are so many negative effects that come from not having universal free school lunch. We must implement universal free school lunch in New York City public schools to stop all of this from continuing. Thank you all for giving me the chance to speak here today on an issue that is so incredibly important to me and many other students. Thank you for supporting this issue and I hope that you will continue to support us in enacting universal free school lunch. Uh, good evening, my name is Johnny Zhang, a junior at Brooklyn Tech. To give a little backstory, my dad is a truck driver and doesn't make a lot of money. This meant that I was eligible for free school lunch. That is, of course, if I fill out the lunch form in the beginning of the year. Well, during my sophomore year at Tech, I had to, for the first time, fill out a lunch form by myself, which I kept putting off until it was too late. But to be fair, the lunch form was daunting, intimidating. However, because of this, I lost my eligibility, and that was a nightmare. Waking up at 5 in the morning to get to school on time, I don't have time for breakfast. Usually, that was fine, since I could have made it up for, well, with lunch. But wait, I didn't actually fill out the lunch form. But there was other ways for food, right? Nope, I had to starve. This caused a lot of problems for me, especially harming my energy in school. I kept nodding off in my classes, even my favorite class that year, digital electronics. And this may sound like a joke, but during basketball, I couldn't even throw the ball halfway up to the hoop. And my seven-year-old cousin could have thrown higher than me. And all of this happened since I forgot to fill out the lunch form. And you may fault me for this, but I fault myself all the time. However, ladies and gentlemen, can you really fault the parents that are intimidated by the lunch form or the students that forgot to fill out something that doesn't seem important at the time? Can you blame parents who worked hard to give their families a better future, making just over the cut to be eligible for free lunch, just so that kids don't have to drive trucks around every day? The answer to these questions is no. However, this is exactly what our current lunch system is doing, punishing students and families unfairly. Council, I, I come here tonight to urge you to please continue supporting us for the fight for, the, for universal free school lunch so that we can finally implement it to better lives of not just the students, but everyone else in the future, as the students are our future. Again, thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs> uh, okay, so hello, my name is Daniel Kim, and I'm a student at Brooklyn Technical High School as well. So I would like to thank the council for your continuous support for the expansion of universal, universal free school lunch, but we still do need universal free school lunch. And this isn't just a moral decision, but is, it is also a logical and economic decision. Many students who are barely above the income eligi eligibility gap are in the eyes of the school able to afford school lunch daily, but in reality, they cannot. And this problem is seen so common and is daily at my school. A lot of kids starve in a time where they should be socializing with friends and relie relieving themselves instead of stress. Instead, these kids are gathering more of the stress and worrying about how they can pass their tests on an empty stomach, how they wish they could go home, but instead they are starving in a time of supposed nourishment. And a meal together with friends should be the best socializer, but this is blocked by a system where students are forced to pay for lunches that they just can't afford. Many of my own friends also complain when they eat lunch late every day due to their schedule, but if these individuals complain about eating food late, food late think about how the students who can't afford to eat school lunch every day react and feel. And in the eyes of the, in the, eyes of the current lunch system, students above the income eligibility gap should have no problems getting, getting lunch, but this is not the case in reality. And as a result, I feel like the current lunch system should address the problem of a wage gap by providing universal free school lunch. And once again, thank you, for, thank you to the council for supporting us on this issue. Good afternoon. My name is Jin Q, and I'm a junior at Brooklyn Technical High School. I'm here today to represent a student advocacy group, Teenergetic. Our mission is to launch a universal free school lunch and enhance the overall learning experience in New York City schools. Teenergetic was initially formed by high school students from Francis Lewis High School in Fresh Meadows, Queens, who graduated last year. 
I restarted Tenergetic at Brooklyn Tech because access to school lunch is a critical issue in my school as well. I first started Tenergetic at Tech when I realized many of my friends aren't eating school lunch. It appalled me when I discovered that for most of them, it's a financial issue. Some of my friends are at the family income threshold where they don't qualify for free or reduced lunch, but in reality, that $1.75 each day is still a difficult expense for, for them and their families. As a result, many don't eat lunch and have to constantly battle hunger throughout the school year as they struggle to concentrate in class. This is especially true in a competitive school environment such as Brooklyn Tech, where students take rigorous AP classes from all grades. Furthermore, for many students who have club and team commitments, this means that they won't be eating anything after breakfast until 7 or 8 p.m. when they get home in time for dinner. That's as long as 12 hours without food for your body five days a week. For outsiders, Brooklyn Tech is often thought of as a school composed of talented and smart students, of high achievers who will become our future leaders. But most people don't realize the issues that these students face, many of whom come from immigrant and low income backgrounds. Most students don't realize most people don't realize that students, including Brooklyn Technical students, are dependent on our lunch system as they need lunch in order to have the energy to perform to the best of their ability. For those who don't or can't eat school lunch, it is inevitable that their learning experience and their ability to grow and succeed will be adversely affected. As a representative of Tenergetic and on behalf of the high, high school students who aren't supported by the school lunch system, we need universal free school lunch. I thank you for supporting the expansion of universal free lunch and continuing to fight for us. Uh, hello, my name is Evan Zamora Phelps and I uh, attend Millennium High School. I'm a junior. Um, as a public school student who doesn't receive free school lunch, I know that I'm in a fortunate position. Our lunch system divides students up so much it is hard to ignore the effect it has on relationships between students. Often, I've noticed that students segregate and separate themselves based on who receives free sc school lunch and those who don't. Not offering free school lunch to all students creates a lunchroom where students are divided. A lunchroom where students can not only loudly, but also silently judge others who get lunch for free. Students, sometimes without noticing it, judge other students because they are different from them. As a younger student, I was one of those who judged. I did not judge loudly by calling other students names, but I did judge silently by gravitating towards students like me. This silent judgment is just as harmful as the name calling and verbal insults you can hear. Like many students, I approached and chose to interact with students who had similar traits as me. And one of these traits that stands out in the lunchroom is who eats school lunch versus those who do not. As children, we know no better than to group with people who are like us. If someone got free school lunch for, if someone got lunch for free, then he or she was too different for me to interact with, and we couldn't be friends. At the time, I did not understand that these perceived differences had less to do with us as students and more to do with the system that creates this unequal, unequal status in the school cafeteria. Our school should be a place where all students are equal and where students are encouraged to bond, regardless of our differences and whether someone can afford to bring lunch from home or not. Universal free school lunch is one important step towards providing equality within our schools. Thank you for your ongoing support as we fight for a lunchroom where all students receive school lunch for free and all students are treated equally without regard to their family income. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do any of my colleagues have comments? Well, we just want to say how proud we are of all of our young people and parents. Um, I think this was the best way to actually end our public hearing session um, with the voice of the young. Of the young. And, you know, we really believe in exactly what you're advocating for. And from the bottom of my heart, I hope we can give you this victory this year. You know, we've been fighting every year for this, and, and we hope that this is the year that we can, that you can all claim that you came and testified, and because of you, this happened. Um, so take the full credit for that. Thank you um, for coming to testify. Don't move yet. Let me just read this quick statement. Um, whoops. Let me adjust this. Um, this concludes the executive budget hearings for fiscal 2018. Um, thank you again to all of those who attended and testified. Your testimony is vital in helping to shape our city's budget 
for any member of the public who still wishes to testify, written testimony, you can still submit your testimony to the Finance Division on the Council's website at council.nyc.gov backslash budget backslash testimony, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. The Council will be accepting submissions until Monday, May 29th. I want to thank my colleagues, um, Council Member Miller, Gibson, Rodriguez, who I, Rodriguez and Chin, who held it out all the way to the end. So again, thank you very much, and um, we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you in the successful adoption that will include a lot of your priorities. Thank you, and I now call this season of budget hearings to an end.